Someone make it make sense. Probably a couple. Hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Let me get some music going. Here we go. Some sweet tunes for the vibes, the sweet squirrel vibes, the chill squirrel vibes. Hopefully it doesn't make me sound like a robot as it has in the past. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. How are you guys doing on this beautiful Friday? At least it was beautiful here. Let me get the next file pulled up. So I appreciate y'all's patience. I had some lessons and some violin students and to accommodate them, I had to push back the stream a little bit and then I had to get Frodo situated um, so that I could go ahead and do all of the things. So let me pull up our files here. My coffee's really good today also, just saying. So let's see, we have, oh yeah, jury view. So yeah, yes, the itinerary for today. So we are going to start as I find my files here. Um, we are going to be starting with the jury view as promised of Moselle, um, followed by, sort of the game plan, followed by uh, Law School University, we're going to talk about closing arguments, um, by which I mean sort of what makes them different from opening statements and anything else in a trial, um, and also strategies for a successful closing argument, according to the American Bar Association. Um, and you will hear from Creighton in his closing argument. And we will have an exciting intermission where we um, have What the Truck Part 3. I hope you guys are ready for that. That's going to be fun. So that we have all to look forward to. And then I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the next episode will be the last one of the trial series. We should be hearing from um, Jim Griffin. Um, Mr. Matters, I think his first name is Jim, but honestly, we never hear them say his first name. So Mr. Matters, um, and then we will have jury instructions and reading of the verdict uh, featuring Becky Hill. So, um, I believe we'll be able to probably do, do all of that in the next episode. And then, uh, and then we will be moving on to other things, such as the long anticipated uh, other Murdoch series, including like Why Maggie and other things, um, as well as coverage of the Chad Daybell trial. Uh, of course, there's also K and many other things. I, I always have lots of things in the mix. So let me see what you guys are saying. Now that I have everything loaded. Wow, that was a lot of separate files, more than usual today. So um, let's all give a big, huge shout out to my wife. I changed her command from t pain to wifey because she's now wifey. <laughs> um, and yes, we all can yell at the moon. We can, we can bark at the moon. We can do many things at the, yeah, John, maybe it is John matters. That might be right. And I do think it's spelled, um, M A M E A D O R S, but I could be completely wrong, but maybe you're right, John. I was thinking either John or Jim, but I'm like, it's hard to know because like, there's just so many like other name names. Um, <laughs> bitches ain't shit, but hoes and tricks. That's, that's a fact. Um, wow. Why am I blanking on the name of who does that song? Is that, I can hear it in my head. Who does that song? Oh my gosh, why can I not remember? Wow, it's been a long day. So, um, 
with all the news that's been coming out with regarding BK and then also the things happening in the Daybell trial, thank you. Of course it's Snoop, right? Of course, see, this is what I'm saying. Here's my point right here because Snoop is my fave and like that just shows you just how much brain power I've been putting into other things. Because like, when I, like as I'm here like editing, you know, Murdoch, right? I'm hearing like all the happenings that are going on with the recent BK filings. And then I'm also listening to like the Daybell trial and I have like so many thoughts and it's all things that I'm like, how is no one saying these things? <laughs> and so um, in my mind, I'm like, just wait until you cover it, right? But then it's like, I can't stop thinking about these things. Yeah, Snoop and, Snoop and Dre, it's Snoop and Dre. Yes, right, yes, 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 yes. By the way, I've seen Snoop live. Um, that was like a bucket list moment for me. Um, it was awesome. It was everything I hoped for and more. He was great. Um, so yes, also we have, um, everybody has their commands, as you guys know. Um, we've updated some of them. Um, but there's lots going on today on this Friday. I hope you guys had lovely weather. Like we had, like Jesus Christ. Sorry. As I say that, I'm like, look at how long what the truck is. That's insane. Um, I hope you <laughs> hope you guys had nice weather, um, like we have had here. Um, and there's Super Planner Girls, um, command courtesy of Daddy Shortnuts, aka DSN. Let's go ahead and do that and let me see when that pops up do, do, do. yes there it is okay here we go there it is shout out to tsn um so okay but thank you guys for being here Thank you guys for being awesome. I know there's like a lot of other things that you guys could be <laughs> could be doing. Love you, wifey. Love that. Um, and I'm just happy that you guys are alive on planet Earth. And even if you weren't here, uh, I'm like and by here I mean on this live. Like I'm happy that you're here on planet Earth and you're alive to be here on this live also. Um, <laughs> wifey, you know what? It's okay. It's all good because you know what? You know what? Why is it all good? Because it's a house. So there you go. Um, we always have that, no matter what in life. Like there's things we can count on, and that's one of them. <laughs> okay, let us. I know it's the best. We also have. <laughs> we also have. And then we can just go right, right back into our like chill dance party. Um, but let's go ahead and let me pause this lovely, fun scroll music. Thank you, StreamYard, by the way, for that. Um, and let's go ahead and do our. <laughs> Every time I do it, it's gonna get longer. Just, just prepare. Just be ready. Um, let's do the jury view. Here we go. Field trip to South Carolina. Yay. Jury view of Moselle. Moselle, not Moselle. Okay. So I'm just pausing it. So here we go. We are entering. You know, you guys may have seen this. I know I saw it at the time, but it was not something that I really, you know, it was like, okay, when this jury view came out, like when it was broadcast, right? It was like when it happened. So it was like the jury, okay, the jury did the jury view. And when they did the jury view, it was this the day where we are in trial, which is the same day as Creighton's opening, the, the beginning of opening, or sorry, oh my God, beginning of closing arguments. They spent the morning during doing this jury view. And then from that, it went straight into closing arguments. And then they had a lunch break. And so what happened was during the lunch break, this jury view was aired on some platforms, whatever, to the public. And this would be like the, you know, the press, the media, their, you know, their version of it. I would assume they just viewed it right after the jury, something like that. Right. But I remember when this happened and I was like, fucking fuck, I don't care what the goddamn jury do. Like, in other words, it was like, I, in my mind, like, okay, I don't know if this was everyone's experience, but I was like, it was in the middle of like Creighton's closing argument. It was in the middle of it. I was like, goddamn, I don't care about the jury. I want to get to the rest of the close. Like, 
we're so close. Like we're so close. Like I'll watch this later. We're so close. You know, we're building up. It's sort of like, if you compare it to like in music, right? It's like, I don't know, there could be countless examples, but you know, it's like you're, you're playing concerto and you're like, you know, it's like, uh, or a symphony and you're like, you know, just about to start the fourth movement or something. And then it's like, Oh, let's just all go like here, like Pachelbel's canon for like 30 minutes and pretend like we don't care about the rest of it. Like, no, we care. We want to hear it. <laughs> um, so anyway, in my, I did not really actually pay all that much attention to the jury view at the time, but anyway, so this is the jury view and this is when that was when it happened. So here we are seeing them roll on up. It's a, we have a processional, um what's a good processional okay hold on handle um the water music the horn pipe okay here we go okay Bum. <laughs> oh, hold on let me rewind this to the beginning of the jury view for this actually it's too bad i could get my file on but i'm not gonna go and do all that but okay <laughs> you guys ready okay waiting for it to start again all right Bum bum bam bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba da bum 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 ba da bum 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 uh handles water music uh which has lots of different voices when i say voices i mean instruments um but in only one voice and also trying to sing the trills when they also have a violin handy that they could be using um only here so there's that um but that was supposed to be like uh the you know festive as for their arrival oh boy um <laughs> yes so <laughs> Tiny for nuts. This is Alex's car with the blue light. Well done. Well done. Well done. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What else? Let me, let me think back to when I played all these weddings. They're all like the processional music. Trumpet voluntary. Let's see. How did that go? Um, anyway, this is a whole, this is a whole rabbit hole. And honestly, it, it's nonsense with me singing it. I should play it on violin if I'm going to do it. But again, this is just we're here. Look, they've already arrived. We did the percent. We did the music. Fine. So here they're pulling up. There we go. Okay. So there's the hanger. We've seen this before. I played a little bit of this before um, when we were talking about the proximity to the shed. Kennels there. There's the infamous dog house. And there's, of course, the shed, which we all thought was the cabin for the longest time. Because why? It looks like a cabin. That's why. There's somebody. Hi. <laughs> and there's the hanger. Um, also, just real quick to say, too, you know, we hear a lot about Barrett Bulware in this trial. This property, for those of you who missed it, was owned by Barrett Bulware um, prior to Alex. And Barrett Bulware was not just Alex's friend who he stole from, who didn't, he also died of cancer, too. But word on the street, and by street, I mean uh, country road in South Carolina, um, is that Barrett Bulware was like a big time. I don't, okay, let me just preface this. Um, unlike EDB, I don't have a soundboard with sound effects, so I'm just going to do them all myself um, using my mouth. That's what she said. Uh, word on the street is that Barrett Bulware was some sort of a drug dealer person like somewhat i don't know well-known notorious however you want to call it like in the 80s i feel like the word on the street again was it was like cocaine and again word on the street bunny ears all the all the disclaimers was that he was he had this private prop this air this is, was an airplane hanger right that's the point that he could fly planes in and out and like for the millionth time the other word on the street was like he was hosting big time drug dealers from cartels in Colombia that were bringing in cocaine and they were flying. Can you imagine? Okay, blah, 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 blah. just imagine you're some sort of fancy pants, you know, cocaine aficionado, member of the cartel. You're out of Colombia. We all can picture that from various TV shows, such movies. 
Uh, and imagine you're like flying in on your own private plane and you fly here. Like, that's probably the first reason why I'm like, eh, this could be like one of those things where it's like, you know, Barrett had a friend with a plane and then one thing led to another. And before you know, it, everyone thinks it's people from uh, people from Columbia, you know, one of them type situations, because like imagine them showing up <laughs> and and we, we all can picture the low country now. Right. And by low country, I mean, like specifically this area, specifically myself. Imagine what it was like in the 80s. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can just, just picture them getting off of their private plane and being like, what are we doing here? Like, let's like, I just picture them hopping right back in and flying home. But anyway, that's the word on the street, quote unquote, as it were. Uh, and that this, never mind any of that. This, this property was owned by Barry Boulware. That's true. <laughs> this was owned by Barry Boulware. And, uh, through one thing or another, people owing each other money. Alex acquired the property. Uh, he says on the stand that he justifies the stealing because Barrett was a money. Who, who the fuck knows? But basically, Alex acquires his property from Barrett. We know that. And then, of course, you know, it comes full circle because he ends up losing it anyway uh, due to the uh, receivership for the boat case and various other, uh, you know, various, various isn't the right word, countless other victims. So, um, <laughs> Wifey says she loves notorious drug dealers for sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and it's really funny because I never even be I never even added that. In my mind, okay, that's a good point. Like thank you. Because in my mind, the whole thing with Alex and the drugs is so not real that I didn't even connect, like I didn't even think about the fact that that could have anything to do with anything. Like, like you've got this whole thing about Barrett Boulder with the cocaine, which who knows if that's real or not, because it's just a rumor kind of thing. From what I know, from what I understand, you know, um, and then you have Alex with his drug situation, which in my opinion is just completely fucking fabricated. So I never even thought about the funny, the, the irony that there's anything in common there, but thank you for pointing that out, that drugs are a commonality between those two stories. Um, and between the two, no one's asking, but if, in case anyone does ask ever, just go ahead and say it. Between the two stories uh, of Barrett Boulware, you know, I just, I try to picture him. I've never looked him up. I try to picture him. And I can picture what he looks like. And like, here he is. And like, just, we we heard his whole life story. Do you guys remember when it was objected to uh, and like the whole life story? And then Creighton was like, um, you know, go ahead, you know, and, and then Alex was telling the whole, this was like the very beginning of a or cross-examination when Alex was on the stand. And he was like, we got the whole story about Barrett Bowler being a shrimper. You guys remember that? So I have my whole image in my mind of Barrett Bowler and like his whole thing. And none of that really aligns being like a notorious drug dealer, like the type who could like hang with some like fancy, you know, cartel people from Columbia. Um, however, that being said, I if I had to choose what's more viable uh, and more rooted in fact and more believable between that and then Alex's story with his own drug use, um, without question, Barrett wins. So uh, shout out to Barrett uh, and any notorious drug dealers he may or may not have been affiliated with. <laughs> that was great. DSN's is heck of a ball player. Way to bring that back from like 50,000 episodes ago. That's awesome. Um, so the off chart counts, I think there's no evidence of this. Uh, what I will say about the offshore accounts is this, is that what I think, where I think, okay, everything that I hear and, and that I, everything I know about Murdoch, which whatever, you know, I, I think I'm pretty much on the up and up as that, as it goes with that. The offshore accounts. This is a great example of how things can start as a little seedling and become a, uh, what's the right word, a disaster of a rumor. Um, because, so I guess technically I could be playing this to review while we talk about this. So, okay, let me do that. I can also rewind it or pause it, but okay, yes. So, so, okay. Um, the offshore accounts. Actually, let me start it this way. When do you guys remember, when was the first thing or what was the first 
circumstance in which you guys heard anything about an offshore account ever existing? Besides just like someone saying, hey, maybe there's an offshore account. Like when did you guys do, do you guys remember when was the first time you heard it? Like anybody talking about it and what the context was? And yeah, I mean, no, no one's disputing that. Like that's definitely shit for sure. But he could, I mean, okay. Because I think there's probably people who, who do believe that he faked the addiction, but that he has offshore accounts where he's hiding his money. Do, would you guys agree about that? Like, I feel like that's probably a lot of people. Uh, I think that probably most people would think that there's offshore accounts where he's hiding money. I think that's a lot of people believe that. I'm not quite sure how many people believe this or that about the drugs, but I think that most people believe about the offshore accounts. So that's why I'm asking if you guys remember and you want to pop in the chat and let's say, when do you recall was the first time hearing anything about offshore accounts? When, like, when was that term first heard in conjunction with this case? So here we have some kennels, as you guys can see. Yep, yep. That's the, um, they actually talk about this. Um, I can't remember who it is on the and oh, it's one of Paul's friends. That's the thing that they were supposed to use with the fucking sunflowers. You know, got all shot to shit. Um, yeah, the offshore accounts, we don't hear anything about that during the trial. I never heard that term. When I say term, I mean the term of offshore accounts uh, and, and, and at all until well after the trial. Or, well, maybe maybe somewhat close to after. But it was after the trial. Uh, and it was never in any court documents. I'll go ahead and add that as well. It was never in any court documents. So here's the feed room, obviously. Uh, as you can see, they've ripped out the walls because, you know, evidence. And whatnot. I mean, but, like, why couldn't, couldn't they, like, bother to, like, put the fucking, like, insulation back or whatever the fuck that is? Yeah, that's the feed room, DSN. Yeah, that's the feed room. I mean, again, they've all ripped it to shreds because evidence. And also at the time that this was happening, remember this, 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 what we're seeing now, I'm going to pause it. What we're seeing right now is literally how it was during the trial when they did the jury view. So that would have been the end of February of 2023. So just over a year ago. So at that time, Moselle was already in the process of being sold I believe already had a buyer at the time, but that fell through, as we know. So this is the property as it was when it was being potentially viewed by possible buyers at that time. Um, it's tiny. Yes, it is. It's very tiny. Yeah. Um, and that right there speaks to the importance of the jury view, right? Because it is tiny. And not just that, but even just from where I have it paused. The door is tiny. Like, look at how little that, like, it's funny because Creighton actually mentions that in his closing arguments. And we, he, we've heard it before, but he hammers that point home during closing. But that door is, like, especially tiny. Like, I don't think you could even have a door frame that size in this day and age because I just don't think that would be the standard width. Um, but that's really tiny. It is really tiny. The whole room is tiny. Um Hundred percent, it's a death trap, definitely. But you know, and that was the thing was like those uh those child ninjas, they were ready, they were inside that ceiling. You got you. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me go back a little bit. So like where uh where that whatever insulation shit is there that I keep I don't know to call it. It's like fiber. This that fiberglass shit, the pink shit. It's like I think that shit would be in the ceiling too. I you know I wonder if that actually came from the ceiling because that was where the child ninjas. The, the assassins they were hiding um as per that one expert who's who mentions that they have to be above paul um and i think he references actually the ceiling and uh they were hiding in the ceiling they must have pulled out that that filling stuff uh and that's how they were hiding in there and uh that's what happened so um yeah i think that no one's doubting that there's money hidden i think there's money hidden i definitely think there's money hidden um yeah that's right. They spawn in the rafters of the feed room. Yeah. Um, but I don't, 
I've not heard offshore accounts in any type of court document or in court. I only recall hearing about that from people speculating on various platforms as in, okay, let me just put it this way. Mm, I will say, okay, let me preface this. I've heard one person say something akin to what I believe to be true. Uh, and that one person is Eric Bland. And that Eric Bland has pushed back on some people when they are talking about the offshore, quote unquote, offshore accounts. Eric Bland has pushed back on that. And I remember one time in particular on STF, I think I saved the clip. They were so close. They were so close. They were so close. To, Eric was so close to saying what I believe was is where the money is. And they were so close. And I was watching this live at the time and I was in the chat and I was like freaking out, like, oh my God, say it, say it, say it. And I was putting it in the chat, what I thought, which you guys by now should know what it is. Um, and somebody cut Joel off or not Joel, somebody cut Eric off. It might've been Joel or it could have been somebody else, but like he was so close to saying it. And then it like the topic got changed or whatever. And I was like, no. <laughs> um, but Eric was pushing back on that and was like, no, nah, no, nah, it's not offshore accounts. <laughs> uh so but everybody else says offshore accounts and i i don't blame them because it makes sense like <laughs> like that's what a normal person would be doing if they were laundering money right like any regular person laundering money would be doing that um so i it's not like that's a weird conclusion to draw but i think it's it's just it's just how to put it it's like the, if you don't have the answer, so you make the best guess type of thing. I, again, I don't fault people or blame people. Like that is uh, a guess, though I believe, um, especially because that the the point I was getting to is like that whole thing started. And yeah, and I'm wifey. I'm not. But yeah, I'm not saying you're arguing anything. What you're saying is what we hear all the time on every platform. So I'm, you know. It's not your fault or anyone's fault if they're if they're repeating what they hear on the platforms, right? From all the people who um, are actually far more qualified than I am. So if anything, you shouldn't be listening to what I'm saying. But and I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm just giving my opinion. But um, you know, like that's that's part of the challenge, right? Because it's like, well, I mean, this has happened to me, and I'm sure all of you guys, where it's like. You hear something from a trusted source um, and it sounds legitimate, you know, and like, so you don't go and fact check it because why would you? And again, all of this, this is very, and there's that buster thing, you know, all of that is totally fine. Like, um, and I've had to do this with this, even with Murdoch time and time again, I've pointed it, pointed it out throughout this entire series where it's like, I keep assuming things are true. And I'm like, wait, wait, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. We just heard this in trial. That's not the case at all. It's like that game of telephone, as I always mention. It's like really easy for things to just kind of morph into one thing or another. And then you forget where it originated from. And so, um, so, you know, just to set the record straight for anyone who's listening to this ever now or in the future, whatever, you know, like the off for accounts. And so here we have uh, the Brit Dove field, as you guys can see. Um, you know, that whole thing from what I, everything I recall started with speculation based on Alex flying to the Bahamas. And I remember when we got to this in trial, this was many, many, many episodes ago. This is early on. But when we got to this, there's the feed room again in the kennels. Okay, now here's a picture real quick. I'm not going to forget what I'm saying, Dory, but oh no, it jumped. It jumped, or rather, I clicked on the thing. Okay, let's, let's here we go. We're going to see what we were saying again. But <laughs> so, uh, okay, we're almost there. That's the chicken coop. There's where the chicken was, the dead chicken. There's the feed room kennels. Okay, so this picture. So this picture was taken from the Associated Press. This is from behind the kennels, as y'all can see. And then here's the other picture I wanted to show you guys from this. I don't know. This really touched me, like, to see this picture. This was taken, again, from the Associated Press. So, like, this is what's so eerie about this property. It's eerie. Because there's a lot of things that are just left, as it were. Like, it's really bizarre. Like... If you guys noticed on all of the dog kennel things, there's like each one has like a pail and then a bowl. 
there's just things that are just left there. It's like when you get all your shit to move out, but like you leave certain things behind. And that's the thing, like the buster thing it would be another example. The things that are left behind. Like that's the thing that sticks out with me about this jury view, the things that are left behind that no one bothered to take. Uh, Cause I, they didn't have the, enough value or they just didn't have the resources because as we all know, like most of the family's dead by now slash in prison. Uh, and it's a huge property and there was more than one property. And I don't know that Buster, I mean, Buster shouldn't have been responsible for it anyway. But my point is this, is that this dog toy is a chicken. It's a stuffed chicken. It's probably got a squeaker inside. It's, it's a lot because it's like sad, but it's also kind of funny and ironic, but it's also just sad that it's still there, like as it was, and no one bothered to even take it out of that thing. And it, at that, at this point, it's been when this when this fit footage was taken. It had been almost two years since the murders, and that's still there. Yeah, I mean, someone did clean out their possessions, but not all, not everything. I mean, this was you know, like if you were coming upon a property to rent or to buy. You know, you may might expect, unless it says it's furnished or something, you would expect it to be empty. Uh, but this this was uh, not, you know, and we don't know what the interior of the house looked like. Who knows? There could be stuff in there, too. But like, like, you know, again, like if I go back, like throughout, let me go back here. So like like that, that thing, the red thing, whatever you call that, that's some sort of farm equipment thing. They didn't take that away. Look at all the shit that's still there. The tractor is still there. The fucking track. Like, look at all this equipment that's still there. Like, which for some people could be, this could be considered a burden. Look at all the shit that's still there. Flower pots, pails, buckets, whatever the fuck. You know, because some people they wouldn't want to have to have someone else's shit. There's that, that thing, that pot is full of standing water. That's going to be a mosquito farm come summertime. Wouldn't want that. Uh, there's the quail pen, famous quail pen. Uh, you know, feed rooms, the feed rooms empty. I'll, I will say that they did empty that out. Uh, but like, there's just still shit left behind. And then of course we have the bicycle, by the way, I'm sure is a goddamn prop, which just annoys me. But then there's that, which I don't think is a prop because I don't know that anyone would have that. I, I must be some sort of another planter type thing. Um, there's that bicycle again. That's definitely a prop. Uh, and then and I wouldn't be surprised if the media brought that to take pictures with. It's more bullshit laying around. And then and there's that dog toy. So, <laughs> Jesus. Um, I know, right? It's a chicken. You're, you're so right, though, that he must hear that on repeat. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. So... The things are left exact. That's exactly right, wifey. Yeah. It's it's like time kind of stood still, you know, because what happened too is right. Remember, guys, like right after the murders, they didn't go back home. Like, including Buster, like nobody stayed at the property again. Blanca did, and that was it. And it, and it really is, it's weird. It's like a time, uh, time warp situation, right? Where time stands still. And it's like time freezes, but time goes passes simultaneously because it's like you can see the age on certain things, right? Like for example, like the the different seasons go by and wear and tear on things. I don't know, it's just, what's interesting again, that chicken is immune to any of that it's inside a kennel. And then within the kennel, it's inside a dog pen. And then within that, it's inside this wooden dog house. So it's protected from rain and whatever the fuck else. Um, and there it is. And, and so then I just, of course, the irony that it, one of the dogs, you know, one could assume Bubba, but whatever, it doesn't matter. One of the dogs had this chicken dog toy, right? Like, hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. This is a chicken. And there's the real chicken business. So, it's crazy to see this picture because you can see just like, you can see like, oh, look at all the other stuff. But then you, if you look closely, it's like, look how much stuff is still there, right? Two years later, nearly two years later, when the house is being toured for people to buy it. 
That's a very good point. Wifey says the chicken is the last one standing. It was the downfall and the only one left at the home. That's a really good point, Wifey. That's very astute. Yep. Yeah, I think that's that that you said it very that's very well said because I think that's part of why I found that picture very poignant of like there's the chicken, right? I mean, Bubba's the hero, but you know what? Honestly, the chicken's the hero. I never even thought about that. The chicken's the hero as well, right? And the chicken actually died for the cause. Like, it wasn't for that chicken like sacrificing himself, right? Like Bubba. Like the whole no, we wouldn't have any of it. Like, I don't know. And I think that's also what I love about this this case and this trial is like it's simultaneously silly and like crazy and like absurd, but also like everything means a lot. Like all these little details, you know, have a lot of significance. And I I just just why it, it just for me, it's just makes it uh what's the right word? It's just my favorite. I mean, favorite, you know, you guys know what I mean. I don't need to explain that. And DSN says not all heroes have feathers, but some do. 100%. That's 100% correct. Yeah. 100% yes. <laughs> yeah. That chicken. Man, sacrifice. And there, I mean, there's the chicken. Like, there's there, there's the hero. Like, fuck. Like, look. On top of that dog crate. That chicken. That chicken. You guys, like, seriously, if it wasn't for that chicken. Ugh. We might not even had a trial. And Alex might still be, my God, doing no, who, who could even imagine what, right? Like, how can you even go downhill from here? But he would find a way. It is the case that keeps on giving. That is absolutely 100% accurately, accurate, accurate. Um, yes. So, um, Yeah. All right. So now let's take a look at our closing arguments presentation. So we have Law School University. Hold on. Let me, that happened really fast. <laughs> there it is. Law School University Education Powered by Squirrels. Because learning is squirreling. All right. What makes closing arguments different from the ABA, American Bar Association? By the way, I'm shocked that in all these presentations that I've done, I've, at least I haven't noticed, you guys let me know, I won't be offended, but I have not noticed a single typo or like spelling error or even just like an accidental typo, which I, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time. I, and I'm probably jinxing, jinxing myself by saying that, but I keep thinking like, I'm really surprised that there hasn't been something right. Um, absolutely. The more you scroll, the more you scroll. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so ABA, American Bar Association, we're going to have some nice learning here. All right. So what makes closing arguments different? So the law, so this is actually important because we have all these trials going on right now and we have other trials that are about to start and everybody's following different trials, blah, blah. And we have opening statements and we have closing arguments, right? And and uh, people actually get them confused. I've actually heard even, uh, you know, what, what do they call them? Pundits or what have you on like court TV or long crime and various other platforms. I've even heard them get it confused and call it opening arguments or closing statements, which just goes to show how much confusion there is on the matter. So let's set it straight once and for all. Um, opening statements, closing arguments. The key word is argument. And remember, think of it this way. Think about when you hear all of your objections. One of the objections that you hear that we have is argumentative. So objection argumentative. Um, or you hear other things we're talking about argument. They don't just mean arguing like the way you would with your parents or your brother or your spouse, right? Um, it's, it's, how to say it? It's, in a way, it's kind of more opinion-based, right? Um, it's, it's more, you know, there's more narrative involved, right? From your own point of view, for example. So closing arguments is the only time when they can properly argue, they're allowed to argue, right? Like if they're arguing during the trial and they get away with it, it's because no one objected. But they're but 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 if they're arguing, it's objectionable. Somebody should object and it should be sustained, just saying. So um the lawyer's closing arguments or summations discuss the evidence and properly drawn inferences. The lawyers cannot talk about issues outside the case or evidence that was not presented. So that's important. Keep this in mind as we go into closing arguments, especially as we get into Jim Griffin, which will be next episode. But 
Let me repeat that. The lawyers can't talk about issues outside the case or evidence that was not presented. Hear me now when I say this. They're not, even during closing arguments, they are not supposed to be talking about evidence that was not presented in the trial. Point blank. Okay. The judge usually indicates to the lawyers before closing, closing arguments which instructions he or she intends to give the jury. In their closing arguments, the lawyers can comment on the jury instructions and relate them to the evidence. All right, so let's go ahead and get another thing out of the way. So jury instructions. There's a variety of ways that these are done. Sometimes you will see the jury instructions given to the jury prior to, uh, prior to closing arguments. Other times, closing arguments come first. Sometimes, actually, I would say probably in most trials, we actually get to see the attorneys and the judge work through closing, or not closing, sorry, jury instructions. And if you take a case, a great example of this is the Maya Kowalski, the civil case that happened uh, fairly recently in Florida. Uh, that was the one with uh, dealing with Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, that case is really educational because, or that trial is really educational because you really see the nitty gritty. Like you've got Johns Hopkins, which has a fucking whole fucking team with infinite resources, right? Um, and then you have my Kowalski's team, which is small, right? Um, but their work courses and they're working really hard. And and they would have known, and the everyone going into this trial would have known what they're up against with Johns Hopkins and the fact that they've just got like an infinite number of attorneys just at all times, just, you know, endless resources and it's just a machine for this type of thing and um and so uh so anyway but my point is like in this in, in that case they were working on jury instructions since before the trial was fucking started like you can watch their different like hearings and their motions prior to the trial starting they're already I mean, we usually hear, it's not uncommon, right? We'll hear things where it's like they're already getting things ready for the appellate record and that's in every, you know, whether it's criminal or civil, that's typical. But in this case, they're already thinking ahead to jury instructions. I've, it's really unusual. Like they're arguing things with that in mind. They're not even concerned about a verdict. It's like, that doesn't even fucking matter. It's really crazy. And so then when they finally get to actually like towards the end of the trial, you know, the court devotes like a couple hours, like every morning and then like one full weekday a week just to work on the jury instructions and then approaching closing arguments. It's like more than that. And then like when they actually get to like the part where they're actually, they've actually submitted their, each side has submitted their proposed, you know, uh, jury instructions, right? The judge reads it and then they argue over. It. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a lengthy process. Um, it's really crazy. And then the judge reading the jury instructions was like, you know, again, hours and hours and hours. It was amazing. Hi, Addy. We're glad you're here. Hello, hello, hello. Um, and so anyway, but so my point is like the jury instructions are a really big deal and they can be done in a myriad of ways. Like in the, in the reason I was mentioning that is because in the Murdoch trial, we actually didn't hear them working on jury instructions. I don't know what the deal was. Like it's entirely possible they like did like a spit handshake because here we are, it's low country, right? We know they have their own like culture, like who knows, like a spit hand handshake, swap a chicken with a rooster, we're all good. Who knows, right? Like they did things completely differently in this trial with this court. And it, for them, it was all normal. Like the list is endless of differences that you'll never see again in another fucking trial. Like just, they just do things their own way. Um, and, and nobody's confused. Like everyone elsewhere is confused, but no one there is confused because this is what's normal for them. So that's a cultural thing. So it was really interesting because we don't actually hear any discussion about the jury instructions or we don't see any argument over the jury instructions. And as we know, what's interesting is everything in that trial was on the fucking record. They didn't, they had, um, I counted it, two sidebars the entire trial and they were brief. And other than that, they had, what, two or three in-camera hearings during the trial? But we found out after the fact what those were, they were all about the fucking egg lady juror. Um, and then other than that, everything else was on the record for cameras. You know, what they would do is if they were going to argue, they just dismissed the jury. We heard all of it. And so I think it's really funny because it's like clearly the transparency was really important. So the fact that we didn't see anything about them arguing jury instructions makes me think there just wasn't any, which is really weird. And I've never even thought to inquire about that. And I don't even know who I would inquire to. Great, and if you're listening. Um, but uh, anyway, so 
But yeah, so jury instructions, so they all have their own way of doing things and they can be read read to the jury. They're usually argued well before you have closing arguments, right? But then they can be read to the jury before closing arguments or after. And a lot of courts and, and a lot of attorneys would prefer for them to be read to the jury before closing arguments because of what I just said here, which is that the attorneys like to be able to refer back to the jury instructions. And we hear this in a lot of trials where they're like, they walk them through it, right? Each each side, right? Each attorney goes through and says, so now when you get to question 1B, and it's especially common when you've got really complicated charges. And maybe that's part of it, right? Like with this trial, the charges were simple, right? It wasn't a lot of, uh, like just because it's happening right now in my mind, I'm thinking like Rory Vallow would be an example uh, of of more complicated, not not even the most, but just in terms of, again, it's just on the forefront of my mind, where there were a number of different charges for each victim. And you could you could actually, where it gets more complicated is when you have multiple options per thing. So it's like, you know, for Tammy Daybell, as an example, there were like multiple different options they could go with. Uh, and I think even with the kids. And then then there were like other things. There was like, for the fact of like stealing the money, there was like, what was a grand theft? I mean, but that's not even the most complicated. Like, again, if you want a great example, the Maya Kowalski, um, that, that, those were complicated. That was much more complicated there. And I love a complicated jury instruction because I love, I think to me, it really is so fascinating how they have to use the, you know, the law. They have to try to make it simple so that anyone can understand it. Right. And like you follow like logically if then, right. Um, so I think it's really fascinating to hear the process of how they work it out and then how they and how it ends up in the final document. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, but it's interesting because we just don't hear them argue about it. And again, in this trial, Murdoch, they don't read the, uh, Judge Newman doesn't read the jury instructions until after the closing arguments, but this is still true. The lawyers can still comment on the jury instructions. So the lawyers know what the jury instructions are. They can still comment on them. I, I do think it's helpful, in my opinion, for jury instructions to be given for closing arguments, because that way the jury hasn't, you know, they have a really clear idea. And, and again, in this trial, it wasn't, I don't think it really would have made a difference because the charges were very simple, right? It was like homicide, and then it was like, you know, homicide with a deadly weapon or whatever, uh, possession of a deadly weapon during the homicide. You know, it was, so, you know, there it's like, okay. But, but you know, if it gets more complicated than that, I think it helps to have them ahead of time for the jury. If you're going to want to go through them or refer to them in any way during your closing argument, which I think is a great idea, right? Walk them through your opening statement. You want to walk the jury through what the evidence is going to show based on your side's theory of the case. Closing arguments, you want to argue to them what the evidence showed, but also I think more importantly, like all the attorneys that I love, they will say the same thing. You're what you're trying to do in your closing argument. You want to, you, you're, you, okay, in your mind, you are imagining that you've got at least one juror on that jury who's on your side, right? That's what you're thinking. You have a juror who's on your side. And I guess this might be maybe more so for the defense, because if you're on the, if you're a plaintiff or if you're the prosecution, depending on if it's civil or criminal, you know, you're really hoping that probably everybody or most everybody's is, is siding with your side, your side's story or your side's theory of the case. Um, but regardless, you want to, they also, you want to arm that juror, the juror who's on your side. And I guess even if you, you want to assume just in case, right? So it's like, even, at, okay, maybe for, even if you're the prosecution, if you, 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 you're probably safer going into it, imagining that 11 of the 12 jurors aren't quite sure, or they aren't there yet, but there's one juror who is, and you're speaking to that one juror, because just in case, that's your worst case scenario, right? So you're speaking to that one juror and you want to arm them with what they will need to go back and convince their other jurors. So here's the deal with the whole thing, with the deliberation process. When juror, juries, jury panels are picked, they're looking for different personality characteristics. And so it goes beyond, in terms of what it goes beyond, uh, have you heard anything about the case, blah, 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 your demographics. When they're really getting into the nitty gritty, they're looking for personality types and they want a leader. They want a leader. and Whatever side you're on wants a leader who you think is in favor of your side. But 
and, and this is really true for like any group. If you find a group, there's going to be a leader, right? Like even look at your TV shows or movies where people are trapped in a deadly situation, you know, a leader, right? Somebody's going to have to take charge. And when it's a group of strangers that are put in a situation where no one has any experience and that's what being on a jury is. And so you want to speak to that leader who's going to be able to convince because that's part of the liberations. Remember, it's okay for your fellow jurors to to, to to make a, a reasonable argument where you change your mind that's allowed. It's not allowed for anyone else, a.k.a. Becky Hill. Do that. So you want to speak to that juror who's going to be persuasive, who's going to stand their ground. And instead of being the one to be like, oh, yeah, maybe I can see it that way. Okay, I'll compromise. You want the, to speak to that juror who's going to be like, yep, this is it. You guys, let me explain this to you in a way that makes sense, blah, blah, blah. And that's how the deliberation process works. So you are, again, opening statements, you are going to give the jury a roadmap of what you believe your sides, your side believes the evidence is going to show in terms of the theory of the case, what you believe the, the evidence will show and you give them a roadmap. And then in, in closing arguments, you want to give them a roadmap as to you're really, again, really, if you're putting, if you're going down to brass tacks, you're speaking to that one, to that juror, that one juror or two jurors, probably one juror who you believe is going to be the leader and who is going to, you want to arm them with the argument that they can take back to that jury room when they go to deliberate. And that's the whole thing. That's the name of the game. All right. So um, the lawyer for the plaintiff or government usually goes first. Sometimes I'm like, wow, I can't believe I have so much to say on some of this stuff, but like, apparently I do. Um, the lawyer sums up and comments on the evidence in the most favorable light for his or her side, showing how it proved what he or she had to prove to prevail in the case. So they're basically going to comment on the evidence. We know that that's kind of common sense. All right. After that side has made its case, pause, pause, pause. Okay. After that side has made its case, the defense then presents its closing arguments. The defense lawyer usually answers statements made in the plaintiff's or government's argument, points out defects in their case, and sums up the facts favorable to his or client. Again, the reason why it says plaintiffs or governments, we've talked about this before. Remember, in a civil trial, plaintiff and defendant. Plaintiff brings the complaint. Defendant is defending themselves against the complaint. In a, in a criminal trial, the government is the plaintiff, right? The prosecution is the plaintiff. One and the same. Government, prosecution, plaintiff. They're all, it's the same, same, same. Because they're the ones who are bringing the charges. They're the ones complaining. So that's why it says plaintiff or government. So if you hear plaintiff, it can only be a civil trial. If you're government, it can only be a criminal trial. Um, but they have the same function in terms of they're the ones bringing the complaint, bringing the charges. Because the plaintiff or government has the burden of proof, the lawyer for that side is then entitled to make a concluding argument, sometimes called a rebuttal. And we hear this in this trial. Uh, this is a chance to respond to the defendant's points and make one final appeal to the jury. Occasionally, de the defense may choose not to make a closing. This this is interesting because we don't see this very often, so it's good to know. Occasionally, the defense may choose not to make a closing statement. If so, the plaintiff or government loses the right to make a second argument. So in other words, if the defense does not make a closing argument, no rebuttal for the prosecution or for the plaintiff. So good to know. All right. Strategies for successful closing arguments. Again, according to the ABA, American Bar Association. All right, start communicating the trial theme during voir dire. Studies have shown that often jurors decide who they think should win after voir dire. And it, it, well, as I'm reading, I'm like, yeah, of course they do, but they shouldn't. They shouldn't. They're not supposed to. But okay, establish credibility. You want to hook jurors with your opening statement. A good opening statement demonstrates your sincerity, knowledge of the facts, confidence, and likability all at the same time. Or if you're put, uh, dislikability on purpose. It's a strategy, I guess. Uh, you don't want to overpromise. That's this is this is a good point. You don't want to overpromise or underdeliver in your opening statement. So, yeah, uh, this is also another good point here. Tackle any unfavorable facts head on. Bad facts. We've talked about this before. Bad facts. Uh, most cases involve. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Some measure of bad facts by your client. As you lay out your case, tackle this directly. Um, and this is a great point. The last thing you want is for the jurors to hear the bad fact coming from the other side. That's just yeah. That's we hear that all the time in trials. Oh, look at this. I was just saying, it's so funny because I did, I didn't, I made this a while ago. I didn't realize that this was in this and I was just talking about roadmaps and here it is. <laughs> Offer the jurors a roadmap. <laughs> Some lawyers use PowerPoints or whiteboards to prepare for openings. Um, when And this is, I, I know it's saying opening, but this whole chapter is on the opening and closing argument. So instruction, you go to opening statement. First, tell the jury who you are, why you're there and what the jury will decide, frame your issues. 
keep it simple and tell a compelling story, blah, 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 make it easy for the jurors to understand. Um, so yeah, stick to the script. Again, this is true for opening statement and closing arguments. So tell the jurors what the evidence shows or proves and don't go off the script. So you'll hear the opposing side statement and you'll want to respond, but don't do it. Don't be tempted to do that. So again, this is closing arguments as well. So people ask all the time, uh, you know, do they have to read from a thing? Well, well no, you don't have to, but uh, it's advised that you have a script or an outline, right? So the ideal situation, right? If you think about your uh, opening statement or your closing argument, depending on how long it is, if it's going to be fairly brief, you may, maybe don't really need to have anything in your hands at all. Ideally, you wouldn't have anything in your hand regardless, but you want to have at least an outline, at least an idea of where you're going and what you're going to do, and then um, and then kind of memorize that, right? And then if you need to refer to something to refresh your memory, you can do that. But what you don't want to be doing is reading from it. Imagine if you went to a play, like the theater, or imagine if you were watching a movie. <laughs> Get, yeah, here we go. Imagine if you were watching a movie or a TV show and people were reading the script and they had the script in their hands. Yeah, wouldn't go over so well. All right, next, play devil's advocate. Part of preparation should include playing your own devil's advocate by, a great point, play your own devil's advocate. Yep, by asking what the other side is going to argue. So think of every conceivable defense they'll put on and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All right, create the right energy. It's always important to make good eye contact. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh and everybody has their own style. We're going to really see this when it comes to the closing arguments, especially when we get to matters. <laughs> if, if you guys remember, that's kind of unforgettable. Uh, know your closing argument before trial begins. Drafted closing argument, or sorry, drafting and closing argument begins before trial. Uh, a good closing argument reviews the evidence presented at trial. If you can, practice your closing, blah, blah. Um, yeah, of course, practice it. Engage the jurors. Um, oh, I, again, I was just saying this. Don't read your closing. It's fucking hilarious. I was just saying this. Don't read it. So yeah, instead engage the jurors. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, yeah. Help the jury understand the evidence. Remind the jury about specific evidence. Help them understand what the evidence shows. Practice your closing because the more you practice, well, this just resonates with me being a violinist. Um, random girl says, uh, Example of how not to deliver closing arguments, Elaine Bredhoff, great point. Yup, yup. Yeah, and actually one thing that we didn't, none of this included from the ABA, for whatever reason, they didn't include the rule about objections, but this would be a great example because <sighs> objections are very rare in opening statements or closing arguments. They do happen and they happened to Elaine, which is part of my point here, uh, in Debt Be Heard, but they're very rare. And it has to be something really egregious. Um, and again, in Murdoch, we see the attorneys give each other more, more wiggle room than in any other trial of all time. And that includes closing arguments. We're going to see plenty of times where it's like, my God, how is no one objecting? Like, this is <laughs> enjoy because you'll never see it again in the in all of time. Um, but typically, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I, uh, having said that, we do hear like maybe two objections, but there could have been like 500. Uh Oh, I'm sorry. Super planner girl's not feeling fancy. I hope, I don't, I don't know. I hope, I hope, I uh, hope that, I hope you're okay. Um, congratulations, Abby, on that. That's great news. Um, so yeah, so the objections are, are rare when it comes to opening statements and closing arguments. Um, it kind of has to be something really egregious. Um, but yes, of course, Elaine does elicit that end up be heard um and there it is law school university education powered by squirrels and, okay all right so there that is now let's go ahead we're going to jump right on in and okay so actually let me preface this let me preface this so all right the way that i'm going into this for closing arguments is never mind like i don't care that i know the verdict i don't care that like you know it'll, okay okay i'm trying to approach this the same way i approached it at the time which is from an analytical mindset like where 
her, what strategies are working, what are strategies are not working, when are they getting, when are the facts maybe on their side versus not, when is someone making, regardless of how I feel about the case, which is, you know, or and regardless of the fact that we already have a verdict, regardless of any of that, I'm going to try to be fair to both, to, to both sides and kind of from like a, you know, again, a more objective point of view, of course, that's, that's wishful thing. I mean, okay. I, I, keyword is try. That's kind of the goal, right? We want to, I want to kind of assess, assess the open or blah, blah, assess the closing arguments for what they are. Um, and part of that, right. What can be, make it something successful or not successful is like, how are they logically arguing the facts, right? We heard already about the bad facts, right? What are you doing with the facts? Good facts or bad facts, right? Like, how are you going to argue it? So this is your chance to make your case to the jury. So the facts matter, but then also your brain power of how you're going to use the facts matter. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully that makes sense. But that's kind of the approach that I'm going to be taking as we go into this. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, let's go ahead and jump right in. People who have hogs on their property, uh, as a general rule, you would always take a rifle with you, uh, be it day or night, um, because you never know when you're going to see hogs, and, and because they are such a nuisance, as I spoke to earlier in my testimony, um, you, you always want to be you know, prepared to, to shoot them. So you would generally have uh, some type of rifle and, and, and we, uh, with you, a long gun. Your Honor, he's giving an opinion. He's not been qualified as an expert. No. <laughs> All right. Um, you've had plenty of experience in killing hogs on your property? Yes, I would disagree with Mr. Harpootley, and I am pretty much an expert about killing hogs. All right. And states 575. I love his confidence there. Is that David? Is that Slit Agent? Do you not recognize him? Is that David Williams? No, I'm asking you. I believe that's David Williams. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that's who you recognize as David Williams? Yes. Um, I've, I didn't know him. I got to know him through this investigation, and uh, I do believe he was the agent that was involved in the uh, the case with Mr. Greg, Chief Greg Alexander that was referenced. Clearly not David Owen, though, correct? Well, that's not David Owen. <laughs> Would you take a shotgun to hunt up? Yes. Would you take an AR weapon too? <laughs> no. Why? <laughs> I mean, them hogs are out there, right? Dude. Well, they don't usually come in a dove field when you're shooting doves. So. so if a hog came up, nothing you could do? If a hog came into a dove field with a bunch of dove hunters, well, maybe they would shoot at him regardless. <laughs> and where do the hogs live during the day? Probably. I love this. Well, I they can them. live in the swamp. They can live I love in the bay. Swamp, that you know, they can be anywhere, but largely in the swamp. The swamp. So a hog <laughs> could have come out of that swamp. Guys, yes. how yeah. many trials do you think in the history of time have used the word swamp ever? <laughs> have, I, I, I doubt. I don't think ever. I don't think ever. I don't think it's. We did hear hog come up in a, the rust trial. I don't even remember the context, but it did come up. But but swamp. I don't. I just this trial is so special, isn't Unarmed. it? Unarmed. As I said, if a hog came in a dove field near somebody dove hunting, they would probably shot it with birdshot. And if you're implying that I would come in here and somehow shade truth 
in any way because of that, that's, I would take high offense with that, Mr. Well, Hart Putin. Are you concerned about your high offense? Are you angry at him for stealing your money? I have no feeling one way or the you other. You don't have any feeling about Alec Murdoch betraying you and stealing your money. You're, I, I admire you. I don't know that I can look beyond that. Objection, Your Honor. There's not a question, <laughs> jury, to disregard the argument. You are not angry with Alec Murdoch? I have had anger with him, extreme anger, Mr. Hart Putlin, because of what he did to my law firm, my partners, my client, his, his clients, our clients, what he did to his family, what he's did to so many people. Yes, I experienced a lot of anger. And but you can't walk me. around with anger. You have to find a way to deal with it and move forward. And I have done that. Yep. And if you suggest... Yeah. You are dead wrong. If you think I've come in here and told this jury something because of money, when we, we're talking about two people who were brutally murdered, then you're, you're, you're headed in the wrong direction. Did you ever have a conversation with Alec Murdoch about him asking you permission or even telling you about installing blue lights in his private vehicle? No, sir. I never had a conversation with Alec Murdoch. Um, matter of fact, I never had a conversation with anyone in my 39 years about installing blue lights in, in their personal vehicle. And that's not something that's done, is it, sir? Oh, no, no. <laughs> and if it's oh, facing you and rotates 90 degrees, does the screen come on? Only if you do it gently. Again, if you do it aggressively. How gently? She said did you measure any of these forces? I did not. You just threw the phone around in your office? <laughs> Absolutely. So you were unable to find any actual data on it, so you resorted to throwing your phone around alone? Was anyone with you when you did this? Uh, no, sir. I was alone in my office. That's what she said. So you're alone in your office, throwing the phone around, taking no measurements, recording nothing over the weekend, and then you come in here and testify as an expert as to what the phone will do. That's correct. And testify that it's different than what we've seen it do right here in this courtroom. That's correct. Uh, do you ever shoot hogs and other nuisance creatures? A bunch of them. And when you're riding around looking for hogs, what uh, um, can you do that in the daytime? Yes. And uh, is it not uncommon to see hogs during the daytime? I shot two weeks ago. I shot five during the daytime. During the day, four thirty. Behind the Moselle residence, I think there, there's a river. Well, there's a swamp. The swamp and, and again. Then the we go in the swamp again. It's back in there. So the, the, the swamp begins know, behind right? the house and goes, I don't know, is that west? Sort of south. Right. If, if, if the runway is running east and west, okay. then, then it would be um, but, south. But the swamp is all is behind the house. It's behind the house. Okay. And all the hogs are going to be behind the house. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all over. They, they follow there's a watershed ditch in there they follow wherever but predominantly they they seek refuge or, or whatnot in in the swamp but they can be anywhere I have them you know there's gum ponds and every place else and they they just trample sure. wherever they want to go but you're right by and large they're they're in the, the swamp because it's wooded right and, and thick <clears throat> And then in the month of June, I, pretty warm, is it not? It, it usually is here in South Carolina. Yes, it is. And do hogs like <laughs> stay in the swamp more in the, not in the summer? Dude, swamp talk is the best. I haven't noticed that, and I've killed probably well over a 1,000 hogs. All right. Um, He's a hog. so we trap them all the way through. I mean, I've got two traps, and well, actually, i got six traps. But, I mean, I trap Right. Trap them, I shoot them, you know, if, they're just a scourge. They eat everything, they root up your roads, they're, they get in your pine trees when they're little, they'll root them up. They're, they're a teetotal nuisance. I, I carry a gun with me most of the time. Forty, can you describe what this photo is? Yes, sir. That is a computer animated drawing of some potential. <laughs> so I've been like, I don't know, sometimes Sometimes it's like my my uh sometimes my brain in my mouth thinks in Russian. 
and speaks in Russian. So I'm, I've been doing this today where like, sometimes I'm just like thinking in Russian. So uh, if you guys are wanting to you know, no, I, I assume people are figuring out what I mean with the like, context clues, but like, you know, um, yeah, basically I'm responding with like normal things, but just in Russian. So if anyone's curious, that's Cyrillic in the chat, uh, for example, Kaneshna. Trajectories into that quail pen. And the two gray boys here. They? <laughs> yes. They are. Uh, yes. They're two figures that were placed in that CAD uh, presentation to represent shooters. Uh, and describe what this is. This is one. Yes, I agree, Super Planner Girl. I, there's a lot of really cool words in Russian. So, Kaneshna. So, that means, of course, I can't remember if I already said that, but yeah. Uh, in my, again, in my, in my mind, it's like sometimes it's hard to remember because I'm thinking of both translations at the same time. So, Kaneshna means, of course, there's a lot of really cool words, though. Um, like, yeah, yeah. So, I won't get, I won't, I won't start because then we'll be on the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, the two, I, the two grave, I know it's so completely unexpected, right? With the AG. Let's just hear that again because it's so good. My Lubime chest. <clears throat> and then in, in the month of June, I oh, only go pretty four a little warm, bit. is it not? Okay. Well, actually, I got six traps, but I mean, I trap, <laughs> right. trap them, I shoot them. You know, <laughs> if, if they're just a scourge. They eat everything. They root up your roads. They they get in your pine trees when they're little. They will root them up. They're they're a teetotal nuisance. I I carry a gun with me most of the time. Forty. Can you describe what this photo is? Yes, sir. That is a computer animated drawing of some potential trajectories into that quail pen. And the two gray boys here. <laughs> what are they? They are. Uh, they're two figures that were placed in that CAD uh, presentation to represent shooters. Uh, and describe what this is? This is one uh, animated suspect, I guess, or shooter placed in a similar CAD drawing, photograph, animation. So, so if you're coming out of threat, so you get, we want to you're going to get down, down, yeah, get down. Almost to the ground. <laughs> and over like this. Dude, this part you guys shoot. Oh, yeah. Look how feeble. It's amazing. It's my probably favorite thing. It down further, but you probably can't do that. But the shot to the head as it's coming out, right? <laughs> I can't. Boom. He'd have to be twisted this way for it to work out with the arm. <laughs> that okay. Yes, sir. But that's fine. That's the best but part. But Mr. Palmback never said Coop, that they passed. He just the stands there and doesn't know if he should go sit down. He might not have said those words, but that was my inference that there's a void there. And when he's in the picture holding his hands here, right. I, I took that to be Paul's head. So uh, that that's. Right. Okay. Did you not understand when he was in the picture there? Dude, he he's still just standing what? there. I love it. Your angle had to be to make it work. Well, I wasn't in the in the door with my angle. Uh, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's all we have. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any further witnesses by the state? Your Honor, in the rebuttal case, the state rests. Right, ladies and gentlemen, the state has rested. All right. Perfect. As we go into the next episode. So I'm just typing some fun Russian things in the chat. So good job, Abby, with uh, Babushka. Um, I was just saying, um, I said, um, <laughs> she probably had no idea. So I don't know. Uh, Dom Molodietz, Abby. So that's yes. Well done, Abby, of course. And then, uh, I spelled out in Russian. I put babushka there. Um, I forgot all about the awkward turtle. Oh, wasn't there also the awkward penguin back in the day? That was the whole thing. Um, shout out to all the babushkas out there too, by the way. Um, grandpa is diodushka. And some people actually know um, diodushka because of um, uh, Clockwork Orange. And there's also a band called, D well, they spell it wrong, but it's supposed to be diodushka. Which means girl. <sighs> yeah, the awkward, the freaking awkward, the awkward turtle. That's right. Yeah. I love awkward animals You're and awkward friend, people. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I just you saw that. Heard all I of just saw that. You look like he's trying to use the job. That's my 
what it is. That's what it is. I didn't even think about that. That's totally what it is. Oh my God. Testimony yes. received yes. all of the evidence. Uh, you've visited the scene of the alleged crimes. And now it's time for closing arguments. First, by the state, Mr. Waters. In Clockwork Orange, they also use a word for milk that's similar to the Russian word. I can't remember how they say it, but in Russian, it's milk. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Yay. Great in. Good morning. It's been a long trial, hasn't it? On June 7th, 2021, at the Moselle property in Colleton County, Maggie Murdoch and Paul Murdoch. To real, real quick, I know you guys are probably like, don't talk about that. So, okay, just real quick. Notice he's holding, look at how thick of a stack of papers he's holding. That's fucking intense. But remember what we said, you want to have an outline, you want to have a plan, a roadmap, especially if it's going to be a longer closing, right? Um, but you don't want to be reading from it. So... I think it's great when people give a closing argument or an opening statement and they're not standing behind the podium, right? Because you really want to be talking to the jury and you really want, again, the eye contact. You can even see from where I have it paused that he's make, making eye contact with them. That's great. So again, like we just said, and that's part of why you practice it, I think, is because you want to be able to look down and look back up without missing a beat. We're brutally and maliciously murdered at the kennels by Alec Murdoch. Paul, as you know, suffered two shotgun blasts. Maggie suffered five blackout rifle wounds. And after an exhaustive investigation, there is only one person who had the motive, who had the means. All right, here comes the theme. Who had the opportunity to commit these crimes. Okay, that this is his first theme. And we're gonna hear this throughout his closing. Motive means an opportunity. Now, why does this matter? Because this is a circumstantial case. And part of the whole point is, is if it's circumstantial, um, you can use me, uh, mean motive and opportunity to help prove identity. So think about it that, right? We've talked, it's funny because we've talked a lot about identity in terms of this entire family history and everything else, right? But here, it's actually really important when it comes to the freaking the charges, right? Because the identity. So what I mean is like, if somebody sees somebody committing a crime, they see them, right? Like the identity may not be, um, you know, up for debate. Or if, you know, you've got, well, I, of course, these days we all know DNA is going to be disputed. But if you, have, if you have like DNA or you have, I don't know, there's, there's times where identity or, or, okay, let me give a better example. Another example would be when, uh, okay, let's use Hannah Gutierrez Reed as an example. OK, the identity is not an issue there because there's no dispute over the fact that she was there and she was the armor. Right. They're disputing other facts regarding the charges, but her identity is not an issue. No one's like she's not saying it wasn't me. Right. Well, I mean, kind of. She's saying it wasn't her fault, but, you know, you, you guys know what I mean. Hopefully, like her identity, her being she's not saying I wasn't the armor. It was somebody else. Right. Like. You know, so, um, or I have a twin, random twin, you know, like, so anyway, so motive means an opportunity. So because of the fact that, you know, if this is circumstantial, he, they can use, Creighton can use mo, um, means, motive, and opportunity to show the jury, to use them to prove identity in, in lieu of uh, other things that could prove identity, such as someone being on camera or you know, the other examples, of course, there's countless examples you could have, but, um, you know, of course with him too, right. Because he's the hut. It's, it's different if it's a stranger. That's the other thing too, right. Because he lives there, you know, it's like, it just makes it different because of course he's going to be there anyway. So the identity thing is important. And also whose guilty conduct after these crimes betrays him. The defendant was the one person who was living a lie the defendant is the person on which a storm was descending, and the defendant is a person where his own storm would actually mean consequences for Maggie and Paul, and consequences for those who trusted him. And that person is the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch. I know this has been a long trial because it's a complicated case. 
And I'm not going to talk forever. I promise. But I am going to try to distill this down for you. And the first thing I want to do is set the stage. And to set the stage, we have to understand a little bit about Alec Murdoch and who he was and who he is. He was a person of singular prominence and respect in this community. But he's also a person who's been able to avoid accountability for all of his life. While he was outwardly giving the illusion of wealth and a very lucrative law practice, some bad land deals and that sort of thing, exacerbated by uh, the economic recession, led to some financial problems. And then he had some big cases in the early 2000, 2011, 2012. And all his partners, and you've heard testimony to this, thought that that had taken care of things. You've heard cases like the Thomas case and the Pinckney case and the Plower case and the Badger case. But the evidence that you've heard shows that the defendant became so addicted and so dependent on a velocity of money that the millions of dollars in legal fees that he was receiving was not enough. And so he started to steal. And how did he steal? He stole by billing personal expenses to the firm. He stole by stealing from his own family. You heard the testimony about uh, the check he stole from his brother Randy. But then the main ways were two schemes that he developed. And the first one was to get checks made out from the client trust account to Palmetto State Bank to fast talk the staff and fast talk the clients with those disbursements and then take it to Palmetto State Bank where his buddy Russell Lafitte would convert those and use those to pay personal expenses. And each time until the end, it worked because the client was also getting a big check. And they were walking out of there thinking that everything had been fine when it was not. But then in 2015, he opened up the fake Forge account. And then all he had to do was get disbursements made out to the Forge account. And once he did that, he would convert those to his personal use. And to do that, though, he also had to fast talk staff and fast talk clients. And that scheme continued up until everything fell apart in the end. The other thing you have to understand is during this time when he's earning millions of dollars and stealing millions of dollars, he's also borrowing millions of dollars from wherever he can. The bank, his law partners, his father, and it still wasn't enough. And this slow burn was continuing and continuing until the boat crash happened. In oh, February of I need my ticker. And that changed Thanks everything. That set in motion things that were going to happen because of the criminal charges related to that case as well as the civil uh, charges related to that case. And in the aftermath of the boat case, things changed. The pace of his stealing increased. In fact, that's when he stole the money from Tony Satterfield that you heard from. Ultimately stole about $4.5 million between the Satterfields and others. And unlike other cases, Tony Satterfield, who was the son of his longtime housekeeper, he took all the money, took every bit of it. And that was coming to a head as we move into the spring of 2021 because there had been some publicity, and you heard from Tony Satterfield that he was uh, the defendant reached out in the spring of 2021 because there had been publicity and saying, hey, I'm still working on the case. Everything's fine. I'm still working on the case. Sorry, Abby, I just saw this um, with uh, Eurovision and vodka. Funny thing. So um, so vodka and, and, and then water in Russian are very similar. So um, I can put it in the chat, but the way it's pronounced is water is a voda. Uh, and it's like a V sound and then ODA, but of course the letters are different. So like, and then so there's just a K. So it's like a whenever you add a K in Russian like that, it's like a nickname. So it's like almost a nickname for water. So isn't that funny? Because of course it looks like water, but also we know that there's their jokes about Russian people and vodka and water, blah, blah, blah. Um, also, I wanted to actually say too, the word, one of my other favorite words in Russian is, and one that's actually related to this, um, is um, 
so in investigation is um Rosle de Venier. So that's another good one. It's good, but the reality is the defendant didn't have that money to pay it back. And he had one saving grace because as you've heard, they don't get paid until the end of the year. And his saving grace was the Ferris case, which they tried in December. They get the verdict and get paid in March. And that's when he convinces Chris Wilson to send those $792,000 of fees to him. But the problem is that only lasted for about two months. $792,000 only lasted for about two months. And then he's running out of money again. Meanwhile, you've heard in the boat case. Boat case again. Mark Tinsley was seeking to get a large personal recovery from Alec Murdoch of $10 million because he thought, as many people did, that he was wealthy and had a lot of money. And when they said he didn't, he filed a motion to compel. And you've heard testimony about whether or not that had been granted, but it doesn't change the fact that that's what Mark Tinsley was seeking to do. And that boat case hearing had been scheduled for June Boat 10th. case. In May of 2021, as we move into June, that's when Alex's own paralegal got the expense check for the Ferris case, but not the fee check and tried to raise that to Alec and couldn't get a straight answer, tried to raise it to Chris Wilson and couldn't get a straight answer to his office. And so goes to Jeannie Seconder and Jeannie Seconder goes to the partners and they can't get an answer about that either. And they want to, an answer to that because they're worried because Alec has been talking about structuring fees and they're worried he may be trying to hide assets because of the boat case and they don't want to be a dude they're laughing look at that dude you see guys see all of these things that dude oh well now he's leaning the dude right behind so he, so you all see where alan wilson is and then you see the dude who the random old dude who questioned the coroner and did nothing else this entire trial <laughs> literally that was it there's a dude behind him who's like laughing what? coming to a head and what his is finances happening? are he, oh he dropped you heard he from dropped the banker there you that's heard funny where his finances were at on June 7th, 2021. And you saw what happened in the wake of that. Within a short period of time, he was negative $347,000. On June 7th, 2021, he was in the office. He was working on the boat case, working on those financial okay. uh, disclosures. When Jeannie Seconder came in and confronted him about those fees that he no longer had and couldn't pay back. And on June 7th, 2021, and he tells this to Jeannie Seconder, his father Randolph is having a very difficult time. And while it, they might have said it was some positive news, the reality is, is that he was a very, very sick and he had always been someone that the defendant could go to that he could borrow money from and so that pressure is happening as well and on june 7th 2021 as all these pressures were mounting the defendant killed maggie and paul and how do we know that and we're going to talk in detail about that but the timeline puts him there The forensic timeline puts him there. The use of his family weapons corroborates that. And his lies and guilty actions afterwards confirms it. And we'll go over each of those in great detail. Before we get to that, though, I want to finish out. Because in the wake of this, everything changes. All those things that were coming to a head immediately go away. It's a different world now. <laughs> They're not asking about the Ferris fees anymore. And you heard testimony to that. Mark Tinsley doesn't believe the case is going to have the same value anymore because the sympathies of the case have changed after this tragedy. And you heard that. And who would better understand that than Alec Murdoch, who does the same work? The boat case hearing goes away. And everyone immediately rallies around Alec Murdoch. 
and it worked because it allowed him to borrow $250,000 from Johnny Parker, his law partner, who of course wouldn't have loaned him that money if he knew what Alec was up to, and allowed him to go to Palmetto State Bank and get $350,000 in an off-the-books loan that hadn't even been applied for, and to send that money to Chris Wilson and convince Chris Wilson to pay another $192,000 of his own money and to send an email to the firm that everything was okay. And that made it another month or so until Annette Griswold found that Ferris check in his office and Jeannie Seconder looked up the forge accounts. And what happened in the wake of that? What was the reaction of Alec Murdoch? Within a day of September 3rd of him being forced to resign, his buddy Chris Wilson is trying to see him, comes and sees him on September 4th and confronts him about what he's been doing. And then within two hours, the side of the road happens. Side of the road. And Alec is a victim again. When accountability was at his door, he was a victim again. <clears throat> And he told an extremely detailed lie and went so far as to draw a composite sketch with the police of this assailant. This assailant. Do you guys ever think to yourselves, like I do, that he should have tried to draw someone who looked like a, a five foot two assassin? Because that would have been pretty smart, wouldn't it? Like planning ahead of there. And the accountability that had arrived at his doorstep again. He tried again, tried to get it to go away, and it worked for a little while. People thought, oh my gosh, what's happened here? Should we be suspicious of Alec anymore? But this time it fell apart a little quicker because his own brother figured out that he was trying to buy drugs. And the case fell apart very quickly. This is the setup for what we look at and what's going on. And it seems like a story that's far removed from most people's experience because it is. It is a different story like has never been seen before. But the reason is, is that he is a different man than the kind of stories that we've seen before. This is a different set of circumstances than we've seen before. And it's certainly easy to understand when you have a middle-aged, man who's outwardly successful, who has a strong family legacy, who has a prominence in the community and a reputation, but is living a lie, is living a lie. And that leads to and can lead to those pressures being overwhelming and actions like this happening. Husbands, husbands have been killing wives, unfortunately, for years, and husbands killing sons goes back as far as King Harry, probably further. You say King Harry? Do you, does anyone know what he's talking about there? When those pressures mount and someone becomes a family annihilator. All right, we got to do a little Space. law school. Yay, law school. I'm certainly not a professor, but we need to go through a few of the concepts here. And one of the most important concepts is the fundamental role, one of the fundamental roles while y'all are here. As the judge has told you, he's the judge of the law, but y'all are the judge of the facts. And what does judge of the facts mean? Well, a big part of that is that you determine yep. credibility. You determine believability. You determine. So let's just, well, as I'm going to pause that and pull my banner down. So um, this is true for every trial. Like, I love it when they educate us in trial, right? Because it's like, this is true for every trial. So all of this, what he's going to be saying, like so far, what, what we what he said, you know, the judge uh, is the judge of the law or what did he say? Judge Newman did, how does he phrase it? Hold on, let me rewind it. Because the judge, uh, the judge being the judge, doesn't make sense. Hold on, that would be redundant. Let's it's just. The see. fundamental role 
one of the fundamental roles while y'all are here. As the judge has told you, he's the judge of the law. He does say that. Okay, never mind. The judge is the judge of the law. Just kidding. Um, and the jury is the judge of the facts. Um, and now we're going to get into credibility. And what does judge of the facts mean? Well, a big part of that is that you determine credibility. You determine believability. You determine which witnesses you want to rely on or not rely on. You can rely on a part of a witness's testimony, all the witnesses' testimony, one against many, many against one. It's up to each one of you individually to make that dis determinations and decisions and then to collectively discuss those into a group decision. But credibility is important. Is it believable? Is what somebody's telling you believable? And there's many things you can consider in credibility, but a few of those are the demeanor of the witness on the witness stand, whether the witness has a reason to be biased, whether the testimony of the witness was contradicted on one hand or supported or corroborated on another, whether the witness has been dishonest in the past. Incidentally, too, just another little tidbit. Um, if there's no fact at issue, there's no need for a jury. So, again, because the jury is the judge of the fact, the judge is the judge of the law. Um, and uh, so if ever there's something, at, at, if, if there's, you know, if attorneys are arguing about something and then, you know, the judge says something like there's no fact at issue here, um, then there's no need for a jury. So what happens is if you ever have something where, this, this would be common in civil cases, right? For example, where uh, we see this a lot, right? Like where people are settling and whatnot, but there's also what's called a bench trial. And a bench trial happens whenever there's a dispute over the law, but not the facts. Um, so for example, like an interpretation of the law. So, so both sides could agree. Uh, okay, let's give an example. Susie was wearing, okay, I'm not going to make any, any example of where there would actually be a problem that anyone would sue over, but just in terms of facts, right? So Susie was wearing a blue shirt at noon. And then the other side agrees. Susie was wearing a blue shirt at noon. I don't know. And those are the facts of the case, right? Just as an example, right? Those are the things, those are the facts. Because then sometimes as we see in criminal trials or our civil trials, really, if they're, if they're going to trial, we're watching them there's going to be some dispute over some of that. Right. And that's where the jury comes in. Um, but let's say that both sides, they, they, everyone agrees on the facts, but then there's a dispute over the law. And that's because laws sometimes are, uh, this is when new case law, right? Why do we have case law? Case law is a great example of this because it's like, well, we have new case law when a new interpretation of the law has been made, uh, record like is 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 now uh has been brought into issue so when whenever there's a dispute over the law and what the law means and and uh you know the crumbly trial is a great example of that with jennifer and ethan crumbly right um actually that's maybe not the best example because really that should have been done through legislation but whatever um we, 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 you guys all, if you're watching this, I'm sure you're familiar with case law, but it's, that's an example, right? Where it's like, there's a, there's a different interpretation or something is challenging. Um, what the law means. Let me give you guys an example. There's a really famous Supreme court trial, us Supreme court trial from a long time ago. And I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called, but it was civil and it made it all the way to the Supreme court because of this one important thing. What is the definition of uh like of a tomato so there was some sort of law on tariffs um that imposed a certain type of like a tax charge or like a tariff on certain types of goods and you know the goods it was like something that was used for a certain thing let me see if i can actually pull it up because this was actually really important this is a great example of what i'm talking about here so um with the interpretation of the law. And also to that end, sometimes what the definition of something might be in terms of law is different in, than what it would be in, in everyday life. Um, and this would be an example of that. This case is an example of that. Okay, it's Nix versus Hedden from 19, sorry, 1893. Okay, so, all right, this is a great example of so many things, you guys. All right, the Supreme Court of the United States unanimously held that tomatoes should be classified as vegetables rather than fruits. 
are you guys hearing me? Like we all know, we've all learned in school, right? Tomatoes are a fruit. They're a fruit, they're a fruit, they're a fruit, right? Even though they, you might think they're a vegetable. Everyone knows. This is a great example of the law. The Supreme Court held that tomatoes should be classified as vegetables rather than fruits. Even though by definition they're a fruit. This is the law for you. For purposes of tariffs, imports, and customs. So here's why. They were saying that the meaning of the words fruit and vegetable differ in terms of the ordinary uses for how they're used versus the botanical meaning. So basically, somebody didn't want to have to pay the tariff or whatever on the tomatoes, and they pulled up the diff definitions of fruit and vegetables from the Webster's Dictionary, and actually two other dictionaries as well, and brought in some witnesses, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they argued over the definition of fruits and vegetables. Isn't this insane? And then both the plaintiffs and the defense counsel made use of the dictionaries. And they both read these definitions, same definitions, and argued them differently. This is my point, right? So, yeah, botanically, a tomato is a fruit. However, in common parlance, it is a vegetable. So basically what it came down to is how is it going to be used? Because you're not going to eat it as a fruit. You're going to use it to make a sauce or what have you. That's how they got, that's how they ended up going with this. I mean, isn't this crazy? Um, and I mean, there's way more to it than that, but that's just the, the summary. So as an example of like, you know, where the law had to come in for case law for this is how do we define fruit or vegetable, right? Like the fact, like if they were arguing over the facts, it would be like, it wasn't a tomato. It was a grape, right? But no, everyone's agreeing. We're talking about tomatoes here. There's no problem. We're not disagreeing on the fact that it's a tomato. We're arguing over the law. And by the, it, it, how does the law use the definitions of fruit or vegetable and how do those apply to a tomato? So hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, I don't even remember how I got off on that tangent, but it's kind of important because um, sometimes it's hard to kind of understand, to parse out those differences. Um, but a good kind of way to think about it is the facts are going to be specific to the case. It's going to be the things that have happened, right? Um and another good example, too, if we go for those of us who follow trials, we might know the circumstances. So let's say there's a suspect, somebody's about to be charged, and there might be discussion on the charges. And there might be discussion over, should we charge them with this or this, or is there going to be this or this? And then, like I even said earlier in the stream, how sometimes the juries are given options. We, again, that happened in the Hannah Gutierrez free trial. That happened with Lori Vallow. Other trials, too, of course, where there's uh, uh, Maya Kowalski as well, like different trials where they have different options where they can choose. Um, and so. That's based on that. I mean, to me, it's almost like because they're not quite sure how the jury's going to interpret the law, but whatever, you know. Um, but that's why. Because what they're saying is that the jury can kind of go with the facts and agree with the prosecution's theory of the facts. But even with that, what the prosecution in those cases or the plaintiffs, whatever, whoever it is, whatever they're, um, they're almost conceding the fact that you could all agree on the facts, but yet you could still come to different conclusions about the law. So anyway, all right, let's keep going. And again, you can believe witnesses all against one, one against others, and you can believe portions of a witness's testimony as you see fit. Same thing goes for experts. Expert is a legal determination that allows them to give an opinion. Just because someone's qualified as an expert doesn't mean that you have to accept their opinion. You can judge yeah, them he's talking based about on their your assessment of the credibility and the relevance and the believability of that testimony. There's nothing different about that when someone's an expert. So if they're an expert, they're trying to tell you two children came in here. Right. I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. Beyond a reasonable doubt, I talked about this at the beginning of the case. And it's our burden. It's a burden we welcome. It's how this system works, that we have to prove the guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And what is a reasonable doubt? A reasonable doubt is a doubt that makes a reasonable, honest, sincere juror hesitate to act. It's proof that a reasonable person would not hesitate to rely on in their affairs. But a reasonable doubt is not and leaves you firmly convinced of the guilt of the defendant, but it doesn't have to overcome every possible doubt. 
It doesn't have to overcome every possible doubt. I used to try a case against a defense attorney, and he would pull up a picture or something. Right here, I have the Mona Lisa. And he would tear off a piece like that and say, ladies and gentlemen, that's reasonable doubt. And my response to that is, you still know what this is, right? You still know what it is. And that's reasonable doubt, okay? If you still know what it is. You know what's crazy? Is I'm sure there's somewhere, I'm sure there's some sure. cultures in the world that would Did not. Under the oath that you've taken, as the law, as the judge will give you the law yeah. to convict the defendant. There we go. Judge will give you the law. That's when it comes to the jury. Direct and circumstantial. Direct, directly pr proves the existence of the fact, and circumstantial evidence is proof of a chain of facts and circumstances indicating the existence of that fact. And we talked a little bit about that at the beginning. Sometimes people in common discussions will say, oh, the case is just circumstantial. But the law says that doesn't matter. The circumstantial evidence can be just as good as direct evidence. It is just yeah, as good. It makes no distinction between that, and the judge will charge you on that. There's no greater degree of certainty required of circumstantial evidence than of direct evidence. The circumstances yeah. must be consistent with each other and when taken together point conclusively to the guilt of the defendant. It's a really important distinction because, you know, I feel like you guys are probably similar where you've heard, oh, okay, I've heard, let me just put it this way. Like I've heard plenty of times throughout my life prior to really, uh, what's the right way to put it? Delving into uh, like law tube and learning about law, but like, okay, let, let me just put it this way. like in everyday life, regular life, whatever. I know I have heard plenty of times in my life, and I, before I knew better, like, but I've heard, I've heard plenty of times, like, oh, it's circumstantial, right? Like, circumstantial is not as good. Like, that's just a, a thing you hear. I, I feel like you know, um, all the time, and uh, it's just it's misinformation. <laughs> like, legitimately, it's. It's it's correct. It's not even a matter of opinion because, in fact, the law says the opposite. And again, that's what he's saying is like when they get their jury instructions, Judge Newman and every judge in every trial is going to going to say this. They're going to say the law makes no distinction between direct or circumstantial. They're to be given equal value. So, and I gave you all an illustration at the beginning. I'm not going to redo the whole thing, but about being inside. And you go outside and it starts raining, then you know it's raining, okay? Because you got direct evidence, you're getting wet. But if you go inside and you're in a closed room and all of a sudden it gets dark and you hear thunder and you uh, hear the wind rustling and you hear the, the rain coming down on top of the roof and then after an hour or so you go outside and the sun's shining but there's limbs all down in the yard and it's wet as far as the eye can see, and there are puddles in the yard and puddles in the driveway. Is there any reasonable doubt what happened, that it rained? Now, again, I'll, I'll say it again. Supposedly, I guess somebody could have sprayed the whole neighborhood with a hose and, and blown a fan to blow the, uh, the wind you, down. Assassin, blow the limbs down. It. Simulate uh, wind, but that's not a reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen. Circumstantial evidence can be just as strong as direct evidence, it is just as strong. The law makes no distinction just because it's circumstantial. All right, let's talk about murder. Murder is yes. the willful killing of someone with malice aforethought. It's the unlawful and willful killing of any person by one with malice aforethought. I also thought the it was a murder. Is really, as far as the that's how everybody says it, not funny. Fairly simple. The, the operative terms here, the most important terms are malice, which is the mental state that the person must have, and a forethought. But let's talk about those. What exactly do they mean? Malice, and it could be any of these. It can be the hatred, ill will, or hostility towards another, but it also can be the intentional doing of a wrongful act with an intent to inflict an injury under the circumstances that the law would infer an evil intent. It could be a general malignant recklessness of the lives and safety of others. It could be a wicked or depraved spirit intent on going wrong. I love how outdated it could be that is. Using firearms, wicked. shotgun, and a blackout. Wicked makes me think of like somebody away. That can be malice, ladies and gentlemen, if that's what you decide. Or like a villain. A forethought. 
Sounds like it has to be planned, and certainly planning would account for a a forethought, but it may be conceived at the very moment, a split second or or in conjunction with the act. So a forethought doesn't require planning for that malice to occur. All it has to do is exist in the moment, just a split second or in the moment that the act occurs. So when that trigger's pulled, as long as there's that intentional doing of a wrongful act, intent to inflict an injury, that would be an evil intent, a malignant recklessness, which you can infer from the circumstances of the case, then that's all you need. And how do you do that? I said infer. Because people don't always yell out what their intentions are. You have to infer it from the circumstances of the case itself. Look at the crime scene, look at what happened, look at the backstory, look at all the circumstances that come together, and you can infer malice from those. Last little bit of law school. Malice and drugs. Voluntary intoxication does not impair a person's ability to act with malice of forethought. That's a legal principle. If you voluntarily get intoxicated, it is not a defense to a crime, and it does not negate the malicious nature of that crime. If one voluntarily intoxicates themselves, they are just as responsible for their actions as when they are not intoxicated. And the judge, again, take what the law comes from the judge, but this is a legal principle that you will hear. Voluntary intoxication is not a defense to a crime. And why does the law say that? Well, you can't take whatever it is and deny responsibility for what you've done under the law. All right? Gathering storm in Alex's life. We talked about the family legacy, you heard how important that was to him and how important that was to this family and how it was in danger because of the boat case. Boat case? The criminal charges as well as the civil charges. That legacy was in danger. And it was threatening also to expose him for who he really was, which would totally destroy his part of that legacy. Lose his career lose his bar license, face consequences like he's never seen. He's also a successful lawyer and a part-time prosecutor. And as we go through and talk about the circumstances of this case and talk about the crime scene and the timeline and all the rest of it, think of it with that in mind, that this is an individual who is trained to understand how to put together cases, complex cases. He's been a prosecutor. He's done complex car wrecks. He understands the law. He's given closing arguments to juries before. I mean, there you go. So I mean, I think a defendant like that. I get it. I understand why Creighton's like hammers the point that he was a prosecutor. I get it. it, it you know, but of course he was like an assistant with his dad and it was like on two cases and it was sort of a joke. So like, we know that it was, you know, really his, his skills and his abilities and his talent to get away with what he did is the more on the art of deception and and maybe less on actual skill, like a prosecutor would have. Um, As we heard even from his colleagues at the firm, like he was really better more at like wheeling and dealing, right? Like, and of course, and in the work he did, settling, it was all settling. So, you know, even when he's referring to closing arguments, I don't know that Alex had to really give all that money because settling is the name of the game for civil. So, um, but I get, I get what he's saying. I get what he's saying. I mean, technically it's probably not objectionable because by definition he did do those things. It's just, you know, I don't know that it's, you know, I don't know that they had as much bearing on his abilities as maybe Creighton is implying, but I get why I get why he's using it. That be thinking about whether or not this individual is constructing defenses and constructing alibis. 
You've thought about his law practice. You've heard how lucrative it is. Here. It, it is. I, I had to struggle with him to get him to admit that he was wealthy, making more than a million dollars a year. Um, I'll let y'all decide whether or not that's wealthy, but he admitted ultimately that you know that was that was not uncommon for him to make that much money on top of stealing and borrowing on top of that. The important thing, though, to remember again, and I want to highlight this, is that they get. And under the way that firm works, they get their money at the end of the year. And then it's up to them to make it last. And that's the big problem that he had. That's why he had to get the Ferris fees. He can't, if he's out of money in May, he's not going to, unless he can borrow it or steal it, he's out of luck. And the hounds were at the gate. Hounds were at the gate. All right. We talked about this. Uh, he's got, uh, you heard, I think, uh, Jeannie describe him as having intentional chaos. Uh, we, we had the land deals. He's servicing this huge debt load. He constantly needs new money coming in. And this has been going on for more than a decade, a constant hamster wheel. The stress and the pressure of that would be extreme because it's been going on for so long, always having to stay one step ahead of the game always having to beg, literally beg, borrow, or steal for over a decade to have the truth from being exposed. That's been going on all that time. The big cases, his partners think he straight, he's straightened it out and paid off his debts, but he hadn't. He's getting paid millions of dollars, but he's stealing on top of that. It's not enough to keep that hamster wheel going. So he borrows and he steals. The methods I mentioned, you got the PSB checks, you got the fake forge, you got fake business expenses, running the firm card, and from his family and his law partners. Each one of these depends on him being able to sit down and look someone in the eye and convince them that what they're doing is right when in reality that wasn't happening. And all those clients trusted him based on those. And we sat there and went through that, and it may have been exhausting, and I apologize for that, but he couldn't tell you about one conversation that he had that stuck with him. That's how easily it came to him. Is that relevant to your consideration of what he had to tell, say to you? That's for y'all to decide. And he's Maybe able to say that. Conversation. He's able to say that, especially because Alice took the stand. Remember, there's a lot of problems with taking the stand, as we know, right? But one of many is the fact, and of course, when they take the stand, when they are making that decision, they're instructed on this, right, to weigh this. But one of the problems, of many problems, is that the juries can consider that testimony just like every other witness. And as Creighton already read, um, when he was saying it was his law school thing, you know, like they can decide how much credibility. Like, think about that. Think about that. If, you, if you're deciding whether or not to take stand and you know that the jury can decide with each witness, including the experts, if they want to give, if they want to believe any of it or none of it, and that the same goes for you, you're just like any other witness and they can believe everything you say or nothing, like that risk is so big, even if you, even if you're telling the truth, like think about that, like, even if you're telling, and the same goes with interrogations, right? Like, even if you're telling the truth, even if you do nothing wrong and you're telling the truth, of course, there's always a chance that people aren't going to believe you or they're just not going to like you, right? <laughs> like, anyway, it's just when you think about that, it's almost like, how could anyone decide to take the stand? But whatever, I understand there's times where it, you know. It's just when you really think about it from a, like a logical basis, it's hard to imagine how someone can come to that decision. It just seems so risky, right? Like, again, even if you are telling the truth and you're innocent, you're, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's a lot of interpretation. There's a lot of room for interpretation, right? So, Just had that same answer that he had rehearsed and didn't want to talk about any of those individuals who trusted him as he looked you in the eye and asked you to do the same. Down at the bottom. It's not just the clients, too. It's his staff. 
They're doing the paperwork. They're filling all that out. He had to fast talk them as well. Alex's situation, I think, is akin to a Ponzi. And a Ponzi's kind of like a pyramid scheme where it depends on new money coming in to pay old investors. And it works. He's right about this because, it, it, I mean, by def, it's not the same, but it is similar. He's really he's right about that because of the way that he is stealing from his clients, right, to pay back money he's borrowed. So that, that is actually a good analogy. It'll work for a long time as long as you can keep that money coming in. But the second you can't, the second that you're out of options, it crashes and burns. That's how every Ponzi crashes and burns. And that's the situation fundamentally his finances were like. And that's the situation that was arriving in June of 2021 when he was at the scene with the victims minutes before they died and lied to everyone he would listen about. A gathering storm, the boat case, other factors that were arising, each one leading to that inevitable day of reckoning. You had the trial lawyers conference where he was confronted Mark Tinsley was confronted by Alec. Alec, of course, denied it. Everybody's lying on Alec. Alec's telling you the truth, even though everyone who knew him had no idea who he was. Everyone. No one knew who he really was. The people who came in here and said we thought this about him, not a single person knew who he, who he really was. That's how convincing he is. But he denies this confrontation when Mark Tinsley was like, he bows up on Mark. Yeah, absolutely, Candace. Yeah. 100% he thought he could get out of it. Yeah. That's where, that's where Creighton, you know, that's why he keeps bringing up the privilege too, which is smart, right? It's not just, I mean, I think it has a dual purpose. Like it's just going to annoy the jury because the jury is regular people, right? And they wouldn't No, I mean, no one would have the type of privilege that he had in terms of how this, you know, the leeway he had throughout the investigation and, and all the other shit too. Blue lights. I mean, there's just a lot of it, right? Um, but yeah, also it just speaks to the point that he thought he could get away with it too. Mark Tinsley, he's like, what you doing, man, about the boat case? And Mark says, you're going to have to pay money to the Beach family. So he left out the best quote from that whole exchange, which was, uh, I can quote this directly verbatim, quote, hey, Bo, what's this? I've been hearing about what you've been saying, end quote. I'm going to say that again because I just forget what. Hey, Bo, what's this I've been hearing about what you've been saying? I mean, come on, Creighton, like. You gotta, you gotta give the best quote. <laughs> Millions of dollars. Alec doesn't have that. He's barely one step ahead of the game at this point. I just keep thinking of a uh, dude, Aladdin. He, like, he says one step ahead of the game so much during his closing, and every, every single time in my head, I hear one step. Uh, bump, 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 bump. I don't even know the words, but it's the song from Aladdin, which I haven't seen since I was, since I was a kid, but you know, one step ahead of the something, 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 da, 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 da. you know, but -da 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 -dum, ba -da -da -dum, that song. Anyway, I don't even know if it says one step, but just in my mind, I just, every time he says that, that's what I think of. He doesn't have insurance coverage anymore, or at least not a big umbrella policy. And why? Because his insurance company dropped him after the Satterfield case. Insurance company thinks the money went to the Satterfield. Yay, the I'm glad you guys are with me. Yay, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> no, I am. I am crazy, but I'm glad you guys also know what I mean. Yeah. So <laughs> if y'all were already thinking that you're going to now, and he said he does, he says it a lot. He's like one step ahead. I don't know why in my mind it's just like, oh, yeah. Like I thought of that from the get go. Every time I was editing this video, I'm just like, I've had Aladdin stuck in my head for like a week now. <laughs> It's pretty great. And you know what? It makes me realize I need to go back and watch Aladdin because I freaking love that movie. They don't know that he's stolen it all. But they don't want to insure him anymore. So he doesn't have that to help him pay the beach case. And so what's the one hope he has? And that's the Ferris case. And it's tried. And you get a verdict in February yep. of 2021, $792,000. Yep. And... Eventually, got to eat to live, got to still to eat, something like that. He tells Chris Wilson, I'm going to structure those, which is they a like, lie, they like almost chop off his hands. And gets and the fees sent to I him. I remember thinking that was scary. And I'm sure I would still find it scary now. <laughs> I'm sure I would be but scared. The boat case isn't going uh, away. Mark says, 
<laughs> Show us your books if you're telling me you're broke. Dude, I was always like, <laughs> the tangent's not going to happen at this juncture. I feel like I'm at a crossroads and I'm like, <gasps> all the tangents. But uh, yeah, I just, I always thought that him and Jasmine made the <laughs> cutest couple. Oh my God. I always just was like, oh my gosh. Like, I always thought he was so, so like, I don't know. I just thought they made perfect sense. But <laughs> this is so stupid. This is a new movie. These are fictional characters. Um, but I yeah, I just, you know, also I just love I love the um I still to this day I love like Middle Eastern vibe of music and stuff like that. And I just remember even like the opening sound sound like a not sound, opening song like, boom boo doo boom boom. Boom, boo, doo, boom, boo. And then, like, the violins would come in, stuff like that. You know, we in music, we call that um, harmonic minor, would be the type of mode, uh, fancy word for type of scale, basically. But I remember, like, uh, the whole, like, the sand dune, and then, like, it eats them up and shit. Like, um, I completely forgot the monkey cusses. Does he actually cuss like out loud? I don't even remember that. That's really funny. I don't remember that at all. I remember being really scared for the carpet. Like, I think it might be the opening scene. I got him since I was a little bit like when they're trying to escape the lava or whatever. I remember being I remember being more scared for the carpet, which I feel like he names the carpet. What does he name him? I remember being more scared for the carpet than Aladdin. <laughs> That's when the monkey cusses. Did the what? I don't remember that at all. That's really funny. Did he cuss? But it's like monkey talk. It's the type of thing where the monkey's like, bah, 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 and then some like Aladdin maybe reacts as if he's cussing. Like I can't picture him actually cussing. It could be implied. But what's the? Does the carpet have a name now? I'm like, what's the carpet's name? Ruggy, <laughs> carpety. <laughs> I'm. In, I feel insane sometimes. Um. That's really funny why if he says you can hear him say shit. I don't remember that at all. I don't even know that I would have known that word, though, to be honest, at that age. Um, I was Jasmine for Halloween one year, too. When I was growing up. My mom made all of my, my, me and my brother, she made all of our costumes by hand. She was actually really, really talented at, like, sewing and stuff. Um, and so she made my costume for Jasmine one year. I mean, I believe you. I just, I don't remember that. But again, I don't think I would have even known that word. I don't think the last time I seen, I saw that movie. Um, that's okay, wifey. You didn't mean to put a quote. We'll forgive you. <laughs> the end of the world. Not the end of the world. It's okay. Um, does anybody remember if the carpet had a name? Ruggy? Oh, man. Um, also, there is a channel. I think Wifey knows about this, but for anyone else who's interested, I, I discovered, I don't know how, because like with YouTube, I don't ever like just click on random videos. Like I know what I'm going to watch. And I just like go and watch that thing. And like YouTube tends to just like know that and like not bother like trying to suggest other stuff. But like for somehow, I don't know how, I really don't know how, but sometimes somehow I ended up it might have been that I searched for something and like made a typo or like voice to text made a typo thing anyway. And I clicked on it thinking it was what I was looking for. But somehow I ended up stumbling upon this channel or this video uh, of like, I think wifey will know what I'm talking about here. Of this dude like pressure washing a carpet. And uh, the channel has like, I don't even know, like hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And uh, it was one of those things where like I cl start, clicked on it. I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I started watching it. And I'm like, Oh my god, this is amazing! <laughs> and like, literally, it's actually really satisfying. I really enjoyed it. Um, there was something really, especially pleasing to me about the squeegee. He uses the special squeegee on the floor. Anyway, it's really, it's really comforting. I don't know. It's like I, I ended up watching a couple of his videos with the car carpets, uh, and it's also like really satisfying to see how much cleaner he gets. Anyway, okay. But does any? I'm just seeing. Did anyone know the name of the? <laughs> okay, why well, he doesn't seem to know the name of the carpet. <laughs> you guys. I remember when I was have I watched that video and I was sharing it with some SDSers in, in the SDS Discord, and I was like, everyone was making these jokes about how it was like 
gruesome shit. And I'm like, what is wrong with y'all? <laughs> Dude, it's okay. It's a, those are, it was a Persian carpet that was red and it probably never been washed. So I think it was just extra dye. Like, you know how if you get like, I, I know people love just being funny. Like, okay. Like, you know, if you get like new clothes and like some certain clothes, if it's depending on the dye, especially if it's certain colors of dye, it'll even say like, wash it separately or like it might stain your other clothes. Or for example, you can even, if you have something that's one of those items and you're washing it separately, but you open the washing machine midway and you look at the water and it's going to be teal or it's going to be red. It's like extra dye, right? So there's that, but also the chemicals and shit that he's using too. So guys, oh man. So I don't think it was like, I don't think all those carpets were involved in murders. I think they'd been sitting around. I think they had extra dye from the fat carpet factory. <laughs> um, you know, even certain there's even certain places where the dust is like red. I'm trying to remember where, like, you know, places where there's like clay dirt, like, like there's pla different places, different environments have like different, their normal, their normal like dust residue on things is different colors. I know what I'm saying isn't making any sense, but um, anyway, <laughs> you know, the environment has its own shit in the air and whatnot, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Okay. I think his testimony was they said that he could probably cobble together a million dollars, which I guess that's broke for him, but it wasn't enough. And so they refuse, and that's what leads to the motion to compel. And there's been a lot of argument about, oh, is that going to be granted or not? Will the judge have granted it? What we do know is that Mark Tinsley said that's what he was seeking to do. Mark Tinsley! And he was seeking to do it because he had been told by the defense that he didn't have money. So he's like, prove it. None of us believe that, knowing what you, we know about you in this community. Prove it. Well, Alec can't have anybody subpoenaing his financial records because it's all going to be apparent. That forge account is going to open right up. He can't have that happen. It will all end. He'll lose his career. He will lose his livelihood. He will face investigations and consequences like he's never, that he's like he's been able to avoid his entire life. But if he can just stay one step ahead, just one month longer, one, one day longer, <laughs> then he's never going to have to face that accountability that he has to face. The hearing is scheduled for June 10th, 2021. And no one's here to argue to you that it's definitely going to be granted. All we're arguing to you is what the witnesses said they were intending to do. And as you've seen in court over the past six weeks, things happen and a process starts. And once that process starts, there's a conclusion to it. There's a conclusion to that. And then you heard from Tony Satterfield, who got up on the stand and talked about the fact that there was some coverage about this case as we move into the spring of 2021, and he hears from Alec. Shout out to Mandy Matney on that him. one. He says, yeah, we're, we're hoping to get this case oh, moving. Banana and you pudding. saw the text wow. message to that I've effect, had that before. and the reality was that it had already been stolen. How's banana he going to pay pudding. that, ladies and gentlemen? That's millions of dollars. Is that, Candace, is that like the type of thing where there's like a wafery cracker thing on it? I'm trying to picture banana pudding. You can't really picture. Is that like jello? No, that jello is different than pudding. Hmm. Yeah. Millions of dollars. And eventually, eventually, they're going to figure out that this money's already been paid. The insurance company thinks it's going the right place. At some point, the question is going to get asked, and that alone is going to break everything apart. Ferris case, this is when his paralegal finds the expense check and not the fee check. And I've already told you this part of the story, and y'all have heard the testimony, but it sets off that inquiry from the second juror. So now you know, I'm just thinking about this now. I'm going to coin like a term, like I think maybe that is accurate. I'm just thinking about this, and it's like, swamp culture like i'm thinking about i just keep i can't help but feeling like 
the swamp is significant in this case. Like, not just because of the hogs, but like, again, it's a unique environmental, like, micro cosm or something you know microclimate something like ecosystem that's the word <laughs> jesus christ um where you know most people can't relate to swamp like i don't want to go anywhere near a swamp because i hate mosquitoes and they're like the bane of my existence and like my whole life mosquitoes kind of left me alone and then last summer no two summers ago i don't know what happened but like the mosquitoes were different that year or whatever and literally they were it, you guys have no idea like I swear to God, they would come, they would get in my house and I don't even know how they would get in my house. They would get in my house and they would literally follow me around. And even when I was sleeping, I remember like waking up because they were stinging my eyelids. I'm not even joking. And I had mosquito bites on, I had mosquito bites on my eyelids. I had them on my ears. And again, this is like, what's crazy is like my whole life. I remember like, even as a kid, they would always come for my brother and he'd be covered in mosquito bites. And I had never had any, like my whole life. And then for whatever reason, two summers ago, like, they literally terrorized me. It was actually really bad. I got so allergic to them that I started having actual like issues with being allergic. I actually went to like the urgent care um, because I was getting so allergic. It was like really bad. Um, and it was like something, it was like, I didn't even know what to do. Like, it was crazy. They were just, it's not like, I, it's not even like there were so many mosquitoes outside. You know what I mean? It wasn't like you would open the door and there's mosquitoes everywhere. It was like normal amount of mosquitoes as you would have any, anywhere, maybe. Well, I don't know why anywhere, but whatever. But it was as if they all just came to my house and followed me around, whether I was outside with laying Frodo out or inside. Like literally, it was like they all just beelined. And uh, so anyway, I last summer was better and I didn't have any issues. But that my point is like the swamp thing. So, uh, yeah, you won't find me anywhere near a swamp. Plus, I hate humidity um with a passion um but uh yeah so i don't know but i feel like the swamp culture like people who can tolerate that good for them um and also like you know i don't know again going back to like my kind of theories of where things might be hidden or stored i just i don't think it's anything fancy you know i think the answers are going to be in more akin to the swamp now we have this on top of everything else that we're mentioning. This is like nothing he's ever experienced. He's always been able to stay one head step ahead of the game. Again, case, you're his again. Rates increased greatly. He started two million dollars, and now he's running out of options. All these factors are converging. All they're converging, and they're converging on one week, one day, and that arrives. Gotta eat to live, gotta still eat. His father's in the hospital. There's a confrontation with Jeannie. I don't know what that's a picture of. You guys know? Alec tells her, manages to ward off the conversation by saying Mr. Randolph is true. He, of course, denies that, so I guess Jeannie's lying on him too. Pendulum, maybe? I don't know. What is that's that what she says that? happened. He's working on the boat case. And then the tragedy happens. And it worked. It's not the only reason. It worked. Yep. But it's part of the reason. The PowerPoint's great, you know? Pressures on this man. People unbearable. Like that. And they were all reaching a crescendo the day his wife and son were murdered by him. It's funny because I heard I actually heard lawyer, you know, use the word crescendo the other day. Um, it's funny every now and again, you'll hear that used in law. And in this trial, it makes sense because I was thinking about this actually, when I heard lawyer, you know, say the word crescendo. Cause I was like, I don't think he knows what that word means. Like he might know that it means something's getting bigger, right. Or something like that. But like, I don't know that he knows what it means the way that like musicians would know. And my, not even all musicians, honestly, classical musicians, but, but I was thinking about it. I was thinking about in this trial, you know, they use a lot of music like idioms, like Poot will say a lot of times, like singing from the same sheet of music. Um, and there's some other musical references as well. And we know Creighton is in a band, but I thought about it and I was thinking about, again, culturally, like it wouldn't surprise me if like, um, you know, they're in the South. Most of them are probably all going to church. And if they're going to, to church and I done being born and raised in the South, it's likely Southern Baptist, you know, they're all singing every Sunday. Um, 
whether they're in the choir. And we know also, we've even heard people talking about that, like from the jurors to the other people, you know, they're, they all talk what church they go to, you know, even her witnesses talk about that. It, you know, whether they're in the choir or they're in the audience, I don't even know what you're called if you're not, if you go to church, because I don't, you're in the, it's not an audience, whatever, you're in the gallery. No, that's law. What is it called? Congregation. That's the word. You're in the congregation. <laughs> uh, then, you know, you're singing along. And especially in that culture, the singing is a big deal. So I was thinking about it and I was thinking that it actually isn't all that surprising. They probably most people there might even be familiar with that word. Um, because it is so kind of ingrained and interwoven into their into the culture. But um, I would be surprised if lawyer, you know, no offense, I don't mean any offense at all, but I would be surprised if he actually knew the root, like the meaning behind the works. I don't think he has any, um, I've never heard him describe any type of musical background or whatever. And again, not that you would have to have that, but that's not a word. Like that word is a musical term and it's, it's Italian and, you know, and it's, not a word. It's one of those things where it start. It's its origins are in music, right? And then people that are thinking along, thinking with music brain, might use it to explain other things, and that's how it would get used. It's not the other way around, right? Like a word that's a normal word and then is used to describe music. So I don't know if that, that makes any sense. But like, um, what's another? What's an example of what I mean? Like, um, I don't know. I can't really think of anything. Uh, yeah, I can't think of another good example of, of the opposite of what I'm thinking of. But anyway, um, yeah, its roots, its roots are meant, it's not a normal everyday word that was, um, you know, used, then started to be used for music. It, it's, it's in, you know, its origins are in a musical notation, right, or musical interpretation, um, you know similar to like a Roland Tondo or whatever. There's a good, any other, there's a million different words, but anyway. Okay. Yeah. I just was going to say, I pre, I do love that he uses the word crescendo and I think he actually knows what it means. was kind of my point there. So. All on that day. And in the wake of this, everything changes. People stop asking about these things. The community has changed like you would expect. People are concerned, they're scared, they're worried, and everything's changed. The backlash from the boat case has gone away and all of that has changed. Road case. And that's why Mark Tinsley thought his case was over. This may seem like, really? But who would understand that better than him? This is exactly the kind of work he did. <laughs> his skills as a lawyer were understanding the emotional value of I love it whenever Creighton says like him or he and then the, the camera zooms in on him. If you have a sympathetic plaintiff and an unsympathetic defendant, that is in the civil world, that's a big case. But if those get reversed, if those change, if all of a sudden your defendant is more sympathetic, it changes it. It's like when Aladdin it becomes changes the entirety of what Mark Tinsley's <laughs> position on this case Full was circle. for the Beach family that Alec was going to have to pay money. And that's what he told you from the stand. He said the second I, if Alec had been the victim of some unsuspect or some random vigilante, the entirety of the case has changed. And I'm not taking the same position. I'm not trying to demand that level of recovery. He gets the 750. Well, he gets 600 of it. Ultimately gets a 750 loan. He convinces Chris Wilson that heads off to Ferris. That's pretty much the main thing he did after this was to make sure he could get that money, enough of it to Chris Wilson so that he would send an email to the law firm saying, hey, everything's cool. I got it. It's all good. And that's what the law firm thought. It's the main thing he did in the wake of the murders of his wife and son was he made sure to stay again one step ahead of the game because he had more time now. <laughs> He had time he didn't have on June 7th, but he had it now. And that's the first thing he did. It's the first thing he did. It's the main thing he did. Was keep the hamster wheel going. Ah, the hamster wheel. I know it seems like a lot, but you have to consider the unique circumstances of this particular man. This particular man who has proven over and over again 
but he will do anything to keep that hamster wheel going and to avoid accountability. And he's been doing it for over 10 years. He just finally reached a point that he had never reached before. I really loved the, and the uh, imagery of the hamster wheel, and that's why I put that in the title. I really liked that from Creighton's Closing. I think it's really accurate. Um, you know, that's what that's that's spot on, right? That's 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 very clear. No matter what he did with the money, no matter what you believe about the drugs or whatever, I mean, I think that's just that's a that's that's a really um powerful imagery for the jury, right? To picture the hamster wheel. Of course, the hearing on the motion to compel gets canceled. Who, who would go forward with that in the wake of what's happened? That goes away. It doesn't. I think you heard from the testimony up there, it doesn't get rescheduled till long after everything crashes and burns in September. It doesn't even get rescheduled in the wake of this. They're going to have to worry about that either and the potential that had for exposing who he was. Because the second somebody looks at his accounts, the second his own partner, Danny Henderson looks at his accounts as, in representing him and says, well, let me see him. He can't do that. He can't do that. He can't even show him to his own partner. Because what's going to happen? They're going to see it too. He can't let that happen. Or everything falls apart. And he loses everything, including that legacy that you heard from individuals up there is so important to him. More important than anything. I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is the timeline. And, and you can see as we, and I'll let y'all look at that, and you can see how this, this is wrapping develops, up. how this hamster wheel continues, how he always. So this is wrapping up the end of this first portion. So pretty soon we'll be at the intermission here. And then we're going to do what the truck part three. I can't wait for that. You guys, um, that's going to be exciting. It has to be one step ahead of the game. You know, we've what? talked about. The Red Beard and the Zero United, those are the land deals that went bad. They get charged off, but yeah, oh, yeah Red State Beard. Bank, you know, still dealing with him. He then appoints Russell Lafitte a conservator and borrows up to $1 yeah, million dollars from the Plower Girls accounts without their knowledge. I forgot about that. And then he has to steal money from the Badger case, where he's already making a huge amount of legal fees. He has to steal money from the Badger case to pay off the Plower Girls before they turn 18. And then there's an accounting for that. And then he opens up the Forge account. And it continues. 338000 from Dion Martin. Johnny Bush, Manuel Sanders, and Richard, two twenty five. dollars He's maxing out a million dollar line of credit. The only way to stay afloat is to beg, borrow, and steal. He's maxing like out a million That's dollar line of credit. Another the beg, borrow, and steal. I really like that theme as well that he uses. Um, I think that's the second time he said it so far on this one. So it's not quite as, he doesn't say it quite as much as like the um, one step ahead, but that's not really a theme necessarily, but, um, but the beg, borrow, and steal. I like that. Uh, I think that has a good memorable ring to it, you know? Um, and I'm just updating my ticker here for forge slash fake forge more money but he's right back to where he was march of 2018 he's now maxed out not only a million dollar line of credit but also a six hundred thousand dollar line of credit a line of credit almost like a credit card maxed out then the boat crash happens and look what happens to the figures 3.7 million 1.1 million one million dollars you have the double homicide this is uh some of the exhibits that's compelling this to show is, uh, how the figures change. These are called the statements, and they're in evidence showing the defendant's assets on June 7th, 2021, and the reds are his liabilities. That one's green, but it's negative. And then over here, that's where he was a couple months later. He borrowed $750,000 and still ended up $347,000 in the hole which part of that had to cover. I think it was called the most generous overdraft policy ever conceived. <laughs> I mean, in fairness though, he did get a $5 overdraft charge right there. So, uh, anyway, 
Good job, Greg. All right, what else do we have? Because we've talked about a lot of things about the finances, and I know that there's been a lot of that, but it's really the only way to understand all the things yeah, that Y'all, have you ever had a $5 overdraft charge? I certainly haven't. I feel like it's like 25 you know, All these like pressures upon you. You know, it's a lot more. Like, no like $5 is insane. <laughs> well, we've got the pills. He claims he's had a pill addiction for 20 years. And what does he say about that? He says it makes him paranoid. He says it makes him agitated. He says opiates give him energy. Use your common sense about that. But he also says, and he even said this in the telephone interview after the side of the road, that the withdrawals will make you do anything, anything to get rid of them. That's common sense as well. We know how I think this is interesting, right? Be. And because here's you, the thing. Here's the thing. You know, what is cream supposed to do? Because basically, think about the, this whole drug thing, right? There's no evidence. That, again, like I said, there's no evidence that he was ever buying, selling, taking, using drugs. There's no evidence. It's just his own testimony. The only thing is those text messages of which there's only one occasion. And it's where Maggie found the pills. But... That doesn't mean he was taking them. And also, I, I think I might have forgotten to mention this, or maybe I didn't. But if you look up the pills she found, some of them, I don't know how much, but like it sounds like there's like half and half, they're Tylenol. So the bag of pills, by the way, isn't even all, isn't all whatever, Oxycontin or whatever. Like there's two, there's two types of pills. One of them is like an opiate and the other is Tylenol. Uh, so anyway, um, but again, there's no evidence of anything that, this ever existed. Um, but what is the prosecution's options here, right? Because um, it's going to be hard to prove that, right? Like typically with drug addicts or drug users, there there's actual proof one way or the other, whether they've got someone who sold them the drug, like it just, this is so unusual, right? Where there's like literally no one to prove it one way or the other. It's just out except for people. Well, there's people that are saying we had no idea. So I guess that's in any in a way, like disproving it, but I think I think that Creighton's, you know, Creighton, it's clear to me he doesn't buy it, right? However, I think he's making the right choice, which is it's going to be hard because if you're the prosecutor, you can't, okay, you can argue like he's doing here, right? You can argue that it's fishy. It seems like he's lying. So there's things that are not reasonable about it, but you can't prove it one way or the other. So your best bet is to just go with it and use it to your advantage. So that's kind of what he ends up doing here where he's like, yeah, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. But like, of course, he sees that there's potential here, right? Of course, there's potential to use that to their advantage that because of the fact that they found the pills or whatever, right, that that could be a part of the equation for motive. I don't, it, you know, you can't blame him for, for arguing that, right? Because it's just the smart thing to do. Addiction of opiates can be extremely powerful. The withdrawals, not being dope sick can be extremely powerful but he's also saying he's taking a thousand milligrams a day and he's trying to blame all his theft on that but that's not what these records reflect they reflect an insatiable desire for money and a hamster wheel that's been going on for a long time and you don't really see the escalation from his drug dealer until March of 2021. I would ask you also, one of the, the tenets of juries is common sense. That's what you're here for, is for an individual and then a collective common sense. Common sense, a thousand milligrams a day, does that sound survivable? No. He sat there on that stand and told you that's what he was taking. And as we're going to go through this process, we're going to talk about what he said on the stand and how many times on the fly that he looked you in your eyes and didn't tell you the truth. He's very good at it. His own partner said that. He's very, very good at it. Now, I'll leave it to you to decide whether a thousand milligrams a day is survivable with opiates. And if you, if it was, that you could still engage in work, have a successful practice, and then on top of that, engage in these complex conspiracies to steal and fool everyone 
and live a life and how people outwardly think that you're, uh, you know, who, who you profess to be in public. If you were taking a thousand milligrams a day, does that make common sense? I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't. I have no doubt that he was taking opiate pills. Yeah, this, so this part isn't the part I was talking about. I think about, he right? looked you, and I would submit to you yeah. to decide whether or not he looked you in the eye and claimed an amount that's inconsistent with whatever else we know about this man. That's really inconsistent with survivability. Yeah, it's inconsistent with being alive, for sure. As for sure. common sense. Yep. He can never function at the level he's been functioning, keeping up with these pressures, staying one step ahead for over a decade. One step. If he was taking that much time. Uh, he says that a lot. I could have put a secret for that, huh? I would submit to you. Just one other lie that I would submit to you as a lie that he's trying to get you to believe, to feel sympathetic for him, as if the dope was the cause of the money and the cause of his issues, yeah. when the reality is, it wasn't. This had been going on for a long time, and the finances proved differently. But what else about this? You've seen the interviews. And we're going to play some clips of these interviews, but I'm not going to play them all for you again. You've watched them. But if you haven't any question, go back sorry, and watch them. He talks about being paranoid. Listen, watch those interviews with, when he's with Dave Owen. He's, he doesn't look like he's withdrawing from any drugs. His, his responses are appropriate. He's, he's uh, not in, in displaying any paranoia. He's smooth, focused on the events. He's focused on trying to get information about the case from law enforcement officers, which is interesting in its own right. Why is he so focused on that? And in Savannah, where supposedly he was detoxing, he sat down, as you've heard the testimony, with a composite, composite sketch artist and went through the whole process to come out with this picture, which I swear is not me. How do you do that? How do you do that if you're... Did Crane, well, no. did Crane just say, which I swear is not me? That's hilarious. Hold on, let me see. I didn't, I didn't catch that before, if that's what he's saying which is interesting in its own right. Why is he so focused on that? And in Savannah, where supposedly he was what you detoxing, guys he sat down, as you've heard the testimony, with a composite, composite sketch artist and went through the whole process to come out with this picture, which I swear is not me. Oh, I see. He, you know what's so funny? How do you, so do, funny? That? How do, you, you guys do that see, if you're... Do you guys see what the similarities there? I do see it in the nose. That's really funny. So people must have made that comment to him before. Huh. On that much dope. So why did he tell you that, ladies and gentlemen? Why did he look you in the eye and tell you that as he sat there on that stand trying to explain what was going on? It's interesting also that... In one of the interviews with law enforcement, there were three interviews, June 8th, June 10th, and August 11th, before we get to the side of the road, that he mentions that Paul was a little detective. That's very interesting for him to mention that, because you heard from Marion Proctor, Maggie's sister, that Maggie called Paul that, the little detective, specifically in reference to Paul paying attention and trying to keep Alec from taking pills. Why would he bring that up? That's an interesting thing to bring up because that was what that was in reference to. And what do we know? We know that in May, if we talk about all the pressures that are coming upon him, all these financial things that we've talked about, this exhausting hamster wheel that's been going on forever, the need to beg, borrow, and still stay one step ahead, and he's running out of options there. On top of that, we know in May, that Paul sends a text to him saying, Mom found some pills, we need to talk. Another pressure from Paul and Maggie on him. And if you look at the texts, the weekend of the ball game on June the 7th, and those are in evidence, Alec is not at the game. 
and he's texting back and forth and Maggie's like don't come if you feel bad and he's like well they're you know I think I can get a late checkout and then he's like at one o'clock they made me leave I submit to you it's a reasonable inference they were on him at this time they were watching him like a hawk opiates the most powerful of withdrawals and everything's coming to a head including this as well Run out of money, running out of options, doesn't get paid in any significant way until December. Already stole the fares fees and spent that money in two months. Has an expensive pill habit and accountability and consequences will do undo everything in his life. Everything that is his self-identity. Everything, the only things that he cares about. He doesn't care about lying to his partners and his family and his friends friends and his clients. If it will lay accountability for him, he'll do it in a heartbeat. And all of that is about to be undone. Motive, means, opportunity, guilty acts. That's the basic way to determine identity. So let's talk a little bit now about means, the tools to commit the crime. Family weapons were used to commit this crime. And this is forensic evidence. around Halloween of 17, years prior to these murders, and that a replacement without a thermal scope was bought in April of 2018. Three blackouts that the defendant purchased can only account for one of them. And it's this third blackout which is the one that's at issue. You heard from Paul's friend, Will Loving. And first of all, let me say this. You heard the defendant in his various statements, and he's very concerned about saying that there's no, they didn't have a blackout. There was no blackout along with them, even though he slipped up once and said, yeah, we were out looking for hogs. And you heard from his law partners that do the same thing, saying, yeah, you can look for hogs in the daytime. Very, very concerned early on in the statements and saying they didn't have the blackout, they just had a 22 pistol. And he also said, Eventually, he's like, well, I think I replaced it. Uh, well, I guess I replaced it. I'm certain I replaced it if you listen to his various statements. Very vague and fuzzy about this third blackout. Until the friends, Paul's friends, who, one of whom, both of whom testified, but Will Loving in particular. And what did Will Loving say? The defendant said the gun went missing around Christmas time of 2020. But Will Loving said, no, I was with Paul. I was with Paul in turkey season, which is in the spring. I was with Paul in turkey season, and we sat out at the steps right outside the house that y'all went to today, right on that side entrance that goes into the gun room. And if you look down, you can see how they were digging a pond and how you could fire down in that area. And they set up some targets to sight it in. And we were shooting that other gun. We were shooting that other gun, that replacement gun. And it had a red dot sight on it. Not a thermal scope, but a red dot. A red dot, which is not good at shooting at night. But they were shooting it and sighting it in with the red dot, the tan gun. He was with Paul while they were shooting that gun right there. And what did Jeff Croft, who testified before you, find right there? Weathered cases or casings. Weather cases, right where Will said he and Paul were shooting that gun just a couple months prior to the murders. S&B, 147 grain, blackout rounds. And those rounds and empty boxes and the pictures are in evidence and the rounds are in evidence were found all over that property. S&B, 147 grain blackout. There were full clips found, there were empty boxes found, and there were also 
cases found, S&B 147 grain blackout rounds found across the street at their shooting house. Two separate locations on the property, but what's really important again goes back to what Will said. I was with Paul when we shot that replacement gun right there. Right there. And you heard forensic scientist Paul Greer testify that the six cases, items two through seven, the six cases found around Maggie that killed her were loaded into, extracted, and ejected through the same firearm that fired those weathered cases right outside the door where y'all went to today and at the shooting range across the street. A family blackout killed Maggie was present just a couple months prior to the murders, and it's gone now. A family weapon the defendant cannot account for killed Maggie. But what about the shotgun? The 12-gauge shotgun that was loaded with one federal double alt buck and one dry lock number two steel shot. Well, First of all, you heard that the two weapons that Paul often favored and often carried were this shotgun right here and the blackout. Those were his two guns, his favorite guns, aside from his deer rifle. The defendant had that gun with him when Daniel Green the first deputy on the scene showed up. And shotguns, as you heard, are a little bit different than rifles. And the conclusion there was, was that the two fired shells that were inside the feed room that killed Paul had class characteristics, similar with that Benelli, Super Black Eagle three, but insufficient individual identifying marks to either match or exclude it. That shotgun right there. But what did you else did you hear about the shotguns? Paul had the Spinelli Super Black Eagle 3. That was his gun. Camo print, camo strap, Nolan Tootin, Nathan Tootin, Will Loving, Rogan, all identified that as Paul's gun. It's the one that Alec had. It's got Maggie's DNA and blood on the receiver. You heard from the DNA expert. And it was loaded with 12 gauge and a 16 gauge misloaded round. What else did you hear? You also heard about the Super Black Eagle 2. And you heard from Nolan and Nathan that this was Buster's gun. This is the Super Black Eagle 2 that had the Mojo sticker on it. And that was recovered during SLED's search of the residence the next day. But what else did you hear? You heard from Nathan and Nolan that the defendant's favorite gun was a Super Black Eagle 1. Remember Nathan going through each one of these guns and how knowledgeable he was as to the differences between them? SLED search. Moselle for every 12 gauge, no Super Black Eagle One. Family weapons. Family weapons kill these victims. And on top of that, just like the SMB 147, well, not as much, but they're in evidence. Federal double alt buck and the Winchester dry lock steel two shot rounds were recovered at various locations on the property. What does that mean? We started, we talked about motive, means. The defendant had the means to commit these crimes. Okay guys, so we're gonna get into our intermission here with what the truck three. So, 
here we go. What the truck? Oh, wait. Let me remove my ticker here. Do, do, do. All right. Part three. How the truck could Alex have driven to the kennels separately? Okay. So. That's, a, that's the question. So here, first of all, we're going to hear from Dale Davis Jr. Um, this is going to be the closest thing we have to confirming the whereabouts of where the golf cart was typically stored. Occasion, did they occasionally leave guns at this area? Yes. All right. Where would you have found them? And, and, and when I say occasionally, what does that mean to you? That would be, especially when it was during hunting season, they would uh, leave either on the golf cart or side by side. Sometimes they would leave them in the, um, the truck, but most of the time it would be on the golf cart or side by side. So just the way that he says that makes it sound like they're parked next to each other. That's the closest thing we have to confirmation besides common sense that if they, if the golf cart was just left outside by the house all the time, it would have been ruined. Right. Um, but that, you know, considering he only went to work at the kennels, he didn't do anything at the house. Um, that also would be another reason to think that the golf cart would have been stored there at the kennels next to the side by side. So, all right. Riding the property, black truck or golf cart. Your truck was where? My truck was parked at the house. At, at the house. house. Okay. So, um, and how far do you think it is from the house to the kennels? You know, I would I would guess it's probably a quarter of a mile. Okay. Okay. Several hundred yards. Several I mean, hundred yards. Oh, yeah. Okay. But he didn't drive your truck down there. Well, I don't know. I mean, it was at the house when yeah. I got there. Okay. So, so you don't know if it was down there and then driven back or not. Yeah. I would assume that he would have driven my truck, parked it since it's mine, and then yeah. gotten in one of their cars mm -hmm. truck to me okay and but you uh, when you got there your truck that he borrowed was parked up was parked right in front of the house okay. where you don't live park. okay all right this is important for two reasons one we know from paul's iphone location data that he didn't initially drive to the house when he arrived at the property he drove to the kennel slash cabin area which john marvin of course didn't know neither did anyone at the time um however this supports the idea that Paul would have used another truck to ride the property, so Buster's black truck. Um, and two, John Marvin's truck is found at the house, which means either Alex or Paul must have driven it from its original location near the kennels back to the house after riding the property. So that's important as we go to, we're, we're going to be working towards determining how could Alex have possibly driven separately to the kennels. We have to know which vehicles were available to Maggie, Paul, and Alex to use from the house, right? So that's why that matters. First thing we do is we go to the Dove Field and, and, we, and we look at the Dove Field. And um, how did you get to the Dove Field? Uh, he had come in uh, my brother's truck. We got in my son Buster's black pickup truck. We called it Buster's truck or the black pickup truck, you've heard it called too. But I, I call it Buster's truck. All right, so why did I initially assume they rode the property in golf cart? Now, if you remember from many episodes ago, um, when I first heard him say that, I thought, wait, why was I picturing them riding around in a golf cart? So I sought to answer that question as well. On June 7th, 2021, did you ever have any conversation with Paul or communication with him? Um, yes, I talked to him around dinner time. I was I was cooking dinner in the apartment that we were staying in, um, and he called me. This is uh, loving on direct about wanting to get a hot tub for the house that we were about to move into. Um, and then he sent me a Snapchat uh, a little bit after that, and that was the last time I heard from him. What was the Snapchat of? It was of him and his dad um, looking at the trees and stuff that they had planted. They had one uh, swoop down that. Obviously, wasn't doing too good, um, but it was just a video of them looking at trees. And you watched that video on your phone or something like that? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Showing the Snapchat now, video. Now this is Will Loving, but on direct. So, or sorry, redirect. So we're going to hear something a little bit different this time as he's talking about that same Snapchat video. You were also asked about another Snapchat video that you saw the day of the murders. Yes, sir. And what was on that video? Um, it was a video of. Alex and his son riding around looking at trees that had fallen over um, on the tractor or on the golf cart. 
All right. So did y'all hear that? He says on the tractor on the golf cart. So based on all the testimony, the golf cart. So, okay, well, first of all, so that's, I think why in my mind, I heard that, of course, that came first in the trial before Alex testified. So in my mind, I'd been picturing, that would be why I was picturing them riding around on the golf cart. But that's the only time that we hear that from anybody is that, that they were maybe riding around. Now, did Paul say we were riding around on a tractor or a golf cart? I, we, we don't know that. Um, that could just be his assumption. But I heard that and I thought golf cart. But in terms of answering this question of how could Alex possibly have driven separately, um, we're going to go through all the possible scenarios. And that will include the scenario that what if they did ride the property in the golf cart? We're going to go through that and you, we'll have that coming up here in just a minute. But regardless, based on all the testimony, the golf cart would have been parked slash stored at the kennels unless someone was using it contemporaneously. What I mean by that is like essentially it would be stored at the kennels, right? Like parked there. But if they were using it for stuff, then it's possible that they maybe would drive it to the house temporarily as they were using it to go around, do different things. And then eventually with the intention of driving it back to park it at the kennel. So just keep that in mind. Like I, I in terms of like, is it possible they are riding the property in the golf cart? Sure. Um, but I, I don't think it was always stored. I, I don't think there's any possible way to believe that it was stored at the house the way Alex describes, right? When he talks about that. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Getting from the kennel slash shed back to the house. All right. So we know that John Marvin's white truck ends up back at the house. The only, this is the key thing in figuring out this and answering this question. The only unknown is which other vehicles, if any, also are driven from the kennels slash shed back to the house. So again, because we know the white truck is there. We don't really know about what other vehicles. So of course we're, we're ruling out, we're not going to part the, the suburban and then Maggie's um, Mercedes Benz aren't part of this, right? Because we, they have the telemetry. We know that those were not involved in terms of, and until Alex goes to Almeida and all that, right? But um, so we're, we're really concerned with these other vehicles that don't have the telemetry, don't have all this other info. Um, and we're just basing it off of basically the testimony of people and, and every, you know, the only person who, who was there that could actually give us the truth is Alex. And of course we know what that's worth. So the only, again, the only unknown is which other vehicles, if any, also are driven from the kennels slash shed back to the house because we know the white truck is. Okay, what does Alex say? Your stats that you say when you got to the house is 809 and Paul was still down at the shop, but don't these records reflect that Paul is pinging with GPS data at the house at 808? This record appears to show Paul at the house at 808. So those records don't fit with your new story that you've testified yesterday and today. Is that correct? No, I, I don't. I don't believe even right now, Mr. Waters, that that's right. I'm not saying what you're doing is you're taking 809 and saying that I'm at the house, and I mean that may or may not be right. But what I'm saying is is that when Maggie came through, I left, and I believe that Paul. Um, stayed at the shop. Now, did Paul come right behind me? I I'm not sure, but when I when I left him, I believe that when I left to go to the house, I believe that Paul stayed at the shop for a minute. When you, and we saw your last steps were at 809? Well, that's what you saw when my this data recorded my last steps, but as you heard this testimony too, um, Mr. Waters, you know, that's not a precise that that's not a a, a precise y'all you heard the testimony you know what it is well how did you get back to the house remind us from the shop yeah i went in the white pickup truck went in the white pickup truck okay all right scenario a here we go again we're trying to figure out what vehicles would have been available basically to get from the or sorry we're trying to figure out what vehicles could have been back at the house after they rode the property, right? So here's the first scenario. Paul arrives at Moselle and parks John Marvin's truck at or near the shed. We know that that happened because of the, the iPhone location data. Okay, two, 
Alex drives Buster's black truck to meet Paul at the shed. And we know that he had to do that because he, if he had taken his suburban, we would have had that in the data. And we know he wouldn't have walked, right? All right, three, Paul and Alex ride the property. Again, this is scenario A. Scenario a. Paul and Alex ride the property in Buster's black truck, which Alex says is what they did. But beyond that, we also know that that entirely was possible because of all the testimony that they would have ridden their property in potentially one of the trucks slash potentially in a golf cart, right? Okay. According to Alex, he drives John Marvin's truck back to the house. So then step four would be Alex drives John Marvin's truck back to the house and Paul drives Buster's black truck back to the house. So that has to be the case, right? Because again, Paul wouldn't have had any other way to get back. And we know from all the testimony, it was just so unlikely that he would have walked or any of them would have walked really, except for Maggie, right? So this puts both trucks back at the house. Scenario B. One, Paul arrives at Moselle and parks John Marvin's truck at or near the shed. Two, Alex drives Buster's black truck to meet Paul at the shed. So those are the same so far. Three, Paul and Alex ride the property in Buster's black truck. Also the same as the first scenario. All right, four, Alex lied. He drives Buster's black truck back to the house and Paul drives John Marvin's. We don't actually know who drove back first or what vehicle they drove in because the only data from Alex's phone is step data. We do know that the white truck arrives back at the house. So it's entirely possible that Paul drove back to the house first. And again, based on what we heard from Alex's testimony, which was just a disaster on that point, um, it's in, again, it's, impo it's possible Paul drove back first and it's possible that um, Alex was lying about which truck he drove in, right? Regardless, both scenarios A and B put both trucks back at the house. Scenario C. One, Paul arrives at Moselle and parks John Marvin's truck at or near the shed. Two, Alex drives Buster's black truck to meet Paul at the shed. Three, Paul and Alex ride the property in the golf cart. So this is like what I was saying before, where we're going to go through this too. Like what happens if they did ride the property in the golf cart? Four, as with scenarios A and B, one person drives the black truck back to the house and the other drives the white truck back to the house. The important thing here, like scenarios A and B, this puts both trucks back at the house. Scenario D. Paul arrives at Moselle and parks John Marvin's truck out or near the shed. Two, Alex drives Buster's black truck to meet Paul at the shed. Three, Paul and Alex ride the property in the golf cart. Four, one person drives back to the house in the white truck and the other drives back to the house in the golf cart. Okay, this leaves the black truck at the kennels slash shed area and puts the golf cart at the house before the murders. Scenario E. Paul arrives at Moselle and parks John Marvin's truck at or near the shed. Alex drives Buster's black truck to meet Paul at the shed. Paul and Alex ride the property in Buster's black truck or the golf cart. Four, Paul and Alex ride back together in John Marvin's white truck. Entirely possible, right? So let's go through it. So this would leave the black truck and the golf cart at the kennels slash shed area. Remember, the only known that we know of, for sure, of vehicles that end up back at the house after this excursion riding the property is the white truck, right? We don't know about the other vehicles. So that's why we're going through these possibilities. All right. Here we go. Here's the key part, right? Because the question we're trying to answer here is, um, is how the truck could Alex possibly have driven separately to the kennels, right? From Maggie, from Maggie and Paul. All right. So now getting from the house to the kennels, here's where we put it all together. Okay. How would they normally get down there? Would you know? Based on what I've heard since Monday is Paul 
would always drive something and and it didn't matter and it sounds like that if it had keys in it gas in it he would drive it okay okay you know it, it, there was no one one favorite but you don't know what, how he would have driven down there you talking about then yeah that night no, no okay and how would maggie get down there well and i've been told since monday as well that in many ways a lot of times she would walk a lot of times she would you know take her car or okay i so, think usually it probably would be her car or walk and, and or the say, golf cart you say or the golf cart okay and we know she didn't take her car right because it wasn't found there all right so now just to refresh our recollection from what the truck part two the the ford f-150 seats at least three people that's the black truck right the golf cart also seats at least three people all right, here we go. So with scenarios A, B, and C, what do they all have in common? With scenario, scenarios A, oh, we have a DSN, um, a DSN command in the chat. So we have this. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Shout out to Daddy Shortnuts, if you're still listening, or even if you're not. All right. Um, so that, yes, so with scenarios A, B, and C with the white truck and the black truck. It puts the white truck and the black truck at the house and the golf cart at the kennels after riding the property. This leaves one vehicle available to be driven to the kennels, the black truck. So again, this is this is with the scenarios where, where Paul drives one of the trucks back to the house and Alex drives one of the, the other truck back to the house. We regardless of which truck or who goes first, all of those scenarios. And regardless of also what vehicle they rode the property in, all those scenarios place um, two vehicles back at the house, but that leaves one vehicle available because we know the white truck didn't actually go to the kennels, right? Because we solved that whole mystery. So it leaves one vehicle available to be driven to the kennels, the black truck. Because the thing here is we're looking at the number of people versus the number of vehicles, right? So that's why it's having to go through it step by step like this, because it's like, you think it's not, it wouldn't have been possible for both trucks and the golf cart, for example, to be back at the house or because they would have needed a third person to drive it, right? Scenario D, this puts the white truck and the golf cart at the house and leaves the black truck at the kennels. This leaves one vehicle available to be driven to the kennels, the golf cart. So the first three scenarios leave one vehicle available to be driven to the kennels and it's the black truck. This scenario, scenario D, leaves one vehicle available to be driven to the kennels and it leaves, that would be the golf cart for this scenario. Scenario E. This leaves the white truck at the house. So in scenario E would be was if Paul and Alex rode back together to the house in the white truck after riding the property. This leaves the white truck at the house and would leave the black truck and the golf cart at the kennels. This leaves no vehicle available to be driven to the kennels. So how the, to go back to our initial question, how the truck could Alex have driven to the kennels separately? The answer is he couldn't have unless he walked. Because no matter what scenario you look through, we went through all the possibilities there. There's either one vehicle available or no vehicles available to be driven to the kennels after riding the property. So he couldn't have unless he walked. So what what I think we've just proven here is that he had they all went together. They all went together. Like the whole thing about the fake nap and all that other bullshit, it's all bullshit. They went together. So I know we kind of talked about that in what, what the truck do, but I wanted to walk through it step by step with including the different possibilities with the golf cart to see what would happen. And um and now it just we it just confirms it, right? I mean to see what vehicles would have been available no matter with, with every situation. And if I left out a possibility, let me know, but I, I don't think I did. I went through all of it um, a million times and wrote it out and did a bunch of different graphs and charts and drawings and um, again, listening to the testimony, but um, those are the only scenarios that I can, can think with, with the facts that we have, right? Um, so he couldn't have unless he walked. But what the truck is going on here? It's the house. Yay. Okay. 
So that was what I had planned for the intermission. So the reason I wanted to do that here is because for this next part of Creighton's closing, we're going to hear him go through the timeline um, of the actual murders, right? So the first part was kind of like the financial stuff, um, the weapons and stuff. But now we're going to get into Creighton's Creighton arguing the timeline to the jury. Um, and so, yeah, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. All right. So to start it out, <laughs> sorry, to start out, I forgot re recap from chicken business part three. Again, this is, this is going, this is going to be preparing us for this forensic, uh, timeline. All right. So just to recap it, whether you were here or not, because this was a while ago, when and why did Paul go into the feed room? So we're going to have some, some another thing with different scenarios here, like we just had with what the truck part three. But this is going to come up. Creighton's going to, the reason we're doing this again, Creighton's going to be discussing the these, not 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 so much like this, but he's going to be discussing this in his closing, closing. So potential scenario A. All right. So scenario A. So the camera turns off at 845, 47. There's a two minute and eight second gap before the next fun activity. So does Paul stay in the kennels and try to send that snap? Hoping to get service. So stays in the kennels while texting, hoping to get enough service for snap. And then um, at 8.48.58, locks his phone, puts it in his pocket, and goes into the feed room for something like maybe a caller. And again, we're going to hear Creighton bring up the callers. I believe Creighton brings it up. I think maybe Jim brings it up too, but goes into the feed room for something, maybe a caller. That would, that because right, because right, like why would he go in the feed room, right? That was the part of the question. So, okay, potential scenario B. 45 47 his camera turns off again so at that point we know he was still at the kennel or at right at the it at caches he was still filming cash so that puts him at that particular location in the kennels up until then so then we have a two minute and eight second gap before the next fact again because of the fact that he was actively in these conversations that gap is what is intriguing to me so during that gap the, again in scenario a we thought maybe is he staying where he was and trying to send the snap in this scenario scenario b does that gap mean he's entering the feed room hoping to get better service and trying to send the snap during that gap in activity on his phone. Okay. Stays in the feed room while texting, hoping to get enough service for snap. Um, and then does he lock his phone, put it in his pocket and attempt to leave the feed room with something, maybe a caller. Okay. There's a caller. So I noted this before, but you know, is, is there a reason the caller is there, right? It's not hanging up on the wall with the other callers. Was it because he was picking it up off the wall there where you see the other ones hanging? And then did he drop that as he was shot? Uh, who knows? But it's there. Okay, potential scenarios A and B, the aftermath. Okay, so Paul is shot between... 849.29 and 849.30, causing Maggie to lock her phone. So there's like a, what, a 31 second window in there. Or sorry, not a 31 second. Oh my gosh, a one second window in there. Um, and that would be based on looking at when her phone locks, right? Potential scenario C. So this is the aftermath, right? Okay. So again, we have the camera turning off. We have that gap in the phone activity enters the feed room, tries to send snap. Stays in the feed room while texting, hoping to get enough service or snap. Okay, potential scenario C. So we have this text message from Megan Kimbrell. It was read at 848.59. He, he reads it, but he doesn't respond, right? Which is interesting. So his phone locks at 849.01. So that's two seconds after um, the snap. he reads this message, right? So that's really quickly after he's read. Think about that, right? If he's reading that message, but he doesn't respond, 
and two seconds later, his phone locks. So in this scenario, this potential scenario, this phone would still be in his hand, but he doesn't put it in his pocket because he's still holding it because he's going to tell you in this scenario, he's intending to respond, right? He's reading that text message. He's intending to respond. His phone is still in his hand. Then at 849.01, his phone would lock unintentionally or maybe it auto locks due to low power mode. We talked about this before in the other one, but there are different settings where the screen can power off or auto lock uh, quicker because his phone, his battery would likely have been on like 1% at this point. So then if this is the case, um, if he's shot at 849.01 and that's when his, you know, potentially, like I said, his phone locks unintentionally, maybe he drops it, his phone locks. But his phone would fall to the ground in the feed room where Paul was standing. This is just completely different than what the other ones are, right? So then again, his, his battery likely would have been on 1% by 84901 because if we look at it here, the trajectory at 84304, it had 2% battery life. And this is before he even took that Snapchat video. And he was still texting, him, of course, that whole time. So it, it either would have been still at 2% or it would have been on 1%. By the time it locked. Potential see the aftermath. So Paul is shot with his phone in his hand. Phone falls to the ground. Maddie would have heard and would not be on her phone. And all of those times where you see those little arrows there pointing. In this scenario, this would be Alex, not Maggie. I'm here, Black Widow. I don't know about everyone, everyone else. I don't know. I'm here, though. Um... So that would be Alex, not Maggie, using um, her phone. And we know he had her password. So, but this changes the time of death by about 30 seconds. And it also, again, this is important because it does implicate that Alex is using Maggie's phone and probably fucking with it, right? Which would be why he maybe tried to throw it on the side of the road and all that to disrupt the data. So this is when I thought to myself, if Paul's phone fell suddenly, wouldn't it have logged an orientation change? Then I realized that in the trillions of times I've studied the full timeline, something is missing. 10.34 p.m. is the first orientation change for Paul's phone in the full timeline. This is when Alex, quote, tries to do something with it after claiming it popped out of Paul's pocket. And also at the same time, this is also the last orientation change of Paul's phone. Considering Paul used his phone more than anyone in the timeline and yet didn't log a single orientation change until 10.34 p.m., while everyone else logs orientation changes constantly, it is reasonable to draw the conclusion that Paul had his orientation locked. This is why if his phone fell as described in potential scenario C, it did not log an orientation change. Um, Black Widow is saying it did, or was that Maggie? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Can you elaborate on that question? Further, orientation lock can be accessed from the control panel of an iPhone without knowing the user's passcode. Because we know he didn't know Paul's passcode, right? After returning from Almeida and calling 911, Perhaps while doing a shitty job of putting up the hose and practicing his crying, Alex noticed that Paul's phone was still lying in the feed room. Um, Black Quitter says it's hard to move your phone. Right. So that's what I was just saying, though, is that Alex moved the phone. Like in potential scenario C, the scenario is that Paul was actually still using his phone. Like if Paul, okay. In order for the phone to have popped out of the pocket, the way Alex said, never mind the fact that that sounds insane. We're looking at the fact that was the phone initially in the pocket or not, right? In order for the phone to be in the pocket, Paul would have had to put it in his pocket initially, right? Before he died. So in this potential scenario C, he was still using his phone, which makes sense when you look at the timeline because he had just read that text from Megan two seconds before this, his phone locks forever. So if he still had his phone in his hand, and was shot, it wouldn't have fallen into his pocket, right? It would have fallen onto the ground in the feed room. So the idea with this potential scenario C is that it never was in the pocket. Alex went and picked it up in the feed room and put it on Paul's butt and then made up the pocket story. 
Um, reminder, I'm not a detective nor do I play on TV, as they say. Um, we've already been through this. This is from before, but just to review it. It is reasonable to conclude, here we go. So this is maybe hopefully to answer your question, Blackwater. It is reasonable to conclude that in an attempt to potentially throw off law enforcement or alter the crime scene in any way, which would make it different than how it actually was, Alex picked up Paul's phone, turned the orientation lock off and put it on Paul's butt so that the data on the phone would suggest that one, the orientation wasn't locked, two, no orientation change due to a sudden fall was recorded equals there was no sudden fall, and therefore three, Paul's phone was in his pocket the whole time. Those little details, right? You see what I mean? Like it creates confusion. It fucks up the crime scene. Anything from, to make it seem like anything from what it actually was. Same like with Maddie's phone, right? And actually, we're going to even hear that from Creighton when he starts talking about this. That's why I wanted to go over this beforehand because we're going to hear Creighton talk about how he maybe was trying to manipulate that crime scene. Because any change to make it look to appear different than what it was would be significant, right? And hope, hopefully he would think it would have helped him more than it did. Um, Blackwater, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. So I'm not quite sure what you're asking there, but, um, but yeah, we're talking about Paul's phone with the orientation because there's, it's, it, what, uh, what I noticed was that there was, it was missing. Like I found it significant when I went through the timeline again, when I was putting this together before that with all the activity on Paul's phone, there's no orientations logged and everyone else has orientation changes logged all the time on it. Like we know that, like they we hear about that all the time in this testimony, like it's constantly doing the orientation changes, blah, blah. And, um, and so the only, the first and only orientation change that we have for Paul is at 1034, which is when Alex says he's fucking with the phone. And of course, Paul's dead. So that could have been Alex picking up the phone and turning the orientation lock off to try to mask the fact that it could have, um, to, to try to make it seem like it didn't, like if it had fallen suddenly, it would have logged an orientation change. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, lastly, iPhone data does not record when the orientation is locked or unlocked. It only shows if or when an orientation change occurs. Therefore, the only way to determine if a user has orientation lock switched on is to look for the absence of orientation changes. Just as with Paul's phone, with frequent phone usage, should be frequent orientation changes if the orientation is not locked. This is still the case with current iPhone generation and iOS software. So that's why it's significant. <laughs> that's why it's significant that there were no uh, no orientation changes in that timeline for Paul until 10:30. Yeah. It's a chicken. There we go. Now back to Creighton's closing arguments. At the beginning of the case, I talked to you about some of the evidence that you would hear. And I held up my cell phone. And there's been a lot of that evidence, but the last witness you heard in the state's case in chief was Peter Rudolfsky. And he went through that timeline. And what does it show? We're going motive means opportunity opportunity to commit the crime and what does this timeline show these are all the information the various sources of information that were in this timeline and let's look at what it shows first thing right here is that the defendant arrived at Moselle at 6 42 now I'll say one thing you've heard a lot of testimony about what he said about times what time he got home, what time he went to the office, how long he was at Almeida. Certainly people can have some variability in assessing that. But he almost never was right. Almost never. I mean, I think he right. literally, I don't even think almost, he was never right. <laughs> 642, he arrives at Moselle. Paul, according to his extraction, gets there about 7.04. And about 7.03, we see the defendant steps registering on his phone. And then, over the next 30 minutes or so, we see a symmetry, general symmetry between the steps between Paul's phone and Alex's phone, as he described, walking the property. At 7.39, 
we have creation of the Snapchat video that had the clothes on it. When that ultimately was recovered and you saw the interview, it was shown to the defendant who had provided his clothes that night. And at the first time then he started talking about changing his clothes and we'll talk more about that later. Again, 7.55 to 8.05, we have some symmetry with the steps. We have Paul Murdaugh's battery life. And you heard from the experts that have reviewed Paul's usage that like many kids his age, he's constantly flirting with it being low. But that doesn't stop him from using it and you see that in the evidence in this case as well. 7.56 again, that's when Paul sends the Snapchat to his friends. And then at 808, we see Paul leave the kennel area at 806. He can his hour on. <laughs> at 808, make his We're way not him, down to whatever, I guess the we're residence. Also 805 to 809, around that time that Paul is getting there at 808, that's the last step activity on Alex's phone. And it's the last step activity until 902, which we'll talk about in a minute. Alex's phone pretty much goes with no activity for that time yeah. period. And also he has no cell activity from 652 to 904, yeah. Yeah. which is right in that time period we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so pausing it here. So this is from What the Truck Part 2. Um, because this is something that I pointed out, actually. I pointed it out and I from from what the truck part two, where I was like, wait a second, I thought it was notable that Alex's phone was logging steps, but then nothing else. And then it goes completely silent. So um, according to Alex, um Paul and Alex leave the dove field in um Buster's truck and drive. Okay, yeah, yeah. The important part here on the slide actually is the part that's highlighted. 805 to 809 is the steps traveled. And then, right, this part. However, we don't have any location data from Alex's phone after he arrives from Moselle. We only have steps. Again, this is from What the Truck Part 2. Contrary to Paul's phone, which tracked both location and steps, perhaps Alex put his phone on airplane mode when he came home and then turned his phone off completely at 809.52. And that's exactly what, this was what I was saying from, what, two episodes ago or something. And I just thought it was funny when I heard Creighton say, suggest something similar. I was like, oh, yeah, we, we figured that out. Um, I, I am also missing T-Pain um, as well, Blackwater. I know. It's awful. Um, we love you. We love you, wifey. Do her command. <laughs> Nightbot loves you too. <laughs> so, eating dinner. You heard the defendant talk about eating dinner. Paul is at that residence, if you look right here, from 814 down to 835 and again that timeline exhibit there's a big one and then there's a condensed one and all of this is in there uh, in evidence for y'all to look at he's at that residence from 814 to 835 now the defendant again despite having a photographic memory a new photographic memory about things <laughs> he told y'all that people are hearing for the first time still can't remember specific things about Maggie's activities, as to when Maggie arrived, as to what they talked about. He can remember dropping his phone down in the console, but he can't remember things like that. He wants to remember things that help him try to explain to you why he never told the truth about maybe the most important thing he could tell law enforcement. But he can remember very specific details. He still gets this wrong. But she arrives at 817 in Moselle. They're already there. How do we know that? Because her cell phone disconnects from her Mercedes at 817, and that's when she starts showing steps. And Paul, what's he doing? He's still using his phone like always. We see the battery life, but he's still sending snaps, yeah. receiving snaps. Bless you. Oh, <laughs> well, but he says bless you. He's sending to his friends, all these friends right here. He's receiving these snaps all during that time from 817 to 830, continuing to communicate with his friends, using his phone like always. 
And then what happens? About 8.30, Maggie's phone registers some steps. And consistent with that, consistent with her and Paul going down to the kennels, riding down to the kennels, we see Paul's Murdoch phone start showing steps. And then down here at 8.38, He's at, in that kennel area where those dots are. And if you look at that particular slide from 838 to 844, that's going to be the last GPS reading on Paul's phone, 844. You heard from Rogan. And you heard from Rogan as it references this timeline. And Rogan tells you and told you from that witness stand that he was having a conversation with Paul about cash and the, and the dog's tail. They were having an active conversation about that. Paul calls Rogan at 840 and they're talking about it. And Rogan says, send me a FaceTime, but if it doesn't work, send me a video. At 8.44, 4 minutes and 14 seconds, we have right here the FaceTime, but it only lasts 11 seconds. And then at 8.44.55, that's when the kennel video was recorded that lasts 50 seconds. At the beginning of this investigation, as you will call the testimony, they didn't have Paul's password and couldn't get in. And you heard in the defendant's August 11th statement that when he was asked about Rogan saying he may have heard Alec on the phone during this time, he said, well, I'd be surprised if that were the case. Because law enforcement didn't have this kennel video. They didn't have this kennel video until April of 2022, when Paul's phone was finally unlocked. And that changed everything. Why did it change everything? Opportunity. Being at the scene of the crime when the murders occurred. Opportunity. And more importantly, exposing the defendant's lies about the most important thing he could have told law enforcement. When was the last time I saw my wife and child alive. Why in the world would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that and lie about it so early? I think it's a great point. I think it's a great point. He didn't know that was there. And he can always say, well, Rogan must be mistaken. I'm surprised. Not if my times are right, was what he said. Rogan told you I was expecting that video right there. That was supposed to be the next thing that happened. Send me the video because we were worried about Cash the dog's tail. He talked about how his girlfriend was going to call a veterinarian or she had some association with one. It was an active conversation going on right then and right there. And what's going on still? Paul's still also texting his friends. You might recall that in opening statement, the defense counsel said, oh, he was texting after that video for 10 minutes. It's not for 10 minutes. It's for barely a minute. Down here, Back to get wrong. 848, 58 to 849.01. That's the last time that Paul's phone was unlocked. And what do we know? We know that the defendant was there just minutes earlier at the scene of the crime with the victims. 849-01, Paul's phone locks. He never sends that video to Rogan. You heard Rogan say that when he watched that video. You heard him say, that's the video I was supposed to receive. 
that is the video that my friend was supposed to send to me. And he never did. In fact, Rogan responds at 849.35, and he says, see if you can get a good picture of it. Mary Ann, his yeah. girlfriend, wants to send it to a girl we know that's a vet. Crazy. Tell him to sit and stay, Crazy. and he shouldn't move around too much. He's Even though this boy. is an active conversation with Paul, who you heard from multiple friends, was one to respond and use his cell phone, Paul never reads it. Paul never reads it. What happens at 849-31? We're 849-01 for Paul. 849-31. Maggie reads Lynn's response to the group thread about Mr. Randolph. Or it could be Alex, right? Fucking with her phone. And then her phone locks forever. And is never unlocked again until it's recovered the next day. Down here. 6-8 and 110. 8-49 for both of them. The defendant, after hearing multiple individuals of his family and friends and law partners get on the stand and listen to that video and say, that's him on that video, got on the stand for the first time and said, okay, I was there. He was forced into doing what he does all the time and that's coming up with a new lie when he's confronted with evidence he can no longer deny. Just like the side of the road. And the only reason he did that, the only reason he did that is because all those witnesses at that witness stand said, yeah, that's him. He's there. Why would he lie about that, ladies and gentlemen? Why would he even think to lie about that if he were an innocent man? Yeah, because he wouldn't. The thing is, is, Why would he even think about that? But he got on the stand and he's told you a story. One of the other important things, and I think Crane mentions it, but just in case, one of the other important things is like, how would he... Like, how would he even know what times to lie about unless he knew what time they died, right? Like, if he actually wasn't there, but he was just lying, he wouldn't know exactly what time he needed to tailor that lie to, right? Like, if like if that makes sense, like, to try to make it seem like he um, left for his mom's right before this happened, you know, um, like, the only way you would know what to lie about would be if you had information, right, if that makes sense. And we're going to talk more about that story in a minute. But his story was was that he didn't want to go down there, and then he went down there, and, and he went down there really quick and got care of the chicken and went straight back, and he can't remember anything about what he talked about with Maggie. He can't remember their conversation at dinner, but he's, he's dadgum sure about the fact that he went down there and went straight back. But even if you give him the benefit of the doubt. His story doesn't make sense because that kennel video is 50 seconds. It's over at 845.45. Even if you give him the benefit of the doubt that he could take care of the chicken and maybe the fastest dog and chicken chase ever, <laughs> put that chicken up and not I say a word it. to Maggie and Paul right. and get on that golf cart and get drive all the way cart. back to the house. Where does that put you? Puts you right at 849. At which point he claims he went inside and he managed to doze for a second. But then he's up at 9.02, perhaps the quickest nap ever. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a new story to fit facts he can no longer deny. From a person who, not a single right person now, who was Twitter close to awful. him knew who he really was. Not a single person close to him hadn't been lied to by this man and i would submit to you that this one is the most blatant one yet and, we'll and remember we we proved we proved with this what the truck three intermission here that he went there with them there's no other way there's there was there were not enough vehicles available because we know that the vehicles at the house 
that had telemetry were taken there. Like they're, whether they all went together in the black truck or they all went together in the golf, he had to go out there with them. Um, so that just like, in other words, the only reason he has his new stupid story about the, the stupid 10 second nap and all that is because he's trying to make it seem like he wasn't fully lying. Right. Because his lie was like, Oh, I was at the house taking a nap and then I left. So then it's like, Oh, well, that's still partially true. Right. Like, like if that makes sense. Right. I mean, in, re in reality, it would have been actually probably more feasible if he actually conceded that he rode out there with them. Right. And then, because that would have put him out there longer, that would at least made it seem less stupid where it's like, part of it is like, yeah, he was out there for two seconds, just did the chicken chase and then drove off. It like makes no sense. Um, you know, but having said that it was more important to him to try to protect that initial lie. Um, to try to make it seem plausible, like it wasn't a full lie or whatever, which is just, you know, it's the whole thing. But, um, but I think it's really interesting how in this trial, no one actually figured that out, that it would be impossible for him to have um, driven separately. I mean, not that it really matters. It matters in terms of under really understanding what happened, but like, you know, um, obviously it didn't, it was one of those details that seems to not matter in the long run, clearly, right? Because he was found guilty, but um, you know, but we figured it out. So that's good. What happened at 849? Y'all been to the scene. That feed room door is probably a bit tighter than this. Much tighter. We saw that in the jury. We saw the evidence from yep. Kenny Kenzie and all the rest of them. The clearly call was in. It's like maybe the middle of that feed room. Thirds the size of that Kills door. Him. Yeah. Nobody in there with him. He's in that room. I think DSN called it a death no trap. No defensive wounds at all. His hands are down. And he takes that shot, buckshot to the chest. And any person who did that would probably think that took care of business because this buckshot was this for is some reason he was this way and it went through. It was a million and one shot. Yeah. But it didn't kill him. So Alex was surprised. Good Alec. point. Yeah. Alec, the lawyer, Alec, the prosecutor, Alec is thinking through that we'll see he's manufacturing an alibi and he's also manufacturing the fact that there's two guns used. But we know, unlike the expert they call from Connecticut where they can't even get ARs, who doesn't know about people riding around on property, he doesn't know yeah. about Paul and the two guns he likes to use. He doesn't know about this family and how no common context. those guns are together. Says, well, his only conclusion is oh, it would be practical for somebody just to, to, to fire out the clip. But this is him. This is Alec, the prosecutor, the lawyer. And he's thinking through this. He's thought through this. He's going to use two guns because it's going to confuse people that perhaps there are two shooters. But again, it doesn't make sense. Two family weapons. And this is a lot like what I was saying before, too, like with the phones and stuff, like just to try to fuck with it. Right. I and mean, I mean, it was one of the things he did the best out of all the fuckery was the using the two guns like that was maybe the strongest argument anyone could have that it was more than one person right it was the two guns so that you know but again it, it just in an effort to make it look like anything other than what it was so so that tracks but he thinks paul's shot and you heard the testimony that paul appears in the feed room doorway Is Alex putting down that shotgun to mm -hmm. pick up the blackout and is startled by Paul? And that's why the angle's like that and catches Paul like that and, and goes up into the ceiling, as you've heard the testimony from Kinsey. And I think that's a good that's a good argument, too. You know, we were saying how it's also possible that maybe it was the water, right? Because he's there's also the step coming out of that door frame that would combine with the pull of water and then the blowback of the first shot. I think either way, whether he fell and tripped over that step or with the water, or he was putting down the gun and was surprised and Paul caught him off guard by still being alive. Either way, it, the point is that he wasn't planning on taking that second shot. And that's why the angle was weird. And that's why he was down at that. That's why he was either he fell over or he was bending down. Right. And that would explain. And then he was taken by surprise. Either way, um, it, it, it explains, it explains and it accounts for that, that second shot being at that angle. And blows, blows his brains out. 
And what happens with Maggie right here? We see activity on Maggie's phone. You heard about again that Sandal Prince. Be Alex, if you heard from Kenny Kinsey not at age about but the mark on her leg from the Polaris over there by the overhang next to the feed room. You've seen the diagrams and the crime scene photos that all those cases are in that area between the doorway to the feed room and where Maggie was found. You heard that Maggie had no defensive wounds. You also heard Paul and sibling from that first shot, a close range shot with no indication that he detected a threat from the person who fired that weapon. And why? Because it was him. Same with Maggie, because Maggie sees what happens and she comes running over there, running to her baby. Probably the last thing on her mind, thinking that it was him who had done yeah. this, she's running horrifying. to her baby. Horrifying. While he's gotten picked up the blackout and opens fire at close range, again with no defensive wounds. And she takes those two shots that you heard Dr. Reber say were parallel, and it crumples her over. In those cases, you can see them move around. It takes that shot that goes through here. And she goes down flat. And then there's the shot in the back of the head. Malice. Is that malice, ladies and gentlemen? Is that malice to do that? Is that intentional harm to another with a bad intent, with an evil intent to do those things? Clearly, I submit to you, clearly it's malicious. Clearly it's malicious. She was running to her baby heard that shot and was running to her baby when she got mowed down. That, I think, is a very powerful the descriptor, the mowed down. That really is, I think, just a perp the She got mowed down. It's a really powerful um, description, I think, that is accurate. The person that we have conclusive proof was at that scene just minutes before and who lied about that very fact until he could no longer do it to you last week. Alec told you he went down there in the golf cart. We'll talk about this a little bit, but they had their expert come up here with the, the two, five, two people and, and all the rest <laughs> of it. <laughs> they trained all their lives for this. Yes. Sitting in a golf cart. But he comes up in the golf cart. But what we don't see, as I said before, is any activity from. Hi, Super Planner Girl. I'm happy you're back. Yay. Are you feeling any fancier? But the crime occurred around 849 to 853. We're fancy to begin Down with. there at the feed room, States Exhibit. 516. It's just a diagram. Remember that Roger Dale Davis did about the kennels and the hose there and how it wasn't put up the way he would put it up? If you're going to wash off real quick, what better place to do it? The water, the pictures of the water in states 199 and 190. It wouldn't take long to strip down and watch yourself off. Get in that cart and head back to the house. <coughs> and then at 9.02, the defendant over there, who wouldn't even admit until forced to that he was even at the scene, all of a sudden, he is as busy as he has ever been. 9.02 to 9.06, 283 steps. 9.03, we see the system start up on the car, and that could mean that he's close by the car. Has he returned with Maggie's phone and placed it in that car? So this is interesting. And then what do we he, see? He brings up this telemetry with the car. That was something that was hard to catch with 
the dude who did the presentation on that, Dwight Falkowski, bless his heart, he worked his tail off for over a year trying to crack that car and it was a disaster. And he goes through the telemetry. And I just remember thinking at the time and even going back through, it's just so disappointing because you're like, oh, you know, that and it, that A, it's hard to follow what he's saying because of that, but B, he's not maybe the most, you know, gifted and as compared to some of the other um, experts or even law enforcement that we have um, describing how some of this sh complicated shit works. That's like way over our heads. And, um, and so I'm glad Creighton is closing the loop on this because, you know, he goes on about the telemetry, you know, the car startups and this and that, but we don't really understand what it means, or at least I didn't at the time, but I love how he ties it together um, here. And he does it also at Al Almeida show reminding us and explaining how what that the significance of that is that if the keys in the pocket it can be mean that you're walking by the car or whatever coming near the car and um and that could could make the car register that uh startup thing from 902 to 906 not only is he 283 steps in that four minute period but he is making calls like crazy and i asked him i said what were you doing what were you doing? And, and even though he has a photographic memory about things that he thinks will convince you, he could not answer what he's doing during this four minute period that is so illustrating of what we're talking about here. That for four minutes, he is not only going 283 steps, 283 steps, and they put in the distance. We heard the distance isn't as accurate, but it's a, it illustrates the point. That's 208 meters. Meter, you know, roughly is a yard, a little bit more, a little bit less. I don't remember. But let's say it's 600 feet. It's a lot. And he couldn't remember what he was doing. I asked him, you've been on a treadmill? Were you doing jumping jacks? Yeah. What were you doing at the same time you're calling all these phones? Why is he calling multiple times? We can see right here. He, he calls Maggie. He calls Randolph. He calls Maggie again. All of that four minute period where he's moving around, but he couldn't remember what he was doing. Just getting ready. Is the prosecutor, the lawyer, manufacturing his alibi? Because he knows he's got to get to Alameda quick. He's got to compress those timelines and that's exactly why he knew to lie about being at the kennels to start with. He's got to compress those timelines so that it would convince whoever down the road that he couldn't have done. He's got to compress him. And that's why he's doing all that right then and there. <clears throat> System startup, 905.56 in the Suburban. And then, this is interesting, Maggie's phone has that orientation change to portrait two seconds before Alex's second call goes in to her phone. If it's some random vigilante, some random vigilante who knew to hide out there and counted on family guns being there, did he have ESP? They also have ESP, and they trained their whole lives for this. Only explanation. Did he have ESP to move that? Or was that Alec turning the phone as he got to the Suburban, checking as he manufactured his alibi that it was coming through? And we saw how quickly out of the gate when law enforcement arrived and then his yeah, the gray boys. How he's immediately referring to his phone. Yes. Yes, yes. And besides that, you've heard about Alec. You heard from witnesses. He went down to the kennels, but he didn't take his phone. Is that also the lawyer and the prosecutor making sure his phone was not with him when he went down there? You heard testimony, it would be unusual for him not to take that phone down to the kennels. And then he gets underway. Get this call right here too. All those calls, all those steps when his phone finally goes active, just minutes after he was at the scene with the victims and he lied about it and he's so busy, but let's, let's take him at his word again. Why in the world if he's calling her so much, if he's so busy and so concerned to call her as many times as that in a four minute period, why
Why would he not just drive by the kennels? Why would he not just drive down there to say, hey, hey, Max, I'm going to Alameda. What you guys doing? Hey, Paul, you want to go? Why is he so busy and making so many calls but doesn't drive the less than a minute down there to see what they're up to? Why would he not do that? And you've heard testimony from Marion. You even heard it from the defendant's own mouth about whether or not Maggie was going to go with him now. Well, I'm not sure. I'm and Alec had actually asked her to come home hey. that night. I'm still not sure what you're referring to with Maggie's phone um, um, from earlier. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to because we were talking about uh, Paul's orientation changes. I don't know if you can elaborate if you have a question or something like that because I'm not quite sure. Right. Come on. Which he denies and said in a statement that he found out later that that was the case. But you saw the text from Blanca, and you heard from Marion that Alec wanted Maggie to come home that night to make sure of it. Malice? With all of that, why would he not just turn and drive down there? He was just there in a the golf cart. Why would he not drive down there? Why is he so anxious to have missed calls with her, and he was just there and not drive down there? about the same general time period that he lied to until he tried to tell you what he told you from the stand last week. Right here, he suburban connects to the uh, Alex's iPhone. He calls Maggie at 906.52, and he's getting in the Suburban right at that time. Maggie's back life goes off from 907 to 931, and you've heard the testimony from the various experts about the back life. And then he leaves Moselle Road at 907.06. All of this is fitting together. He's on the move. 908.36, he's right here doing 42 miles an hour, and there's Maggie's phone location, and then 908.42, he's just past it. And at 908.58, just 20 seconds after he's almost at that location, he texts Maggie's phone and says, going to check on him, be right back. That text was unread. Now, there's been a lot of discussion from all the experts about the backlight issue. Yes, there has. Every single one of them said that there's a lot of variables about that light coming on. Every single one of them said it's not going to record an orientation change unless that light is on. And you heard from each one of the experts about those variables and about the fact that there's no guarantee that it's going to come on or not come on. And you heard from Paul McManigal about that issue. And they cross-examined him about that and all the rest of it, but it's just a common sense determination about how iPhones work. About how they work. That raised awake feature is set for actual somebody lifting it up in the normal course. It is not yeah, I set I don't, I don't know. to respond necessarily. I don't think it's the smartest thing for them to remind the jury about Paul McManigal. And not that it's his fault. Like, that wasn't his, you know, it was that it was just so silly, the tossing the phone in the office. I mean, they asked him to do it, you know. Um, I, would, I would try to pretend like that never happened. <laughs> to violent motion, like flipping it. And every single expert testified to that. Every single one of them did. And then, besides that, you'd have to accept the fact that Alec is driving by 
just moments prior to that time. All of, this, all of these circumstances would have to go the other way of the reasonable inferences in this case. Paul McManigal got up there and testified uh, as to these issues no. and as to the fact that there's no guarantee, in fact, more likely than not, yeah, that they, that I don't know. Egg come on now. Frisbee or whatever. Yeah. It's not going to light up. And that's consistent with what every other expert said. 907 to 922. The defendant's on the way to Alameda. And you heard testimony from Mr. Rudolfsky about this, from Agent Rudolfsky. He's hitting 74 miles an hour at night on that particular route. What's he in a hurry about? That's faster than he drove to work. Why is he in a hurry? Because he knows he has to compress that timeline. And then along the way, he's manufacturing the alibi by making these short calls. 60 seconds. He calls Chris Wilson. He calls John Marvin. Chris Wilson calls him back. He's on the phone the entire way. Does he say to any of them, hey, I can't get Maggie on the phone? Say anything like that? They're very short. He doesn't talk about much. And then we get down here at 920, there's a 131 second call, which means that call is over at 922.45. And that's also when we see the vehicle go into park. That's when we have the arrival at Almeida as well. And you heard from defense witnesses that, well, people would park around back right there. Okay. It's also, though, near these structures. There's that line right there. But what do we see? From 922 to 932, we've got 195 steps taken. We have him calling Libby Murdoch, which would be calling the house two minutes later. And then from this there, the we part? have at 931 and 932. This is the part I was talking about that was kind of unclear. Um, Prior to now, I'm really glad he's circling back to this. Like, first of all, he's talking about the time period that elapsed between calling Libby to be let in and then coming inside. That was really hard to um, pick up from Miss Shelley's testimony. I didn't understand that there was like a significant gap there. Um, and then also, he's going to talk more about that those system startups. So this is all he's tying this together, which is great. Cause again, this was not, this was kind of lost from the testimony. Black Widow says she has terrible hiccups. I'm sorry. I wish, you know, I, I, I wish they had a solution, right? It's like, you hear of all these things to make hiccups go away. And I don't know, you guys let me know if you've tried anything that works. I, I have not found anything that works for me. I haven't had hiccups in a while, but as far as I know, there's no actual cure. There's touted cures, but um, whoever comes up with a cure for hiccups is going to become like a, you know, I don't know. Rich and famous, or something. A millionaire, a millionaire. Um, but yeah, but this is a good testimony, or not good testimony. But this is good, a uh, good job on Creighton's part for tying this testimony uh, together here. We have system startups on the suburban, which you've heard from the experts could be from having that remote key in your pocket, right? And walking near the car. Nine twenty-two to nine thirty-two is the steps. In 931, you've got two system startups. And what did you hear from Shelley? That he called, but it still took a number of minutes before he came in. Well, that's about six minutes right there. Meanwhile. I didn't catch that from her testimony. What's he so busy right there? And I'll meet him. Meanwhile, Rogan is trying to call his friend to no avail. Tries to message Maggie. Tell Paul to call me. Neither one of them can respond. Still a busy guy at Alameda. 935 to 945, we've got 60 steps. We've also got another, at 936, around the beginning of that time period, another hit on the system startup. 936 to 941. Down here. About a five minute period, and we've got another hit. And then at 9.43.05, the Suburban moves out of park. He's not there very long. And he's moving around a lot, and he's sitting off that car. 
while he's at Alameda. He told law enforcement multiple stories about his trip there. You heard M Ms. Shelley Smith talk about that. You heard her talk about him trying to tell her how long he had been there. He says he was just trying to take, tell her the truth, but that's not how she felt. And Blanca didn't feel the same way when he tried to talk to her about what he was wearing that night. Both of these being people that's worked for that family for a long time. But he's a busy guy during all of this. Busy bee. Leaving Alameda, we have the pause. Here we go. 944. Pause. All right. And no seconds to 944 and 54 seconds. So, um, super, oh, but people are suggesting, okay. So Abby is suggesting um, hold your breath and swallow twice, um, 22 seconds. Black Widow, is that working? Are you trying these things? Super so Planner Girl says spoonful of peanut butter. Huh, interesting. I have not heard that one before. You need a fright. I know that's what they all say. Um, you know, the, the peanut butter, what I like about this idea is like worst case scenario, you still get to eat peanut butter. You know what I mean? Like can't be all that bad. But here... Um, He's about to mention this pause, and then it's gonna. I'm gonna show you guys something here in a sec with this. And that's during the time period that Alec calls that phone of Maggie's again. All right, pause. So he said during the time period. Okay, keep that in mind. He's trying to say Creighton's kind of trying to not say Creighton's kind of suggesting right that during that pause, Alex was calling Maggie. All right, well, here was from the timeline from Rudofsky. 943.18 is when he's leaving Almeida, like he's putting his car into drive or whatever. 943.52, uh, she through 944, her backlight is on. And then pause. So then 944.04 to 945.04. So for one minute, her black backlight is off. That's when he's actually stopped on the railroad tracks. So her backlight is off and that's when he is stopped. 9.45.32, that's when he starts drive. That, that, that's when he, she, he calls her. Um, and that is when he starts driving right as he approaches the highway. And that's exactly what Rudofsky testified to. Um, and then, of course, you have Alex calling Paul and then he messages Maggie. But the significant thing is, I, but having said that, I'm... I, I understand what Creighton's saying. He's trying to be, this is closing arguments, but he's arguing to the jury that he said it's around the same time period, right? It is, it is. Um, I, I understand why he would want to argue that that's why he was stopped because um, that would make sense, right? In terms of trying to find a reason. Um, and we've talked about that reason before um, and our own ideas there. But what I do know is that he was actually doing nothing during that time. And that I think is even more significant. Like that's why it's more significant to me. Like, I guess, is that going to help a prosecution? No, not really. But in terms of the history of the family and the whole thing with the railroads, it's more significant to me that he's not doing anything when he's been calling everybody left and right, texting, doing this, you know, he's stopped and he's not doing anything because there's nothing on his phone, even though his phone is not off or whatever. And there's nothing happening and the telemetry shows his car stopped there and the gps and whatnot so anyway just to be thorough pointing that out this is the time period where he remembered because i asked him on cross and he remembered very specifically about his phone falling down on the console and that whole story is that true ladies and gentlemen or is he coming up with some details on the fly when he can't remember more important things, like what was the last conversation you had with your wife and child when you jetted down to the kennels and back? Oh yeah, I'm so, so glad you said jetted again. again. What were you doing from 902 to 906? Those are questions he doesn't want to answer. But would a reasonable person remember those things would they not replay in their mind every day this, the last conversations this. that they had? This is so compelling, right? This is going to resonate with everyone in that jury because we all know this from, from our own experience and from other experiences and from hearing from people who are actually have family members killed or whatever, and they didn't have anything to do this. And I pointed this out before too, the irony that everyone else, you know, 
seems to feel like you look at John Marvin, you look at Mark Ball, they feel some type of guilt. They feel like they, owe, you know, we heard John Marvin say he felt like he owed Paul, right? Everybody else feels some sort of guilt that they, there's something more they could have done. They still owe Paul and Maggie something except Alex. And that it's, it's, it's the reverse, right? And it's like what we see with cases where we know people are innocent is that they unfairly to themselves, they blame themselves, right? Like he's saying right here, playing over the conversation over and over again in your head. It's the type of reason why people go to grief counseling, right? And, and what, what have you, because of this, when they don't have responsibility. And so again, I just find it really ironic that of course, Alex, who sh of all people should be the one, even the most, who's like saying that instead is like making up lies and saying he didn't do anything. Um, and um, Super Planner Girl says, uh, I remember the last two conversations I had with my mother-in-law. Um, yeah. Um, I definitely remember the convert last conversations I had with my dad before he passed away. Um, Black Widow, let us know if your hiccups are going away or if any of these strategies are helping you. Why would you remember that console story? Because he lies convincingly and easily, and he can do it at the drop of the hat. And you've heard testimony about that. He's been doing it to all the people who trust him for years. And he did it to y'all. He's manufacturing an alibi. He's smart. He's a good lawyer. His family has a history of prosecution. He understands these issues. That's why this case is a case that had to be figured out this particular way because he knows what to do to try yeah. to prevent evidence from being yes. gathered. And, if and that's what I was saying before. Again, this just he's creating spot on, right? Again, anything to make it look different than what it is is going to is going to can throw them in the wrong direction right that's 100 well, listen to his statements again and listen to the questions he asks he's asking questions like that he's trying to figure out what do the police have what do they know what is the um, prosecutor what is trying to manufacture his alibi and we see this again he calls paul he sends a text call me babe of course none of that's read or responded to and then in 9 52 15 he calls Chris Wilson. Call me if you up. Call me if you up. And Chris calls back, and they chat for about two minutes, including the connection time. Two minutes. And what does Chris Wilson say? Well, he says it was a normal conversation. Well, of course it is with this guy. He's convincing. But what does Chris say? The only thing that they talked about was Chris banging up some case. And then Alec was like, hey, I got to go. And then I'll meet her. Did Alex say, hey, I'm trying to get home. I can't get Maggie on the phone. I've called her like six times. Paul won't answer either. Did Alex say, yeah. he said, call me if you up. Did he say, did Chris say that Alex said, I got to ask you a question or let's talk about this? No, Chris brought up some case and it was Monday. Yeah. It was Monday. It's manufacturing an alibi. He's calling anybody who will answer the phone for these short conversations. And it's the first one of the first things out of his mouth in the first interview. Look at my phone. I called this person. I called this person. I called this person. I called this person. Now, I want to say, well, actually, hold on. Let me, I'm going to hold that thought. He's manufacturing this alibi. Also, throughout all of this, all of this relevant time period, you see from the Dillon Hightower extraction, you'll see that over and over again, all these call logs that are deleted yes. from the extraction. They're deleted, which occurred on June 10th. What's up with that? All right. So here, you know, you all know I love Creighton. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say something here, not trying to be super critical, but this is one of the few things I could say that is, is, you know, I don't know. Um, they all say, you know, you're not supposed to like ask questions you don't have the answer to. That's a question from questioning a witness. But here, it's like he shouldn't be asking. The, like that's actually something a defense would do, right? Like what's up with that? Like, so, like providing a question and saying we don't have the answer, right? And that's a gap in the in the prosecution's theory, for example. So for him to say what's up with that and then to not answer it, um he's supposed to be answering the questions and asking them. But second of all, besides that, 
um, there's this whole thing that is a well-known problem that we have heard a lot of talk about and a lot of discussion, which is this. It's that there's a problem with the fact, the idea that he's trying to create an alibi, right, with all these phone calls, but also he's deleting his calls. So what I wanted to address this. <laughs> Blackwater said she went in the wood to frighten herself. Did it work? <laughs> um, I wanted to address this because I think it's interesting. So, you know, I think that, okay. Is it possible, okay, is it possible that he was making all these phone calls because he wanted to make sure his phone would be using cell towers? I mean, I think that's possible, right? Especially when you don't have, like we heard the testimony because of the fact that there's not that many towers. I think in that area, there's just the two or whatever. It's entirely, you know, the service is really iffy. It's entirely possible. Like that would make sense to me that like, you might not really know if a call is going to go through. Maybe he wanted to make sure his phone was going to show data that he was driving because he didn't know about the car and what the car would have. Um, possibly, you know. Uh, I I agree that it doesn't make sense. Okay, I, I agree. I agree with the problem that it doesn't make sense that if you're trying to establish an alibi by making all these phone calls, you would then delete them. So the only answer there is that either he didn't delete them, but Britt Dove in his testimony concluded that that was like really 99% basically the most possible thing. Like that was what happened that, that they were deleted and it, they weren't overwritten um, because he said there wasn't enough other cell activity to have caused it to overwrite in that period of time. Um, so if that's true and he did, and he did delete them um, on purpose, um, that clearly he wasn't, trying to use them to establish an alibi. Now, I don't know what benefit it would have for him to delete them, honestly, because he already had told people about the calls. Like, for example, like just to use it as an example, because I um, I actually went back and looked at all this, of course, just to see, you know, the thing about the Maggie calls, right? There's five missed calls to Maggie that show up on her phone that don't show up on any of his shit. And those are, would be some of those calls that seem to be deleted. And I, and I started thinking about that and I was like, oh, maybe, okay. So I had, I was putting together this idea of like, okay, well, maybe he, maybe it dawned on him. Maybe he called Maggie and then he had thought to himself, wait a minute. And exactly what Creighton is saying, it's going to look like if I called her all these times, people might ask, why didn't I just go over there? And this, and then maybe he deleted him, right? So I was going through that and I was thinking, oh, maybe that, maybe he figured that out and that would make sense. That would actually explain it. But he tells right off the bat in his first interview, he tells them that he called her. And he shows them that he shows them them his phone. I don't think they saw the calls at that time. I think they were gone already. But he does say that he called her. And then he does show them a text message or something. But he's consistent with telling uh, every interview and saying that he called her several times. And he also says he called Paul. Um, so to say that and then delete the calls wouldn't make there would be no purpose for that. So I don't really know. Um well, yes, he did. He did kill her. Um, I'm just I'm just trying to I'm just trying to work through the idea of like he's trying to call her to create an alibi, but also he deleted the calls. So like. Why would you delete the calls if you're making an alibi? Um, but here's what I think. I think whether I think I don't know, it doesn't really make sense that he did delete them. You know, like there's no reason for that. But what I do think is this: I think that in terms of where, where where does the alibi thing, where does it make sense to me in terms of the calls, right? I mean, because going to Almeida, that, yes, that's 100% trying to establish an alibi. That's, I'm here, right? I'm somewhere else. But in terms of the calls there and back and the way Creighton's saying he's trying to establish an alibi, here's what I think about that. I think the purpose of the alibi is something that isn't maybe, uh, I think they didn't point out, which is this. The alibi isn't that I'm making phone calls. The alibi is exactly what happened, which is he same reason why he called everybody to come to the crime scene, right? He wanted to make all these phone calls to have all these people come in and testify that he sounded normal. I think that was the point of the alibi. And that's exactly what happened. And Creighton even says that. He says, yeah, he called Chris Wilson and Chris Wilson said everything was normal, blah, blah. I think that was the reason. I think that he figured the more people he can call and that they up, he was normal. Just like when he called them all over the crime scene, of course, there were multiple reasons for that, that we can think of. But I think one of them was because he knew that when they would all testify, they would say he seemed distraught. You know, um, he was upset. He was crying, all that. Um,
I don't know what you mean, Blackwood or the Dead Olympics answering phones. I'm not quite sure. But um, but yeah. So anyway, the, in other words, it's hard to argue if you're, you know, as the prosecution, they're trying to argue that he was trying to, we know he was trying to establish an alibi by going to Alameda, but they're trying to say he was making these phone calls to establish an alibi, but then they're also arguing that he deleted the phone calls. So it just, if does am I making sense? Um, well, yeah, I mean, of course. And then everybody says that too, right? I mean, in the end, um, that he was a huge liar. So, um, but that, I'm just saying that was, I think that was his intention. I think that was his intention with making the calls. Um, again, it, it could also possibly have been because he wanted to make sure his phone was going to be pinging off those towers to show that he was not at the property. Um, but like, in other words, like when the, they're suggesting that he's making the phone calls to establish an alibi, how does that work? Right. Because it's like it, the only thing it could be is it was showing your, your, where you're calling from slash how you seem on the phone that I can think of. Right. That's exactly right. That's what I'm saying. Like he could like he could seem normal, like he didn't just murder his family. Exactly. That's exactly right, because that's what literally everybody said. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. hundred percent. Um. I, so yeah, that's, that's, that's where I think it's a, it's quote unquote establishing an al alibi, which isn't, it, it's not by definition an alibi, but it is, I, that would be the idea, you know, pseudo alibi, if you will, something. <laughs> On the way back, these are defense exhibits 141 and 142. Rolling pretty heavy at 75 to get there. And I'm sure the defense will point out that that 80 miles an hour was a peak. Still running pretty good there. What's he in a hurry about in the dark? Doing 80 miles an hour. At 9.51.42, rolling 80 when he texts Chris, call me. Right, so up. see how it says manufacturing His peak speed when he's texting me. 1001, he arrives at Alameda, and this is going to be important. Rogan, of course. Is trying to call Paul and he texts well, me Paul Young, the real alibi, right? which is unread, but hits Paul's phone. And then he gets to, says Almeida, sorry about that, that's obviously back at Moselle. He gets there, he's shifting in and out of park from 2200, which is uh, 10 o'clock, to 10.01.43. He's calling Maggie. At 10.03.58, and then at 10.05.06, he leaves for the kennels. At 10.05.57, he arrives at the kennels about a minute later. Make it a minute in a suburban. How long is it going to take in a golf cart? And he drove really 10 fast. 57, you guys remember, he went like 35 miles an hour or something on the property there. And 10.06.14 is the 911 call. Now, there's a lot of back and forth with him about that, but in his statements with what he told his law partners, they went in great detail over about his activities that night, including lying to them about ever going to the kennels. He was very clear that he got out of the car and went and checked Paul and Maggie. One time he said to see if they're breathing, another time yeah, to see if they're Yeah, that's a good question. Was I thought, You've seen the horrific injuries. You read my mind. I was literally just thinking that. I was like, what was he doing? Because I hadn't caught that before either. So this telemetry stuff, like I said, it kind of went over my head hearing it from Dwight Bukowski at the time. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's, the, that's supposed to be, you know, that's supposedly the time when he went inside the house to check and see if they were there. I mean, maybe that's, okay, maybe, I, maybe that answers the question. So, Okay, so there we know, okay, he supposedly went in the house, right, at that time. But again, I'm thinking back to it. I'm like, did the phone show him going inside? I don't know that it did. And I don't know that it would have necessarily, right? Like, it might not have been a far enough distance. Like, if he's right parked outside the door, for example, right? Like, I don't know that that would have. And also, he could have left the phone in the car. Um I will have to pull it up on the full timeline and look through and see if there is any phone data for that that shows him getting out of the car and going in the house or anything. But what I'm wondering is if that could have been him sitting in the car and trying to wait some sort of period of time 
and then make it seem like he parked the car and got out of it maybe. And he, when he really didn't because he had no reason to go in the house and look for them. I don't know. Um, I just thought of something else I wanted to make sure I meant, I wanted to mention, but I don't think I, I don't think that's come up in the closing yet. So I'm just trying to think, I don't think he got to that part yet. So um, I'll wait and see. 10 o'clock to 10 one in 43 seconds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a note to pull that up and look. Um, well, I can try doing that while this is going. Let me see. I don't, I just don't want it to fuck it up, but we'll see. Let me, let me see if I can pull it up without it too much Definitely. of an issue. Hold on. 19 seconds. Is that enough time for a surprised <laughs> human being to yeah. come across that scene? Process what they okay, were seeing. Okay. <laughs> Get out of the car. Go over there. Check both those bodies and then call 911. He's changed the story now yet again. Girl. It is a lot of time. Confronted with this evidence. The reason why it's so quick, the reason why it's so quick is because. He knew exactly. Don't die, computer. Okay, I'm pausing the video. So, oh, right, and I had pulled this up. Okay, let me rewind. I'm going to rewind the video a smidgen as I, so it'll, we can hear that part again because I have, I, have the, I have the timeline pulled up. Okay, so, okay, so let me, let me, I know you're not going to be able to see it, but I'm going to pull it up. Um, so, right. I'm looking at where it says the vehicle park equals true and it's different colors and it makes no sense. Right. And that's part of the reason why it's like, yeah, I don't understand what this means. So no wonder we didn't get it until he pointed it out. So at 10 o'clock and 30 seconds, he turns on 4147 Moselle Road, it says on the full timeline. And then. So Creighton might have been like just rounding when he said 10 o'clock, because I know that in this PowerPoint presentation, he doesn't include some of the like the little seconds, like it just kind of rounds to the closest minute or whatever. I've noticed that earlier because I have a lot of these times memorized down to like the all the different digits. Um, OK, so 10.01. OK, there it is. 10.01.46. I see here. OK, I see. I see. I see. Yes. 10.01.46. I'm going to read. Why is it? OK, interesting. I'm going to read it. Um, it's showing shit on Maggie's phone. Okay, so 10.01.46, I see, I see what that is. Okay, 10.01.46, it shows his device connection to iPhone. So hold on. So then, does it say where it disconnected? Yeah, I don't understand this at all because it has all this vehicle shit that is doesn't make any sense looking at it, right? Unless, you know... Uh, and then at 10 o'clock on 10 o'clock 30 turns on to 4147 Moselle Road. So I have a question on this because why the heck do we have another mystery still to solve? I thought we'd solved all the mysteries. Well, most of them. Um, but this then at 10 46, his device shows connection to iPhone. So where did it deconnect or disconnect rather? Um, huh. That's interesting. And then we have him calling Maggie at 10.03.58. Let me see what you're saying here in the chat. But I don't know. Um, Stops to check for Amazon packages. Yeah, right? Um, it's weird. I don't, I don't know. Um, this, this file i don't know if i've put this i could put the actually it's probably too large for me to share it in the discord i was just gonna say i could have yeah i don't think i'll be able to i would i think it would be too large actually for the documents to have in the discord but um you should be able to find if, if anyone is interested in want in the chat and wants to be able to read this since i'm you know i can't show you guys like i'd have to plug in some stuff and do all that and it'd be hard to do on stream to get it set up to where i could screen share it but if you want if i for for at any point in time you, you should be able to like find this 
it's on, it's, it's available for free on the internet, of course, um, the full timeline here, but yeah, it, it is weird. Um, let me look at this data for the latitude and longitude. Um, it's showing him thriving. Yeah, I don't know. That is just weird. The 10146 shows device connection not to iPhone. I mean, that would make it seem like he did get out of the car, but I just don't know why it doesn't show that his phone disconnected. Because it that doesn't make sense. So maybe he did actually go inside. Does Creighton say how many times it shifts in and out of park? Here, I'm gonna rewind it a second again and listen to that again. Because if it's like it shifts in and out of park once, that would make sense if he parks the car, gets out, goes inside, comes back, right? But if it's like multiple times, let me rewind it just a smidge on it and see. With what he told his law partners, they went in great detail over about his activities that night, including lying to them about ever going to the kennels. He was very clear that he got out of the car and went and checked Paul and Maggie one time he said to see if they're breathing, another time to say to check a pulse. You've seen the horrific injuries they've suffered. 19 seconds. I didn't go back far enough. Is that enough time for a surprised human being to come across that scene, process what they are seeing? Get out of the car. Go over there. Gotcha. Roger that. Leave it from the extraction. Roger that. They're deleted, which occurred on June 10th. What's up with that? On the way back, these are defense exhibits 141 and 142. Rolling pretty heavy at 75 to get there. And I'm sure the defense will point out that that 80 miles an hour was a peak. Still running pretty good there. What's he in a hurry about in the dark? Doing 80 miles an hour at 9:51:42. Rolling 80 when he texts Chris, "Call me if you're up." His peak speed when he's texting me. 201. Dangerous. He arrives at Alameda, and this okay. is going to be important. Rogan, of course. So, okay, let me hold on. I'm pausing it. I'm going to pull my ticker down. He means to say Moselle first of all. There. Remember when I was saying I was reading all the vehicle shit? And I'm like, I don't understand that. That's he. That's what I was looking at exactly right there. The green and blue shit. That's what's in the timeline. So you see why it's confusing because it says has green and has blue, and then if there's no, I mean, what the fuck, dude? Like, there's. It's not like blue is true and green is false or vice versa. It just I you, I can't make heads or tails of, of that. So okay, and then of course this is military time, so I can't make heads or tails of that either. But this would, if we could figure this chart out, that would tell us what the in and out of park thing means, like how many times it's in this chart. I just can't read. I don't, I can't make heads or tails of this fucking chart. I don't understand military time. I don't know what time that is. And I can't tell. I don't, I don't know how to read that. But like, because in and out of park. sounds like it could be once but it's like the way he's saying it right i understand what you're saying so you're playing, like the way he's saying it, it's implying it's as if to suggest it's multiple times right but the question is this is that the important thing to think about it is it's not about the answer sometimes it's the um question so like for example maybe they don't have maybe, like the answer like he doesn't give the jury the answer he doesn't say the answer of how many times we don't know how many times this is this is stupid and pointless this chart um but may, but maybe we can infer something from the fact that he's asking that question. So for for what I mean by that is, would there be some reason why Creighton would rather suggest that he put his car in and out of park a bunch of times? Is that to say he did that instead of going inside the house? Is there some like it, there's got to be some theory behind that, right? That they that they think that that's important. If that makes sense. So twenty two hundred is ten p.m. Okay. So then 22, okay, I see. So, but see, the problem is I can't tell if each one of those means it goes in and out or if it means some of them means it's still registering the same. I just, is green in part, like I can't, I just have no clue. Yeah, then he maybe never left the car. So maybe that's the what he's trying to suggest possible. I mean, if in fact 
all that shit means in and out of park in that period of time, then clearly he didn't leave the car, right? There's no way he left the car. There's no way he went inside. And maybe he disconnected his iPhone and then plugged it back in or whatever so that it would make it look like he got in the car, you know? I Again, I don't know why it's missing that his iPhone disconnected from, because it wasn't, that was not on the timeline. I have no idea. I wish I knew how all this shit worked. Because it is interesting, right? Like, I don't think that's even something that he could have manipulated because that would have been from the car fucking OnStar data. He couldn't have had any control over making that delete or go away, right? If he disconnected the phone and then tried to delete that or what? Like, I don't think he could have, he could have had no control. Over, like, even if he deleted, there would be nothing to even delete from the phone. That's just getting out in and out of the car. It's like connecting to Bluetooth. Yeah, he couldn't have had any way to manipulate that anyway. So, um, yeah, I know the twisted brain. Exactly. <sighs> All right. Well, we'll keep thinking about this. We'll keep this in our back pocket. <laughs> is trying to call Paul and he texts Paul, yo, which is unread, but hits Paul's phone. And then he gets to, says Almeida. Sorry about that. That's obviously back at Moselle. He gets there. He's shifting in and out of park from 2200, yeah. which is uh, 10 o'clock. Okay. 10.01.43, he's calling Maggie at 10.03.58, and then at 10.05.06, couldn't you be more specific? At 10.05.57, he arrives at the kennels about a minute later. Make it a minute in a Suburban. How long is it going to take in a golf cart? I guess I could go back and try to find that part. 10 to 5, 57. He arrives at the kennels. That doesn't really explain much, I feel like. And 10 He's just kind of giving you the record. Now, there's a lot of back and forth with him about that. But in his statements, with what he told his law partners, they went in great detail over about his activities that night, including lying to them about ever going to the kennels. He was very clear that he got out of the car and went and checked Paul and Maggie. One time he said to see if they're breathing, another time to say just check a pulse. You've seen the horrific injuries they suffered. 19 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Super Planner Girl. Is that enough time okay. for a surprised human being to come across that can scene? He, okay. Can he also tell us, should I pull the chart back up? Okay. Could he also, can he also tell us what the green and the blue then means? Okay, let me, let me go back. Let's get your super smart hubby over here to help, help us. Help us, hubby. Okay, where is that? So that, that one is showing. Okay, we, I don't, I think we need to go back further. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand. Okay, help, help us. <laughs> uh, Yeah, if you can make heads or tails of this chart, then you win <laughs> for sure. I still have Aladdin stuck in my head from earlier. But now I'm thinking of the, the opening song. Uh, the other, the, not the song from that we were singing, but the other one from the opening. But I don't remember the lyrics, but I have the melody stuck in my head. Anyway, we're waiting to hear from Super Planner Girl, Super Smart Hubby, to see if he can enlighten us as to this chart. Because, uh, like, the colors, right? It's like, normally the colors should match. And I remember they try to kind of touch on this when Dwight, fuck off he's testifying but i just remember being like because part of it we couldn't see what they were even pointing at that made it just added to the difficulty so they're talking about it and we couldn't see what the jury was seeing they're probably looking at this shit and it was like what is happening um it just went like i think over my head and probably most people's but um i suppose I, if i went to if i were to go back to the testimony and have the timeline pulled up and be looking at this then it maybe i don't know Maybe make more sense of it, but I just don't, it just doesn't like logically that does not look like the way things should look. Right. Cause what's the colors? What are the colors for? <laughs> it 
so I'm not I'm not sure if we if we were if hubby is looking at the chart and okay he says the highlighting appears to me nothing okay interesting I mean yeah, right well I, I mean yeah I agree <laughs> I agree that it appears to me nothing because it doesn't make any sense but like it seems like it should mean something though right like I <laughs> but I don't know anything so It looks like it's supposed to establish a pattern, yet there's no pattern with the colors. Okay, well, we'll continue onward then. Let me go forward just a smidgen. A minute in a Suburban. How long is it going to take in a golf cart? 10.05.57, he arrives at the kennels. And 10.06.14 is the 911 call. Now, there's a lot of back and forth with him about that. But in his statements, with what he told his law partners, they went in great detail over about his activities that night, including lying to them about ever going to the kennels. He was very clear that he got out of the car and went and checked Paul and Maggie. One time he said to see if they're breathing, another time to say to check a pulse. You've seen the horrific injuries they suffered. 19 seconds. Is that enough time for a surprised human being to come across that scene, process what they are seeing? Get out of the car. Go over there. Check both those bodies and then call 911. He's changed the story now yet again because he's con confronted with this evidence. The reason why it's so quick, the reason why it's so quick is because he knew exactly what scene he was going to find. 19 seconds. Okay, so this part I can do the math on and make sense of. Now, I don't know why he's saying 19 seconds, because here's the time, 10.05.57 uh, to, I have that highlighted there at the top, and then 10.06.14 is actually 17 seconds. So I don't know if that was just a mistake for math, because we all know there's a running joke about law lawyers and attorneys and they're being terrible at math. Or if he's actually doing the math from the second 911 call because he misdials it initially. <laughs> but either way, I don't know why he would go from the second 911 call. You would go from the first one. So I don't know. But according to the timeline, look, there it is. 10.05.57 and then 10.06.14. The math on that is uh, 17 seconds. So actually... I mean, I know that seems like it's splitting hairs, but I mean, really, when you're looking in a matter of a time frame of 20 seconds total, say, there's actually a big difference from like 17 and 19, right? Like, that makes sense. Every second counts, you know? During that 911 call, and you can hear it on the 911 nice call, to it leaves there, the residents from 10 11 to 10 14, and you can Hope see you the, uh, the map points on there. Those are the speeds on the Suburban on those trips. Took just under a minute doing 35 and 30 miles an hour. So think about that when you go back to his story about a casual trip down to the kennels in the golf cart and you look at his times <laughs> he's trying to convince you of. 1017, he gets off the 911 call. He calls Randy. He calls Randy again, he calls John Marvin. And then we see at 10, 20, and eight seconds, Paul's phone re reflect that auto lock thing that could be, as you heard from the testimony, it not recognizing a face. And this is interesting. As we'll see over the next few slides, he spends a whole lot of time trying to call Rogan Gibson. He told you, oh, well, he's, He's a good boy. He lives down the street. He lives close by. He's calling Rogan before he calls many of his family. Before he calls Buster. Calling Rogan multiple times. And those texts would have come in on Paul's phone. What's he so concerned about? He said he turned Paul over and his cell phone popped out. Popped out? Manufacturing an alibi, concerned about the evidence, worried about what Rogan may have known or may have heard. I'm 
I'll put it down. Can I have this slide, please? There, 1024. iMessages, call me, 1025. 1029, 1025, the first deputy's on scene. 1029, calling Randy. 1030, Rogan again. And then finally at 1034 is when Paul's phone powers off. Opportunity. Motive, means, and opportunity. Guilty conscience. I've already kind of talked about these, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but you heard from Blanca Simpson. Blanca Simpson said he was wearing like a polo shirt when he left. He was wearing this shirt. In the Vinnie Vine, she recognized both of those. Vines. He, of course, Vinnie turned Abby. over the T-shirt that he was wearing when, when law enforcement arrived. And then you heard Blanca say he later tried to convince her that he was wearing a Vinnie Vine shirt. Three shirts in one day, and a fourth one he tried to get Blanca to say. And you, and you heard her testimony. She felt very uncomfortable by that. Multiple changes of shoes in the day. He wouldn't be wearing those shoes if he were out riding the property. I've already mentioned the text from Maggie that Alan wants me to come home, but he can't even be clear about that point because that doesn't fit with his narrative. Marion Proctor says the same thing, but he can't admit that because that doesn't fit with his narrative. She was surprised that Maggie didn't go along to Almeida. And then she said, Alec made an interesting comment, one of many, some of which came from that stand that we'll talk about in a little bit. Whoever did this thought about it for a really long time. Why would he say that? Because he told you that it was just random vigilantes from the boat case of which there is no evidence whatsoever that you've seen in this record. Trials depend on evidence. There has to be evidence to make a decision. And his claims trying to manufacture something about the babe case, there's been no evidence whatsoever of any specific other individual. There has to be evidence to consider, not just mere allegations that have no basis in any sort of evidence. Whoever did this thought about it for a really long time. I think if you think about the defendant's statements and some of the things he says. A lot of times he says things in one context, but he means them in another. When he says things like, I hurt the ones I love the most. We talked about Shelley after Randolph's funeral. He shows up early. She might have said Wednesday, but there was other information that Randolph's funeral was on Monday. But anyway, shows up with something blue, shows up early, wants to come in, goes and moves some vehicles, and then there's that raincoat, huge raincoat. She calls it a tarp, but it's a huge raincoat, and it's got a ton of GSR on the inside, and it's found in a closet upstairs. He was a busy guy that Almeida, as we just saw, was moving around, kept hitting off of his Suburban. And then, of course, as you heard, he was with family for the next few days. After the funeral, he's back. And it was weird enough and interesting enough that Shelley said something about it. I'm also saying that in her experience, it was unusual for him to come that way. Then we have the defendant and his many statements. Went through a lot with the defendant who told you that the reason why he was telling this, you, you this new story was because he was 
paranoid because he had a bag of pills in his pocket, because he had a distrust of Sled, because David Owen asked him about his relationship with Maggie, and his law partners told him that he should have an attorney present, which one is in here, one of his law partners sitting in the back. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't, you don't have any problem yeah. with it. I asked him repeatedly, is this the point where you decided to lie? At which point did you decide to lie? Or was it this point when he first says, I was at the house? I was at the house. Or was this the point? He said, he mentioned specifically, and he kept adding factors, and one of the things was, well, Dave Owen asked me how my relationship was. This you know what's question, funny? This is when he decided to... It's like, as much as, of a, much, as much of a disaster as this first interview is, I think it's his strongest interview. Um, between the, like, when you compare this to the second one, and then the, like, they get worse each time, I think, in my opinion, like, like, at, at least in this one, he can kind of come across as just, you know, traumatized, confused, whatever. And like, like even like the nonsensical CB Rose story being like a ninja, not a ninja, you know, Navy SEAL, all that like is so insane, but it's like, it almost seems like he's, you know, he could be like out of his mind. Like, I don't know. It, it, it's just, and any details he doesn't remember at the immediate moment, right? This is right after, like, it, it just, he, he does the best job here. I feel like it, um, but it, it gets, goes downhill. Um, do, do the house as if it's a house. You got it. It's a house. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it just goes downhill from here after this first interview. You know, he has the second interview was June 10th, and then the other one is uh, August 11th. <laughs> I know it makes me happy too. Here we'll we'll do the we'll do all the funs fun ones. Um. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. This is a chicken. It's a house. <laughs> Sure, we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, wonderful relationship. I love how Creighton has it labeled here. I paused it again real quick. How he has it labeled here, the defendant Alex Murdoch, like in case there was any doubt, like who this is, right? In case people didn't know by now. <laughs> Hilarious. But he digs in on the point. <laughs> what did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, I was home. I came home, Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house, uh, laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said... This is June 8th at 1.21 in the morning. And he's admitted to you that he's lying right there. How easily he did it about such a crucial you thing. know i pointed this out before but just thinking about it again too it's like right there like you know how he even says he even admits it himself like alex was like i had because i lied once i had to keep going or i had to lie to support the first lie and what a tangled about we leave we weave and all that it's like well again like think about it right like the example i gave was like um the fact that he couldn't possibly have gone separately to the kennels, right? If when he was first confronted with his lie about being at the kennels, he if, if he had just said, you're right, I lied, and then told the truth, that he, not, well, I mean, obviously he would lie that he killed them, but in terms of like, yeah, I went down there with them, we all went in the truck, or we all went in the golf cart, whichever one it was, you know, then at least he'd be telling the truth about that. But it, but instead, he, his whole thing is like, 
when he's confronted with a lie, instead of confessing to that lie, he makes up another lie. That's his issue, right? And so, like, again, his the way he handles it is he's like, he does this lie of like, well, yeah, I was at the house. I took this little baby nap thing. And then I changed my mind about going to the kennels and this and that. And so it's like, so so now you've just, you just made it, you've just told an additional lie, right? So I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's just, you can see how his reaction, his automatic response when he's confronted with a lie is to lie. And so then it just compounds itself, right? And it just spirals out of control. Um, yeah, anyway, just was thinking about that. And she's very good about answering the phone. So that was odd or calling me back. So that was odd, but it wasn't that big a deal. It was odd, but not that big a deal. But again, he's enough to say it was odd. He's enough to make all those calls while he's doing 283 steps, but he doesn't drive 50 seconds down to the kennels. Well, that's why he says it was odd. And then he changes his mind and says it wasn't that big a deal. Going to the next interview so, again. So What's here, the tone of this here, see if see if you guys agree with me. I mean, you don't have to agree with me. You can disagree totally. But but I'm curious if you guys agree with me. So he because he's going to go through this one snippets of this one and then the next interview. See if you guys th agree that you think it gets significant. It goes downhill with each one. Interview. How is he being treated? Pretty traumatic. That's okay. Um, yeah. I know so, you yeah. need to ask me. You ask me what you need to. So is that a aggressive interview? Is that something to make somebody paranoid? I'm a defendant in a civil case involving my son. I told you about mm -hmm. the boat wreck. Yes, sir. And there were some motions coming up in that on Thursday, and I was mostly just getting ready for those things okay. and then other junk. Mentions the boat case. Oh, and Paul left. And I'm assuming you know, I'm assuming Paul left okay. because of, you know, gotcha. what happened. I mean, I'm assuming Paul yeah, yeah. went to the kennels. Okay. Um, and what did you do once, once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And I was watching TV, looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. Okay. And what time did you... You know, what I don't know exactly what time I woke up, but when y'all get my phone, you know, I think one of the first things I did when I got up was call Maggie mm -hmm. because I was going to my mom's. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I texted her because I checked my phone. And what time did we say the text was, Jim? It's like 9.06. I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I got it written down for you. I showed night. you the other yes, night, didn't yes, I? Yes, sir. I got so, you know, I texted her. So I called her just before that. Mm -hmm. And... Like, to and me, she, this is just even worse than the first one. At that point, um, and I left to go to my mom's. So easy for him to do. And you say you said you it's laid like down. It's like trying too hard, among other things. <laughs> and when you got up, Maggie and Paul was gone, or did they leave when you laid down? Or before uh, I, I, I believe that... I'm not. I'm not sure. But they weren't there when you woke up around the nine o'clock mark or so when when you made the call to Maggie to, to let her know you were going. To no, nobody was in that house when I when I left. That's because you guys all left together. Adding more detail. It's just lies. Watch how he responds to this one. Watch what his head does. See if you observe that yourself. When he's over there looking you in your eyes and trying to convince you of something. Trying to narrow that the, the last time that Paul and you saw Paul and Maggie's when y'all were eating supper. Yes, sir. When the when when Paul's phone came out, did you you just pick it up and put it on, you know, place it back down on him or you know now remember, yeah, I did not try to open it or anything, you know. Remember, with potential scenario C that we went through earlier after the intermission, if we look at that timeline with the, the with Paul's phone activity and we go with the possibility that Paul was actually shot at 849.01 and that's when his phone locked, then 
Remember, that would mean that Paul didn't put the phone in his pocket. Daddy dropped the phone. And then Alex put the phone on Paul's butt from the feed room to try to make it seem like it had been in Paul's pocket and it fell out. So anytime that he's being funny about this phone business with Paul's phone, you know, I know that uh, I think Creighton kind of is going along the lines of suggesting that maybe he's trying to do something with looking at Rogan's messages or whatever. But we let's just keep this in mind that remember that was the whole thing was like it's possible that he that he moved that phone and then he turned the orientation lock off because that's the first and only time that there is an orientation change logged on Paul's phone is at 10:24. I don't know how I had my mind that. I needed to not mess anything up. I had that, I had that, you know. Up to the third interview on August 11th. It's in after dinner. Back in home. Went to the counselor. You know, I don't know exactly how that went. Um, I stayed on the couch and I dozed off. Video on Paul's phone of um, you and him on the phone that night. And you were in khaki pants and a dress shirt. You were playing with a tree. I don't remember playing with a tree. Yeah. I guess there was a tree sapling or something that was had fallen over or bending over and you were trying to get it to stand back, stand up. Um, but I mean, the, the question in that is, when I met you that night, you were in shorts and a t-shirt. At what point in that evening did you change clothes? I'm not sure. I, you know, it would have been... Before dinner or after dinner? No, it would have been... What time of day was that? I would have thought I'd already changed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a time stamp on it because there's so many posts. Um, but I want to say it's, it looks to be about dusk, so that would have been 7, 30, 8 o'clock. I guess I changed when I got back to the house. I had some very specific recollections for y'all when he testified with his new story that had never been heard until last week. Did he and I know that Rogan Gibson told me about uh, the dog's tail? Somebody saying this leg was broken. Well, right there, he was down at the kennels, shaking his head forward. Um, you were just down there with Paul. You left and went back to the house again. You know, I mean, Paul and I were just knocking around up at the shop, the shed, the kennels, and the you know, just the whole property. And and that was before dinner yesterday. And you didn't go back down there after dinner until you were returned to it from visiting your mother? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I've got information that Paul's on the phone heard in the background and you were heard in the background and that was prior to 9 p.m. I, I heard Rogan Gibson ask me if I was up there he said he thought it was me was it you at at nine o'clock yes sir no sir not if my times were right that part is so insane because here's the thing the time shouldn't even matter. I just paused it. Time shouldn't even matter. He said he was like, he was never at the kennel. Like he says he was never at the kennels all day. So you, you, I, you would either, even if you, let's say you didn't kill him. Let's say you don't, you aren't good with time. You would remember whether or not you actually went there or not. Like that answer is, is so bad, dude. That answer is just to me, that was like, 
Oh, oh my God. Maybe that might be one of his actual worst moments in the, in the entire thing. Um, not if my times are right. Cause that just doesn't, I, and not to mention that just reeks of trying to create an alibi, right? Like you did all the math on the time. Like you should know if you were there or not at, because when you're saying you weren't there, you didn't go there at all the entire day. Right. Like even when he's talking about him, Paul riding the property, if you notice he, he, they go everywhere about the kennels, according to Alex, right? We know that the shed is near the kennels and whatnot, right? But they don't, he never says he goes to, he's, he actually, he specifically says he didn't go to the kennels at all that day. That's what he says. Um, so how would you, how would time help you know that answer or not? It's just, a, it's bad. <laughs> you think it could have been? I have no idea. And Rogan's been around your family for pretty much all of his life. Oh, absolutely. And he recognizes your voice and you have a distinct voice. I don't know about that. Do you think anybody else that has a voice over to yours that he may have um, misinterpreted? Mm, no. no, sir. You know, when we were talking, he had asked me that. Yes, sir. We'll come back to that. But I want to talk a little bit about the crime scene. You guys went out to the scene today. And you saw how it looks now. We'll take a good look at those trees and where they were back in the day of the incident. And I'll put this up on the Elmo in a second. And you can see hey, the Elmo. proximity of the kennels to that residence back on June 7th, 2021. <clears throat> All right, Dr. Reamer. You've heard from Dr. Reamer, you heard from Kenny Kinsey, and you heard from the defense experts. So, Paul, first blast to the chest, stippling, arms down, not fatal for a buckshot blast to the chest. This is where there was some dispute from the defense experts. The second injury went into the left shoulder, into the cheek, with an exit wound on the top of the head, with instantly fatal and terminal collapse. Dr. Reamer's done 5,500 autopsies. She does an independent autopsy. She actually physically examined the victim. And she was very clear that it could not have happened from the top without destroying Paul's face. And I can show the image again. I'm reluctant to because I know y'all have seen it enough. So I'll rely on y'all to recall that his face was intact. I'm allowing y'all to recall, and this is sealed, all the evidence up top here, at the top of the door. I will rely on y'all to recall Kenny Kinsey's testimony that buckshot don't reverse course, that the kinetic energy is going in one direction. I rely on y'all to recall all the biological matter that you see at the top of this door. I rely on y'all to recall beginning at States 339, which is the wadding from the shot to kill Paul. Because if you recall, the wadding from the chest shot was found still in his chest right here. This is the wadding on the ground from the shot. To his head. And if one of the things that you recall from Dr. Reamer's testimony and looking at Paul's face was the abrasions around that cheek wound that came from the wadding as it entered there. You heard from Dr. Reamer that the reason for the shape on the shoulder was because it went along the shoulder and opened up that area there, but still was focused and then expanding as it entered in here. 
But she also testified that if it was here, that force would not have left his face intact. Manner of death homicide. Then you heard from Dr. Kenny Kinsey. What we described earlier, Paul was first shot in the feed room, largely agrees with her, arms were not up. He believes the shot was a little closer and the lack of stippling could be talk, chalked up to the black t-shirt, but also agrees that she does no defensive wounds. Looking at the blood spatter locations there, and he testified in great detail and testified yesterday, there was no high velocity blood spatter on the ground at the entrance to the feed room, which would be necessary for the shot to have occurred in the manner in which the defense suggested. The spatter travels upward in an upward directory, uh, upward direction, and you can see that on the door. He spoke of the blood, the void area, and then he spoke of the blood on the ground that was around where Paul drops, and that it's low speed spatter. He talked about the dents in the feed room door, the pellet lodged in the door frame upper. It's only possible if it's traveling through Paul's head. Not possible if it's from a ricochet, as the defense suggested. What else did he say? Dr. Kinsey said that he, I think, three dozen times that he's observed contact wounds to the head with a shotgun, including one that happened in front of him, actually observed it. And he also said that any sort of contact wound like that would have destroyed the head and destroyed the face. And he was clear about that. He's actually seen them. And I think what you see with the defense experts is they're coming to you with absolutes to try to make you consider that there's the possibility that a crime scene can definitively establish whether there's one or two shooters or whether or not they're of a certain height. And that's just not how it works. And you heard that from Dr. Kinsey. That's not how it works. Not how it worked in this scene. It's a red herring, ladies and gentlemen. It's a red herring. You've seen the testimony from Kenny Kinsey. He returned to talk about these issues. You saw the demonstration over there in the doorway. Does that seem realistic to you? Or is Kenny Kinsey's explanation consistent with the evidence, consistent with his experience, consistent with Dr. Reamer's 5,500 autopsies who actually observed the victims, consistent with the blood spatter, the lack of high velocity on the floor, but the existence of high velocity on the top and the low velocity blood splatter on the floor? What's consistent with the evidence? Again, no defensive wounds. The first two shots to her abdomen and her leg on a parallel path and likely in close succession. Stippling, close range, the mark on the back of her leg. Running to her baby, didn't see it coming. Bends over, maybe on her hands and knees in pain. You saw me demonstrate that with both Dr. Ray oh, yeah. and Kenny Kinsey. Love it. And that's when she suffers that third rifle injury. And you heard their expert come in and say, no, it had to be going this way instead of this way. Going up with that graze, hitting her breast and into her head here. And Dr. Reamer actually performed the autopsy physically. She looked at the hole. She described the hole. She talked about the injury coming up into the head. And she showed you that. And she took issue with this idea that you can look at skin tags and that sort of thing and come to any conclusion about directionality. But what she told you is, I looked at this wound. I saw the hole as it went up into the brain. This was an entrance wound up into the head. Instantly fatal, internal collapse. The wrist wound could have been an extraneous wound or it could be associated with this third rifle injury, and then of course the fourth rifle injury to the back of the head. They had the canyon in effect. Would have been instantly fatal except for the fact that this one, there has to be some clearance for that third shot to come up. Again, manner of death is homicide. 
So what did Dr. Kinsey say? Again, he took issue with a expert coming in and trying to tell you that he can determine the location or the height of the shooter in this manner. He told you the cardboard that cannot be relied upon. And while he did agree with the angle on the doghouse, he showed you how changing the aspect of the shooter could easily fit with Alec. And that it is too far and way out over its skis to try to assert that you can determine from such information that the shooter had to be 5'2". That's not what you can do. Dr. Kinsey is a crime scene analyst. How many crime scenes did he said he'd done? Over 800. Hundreds of homicides, thousands of pieces of evidence, real world stuff. That's what he comes and talks about. And you simply can't make those determinations in a real world environment to come in here and try to tell you that from that sort of thing, the shooter had to be a particular height. You just can't do it. You can't do it. I submit to you that Dr. Kinsey knows what he's talking about, and Dr. Kinsey has the years of experience in real world applications of crime scenes to make those judgments. And I also submit to you that Dr. Kinsey isn't going to get out over his skis. For anyone who's wondering what getting out over his skis means, um, it's basically like flying a bridge or uh, flying too flying too close to the sun, or um, trying to stretch your opinion maybe a bridge too far from where you should. Um, so yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. And try to make assertions to you in absolutes. The guy with the two five two people refused to even concede the possibility of variables. But Dr. Kinsey knows that that's how reality works, and he's not going to get out of her over his skis and try to tell you something that simply he's not cannot fly be supported the by the evidence. And that's what the defense expert did. He's not going to travel a bridge too The shooter could easily be 6'4 or, or taller and fit all those bullet trajectories. Of course, one thing that the defense expert didn't consider and wouldn't even consider is all his little gray people <laughs> yes. Yes. Guns down like this i forgot you said that hold on i need to hear no that again consideration i i, I love it Great. Kneeling, sitting you said little gray people oh my god all his Can't. little gray people <laughs> are holding the guns hold down on. like this one more time one more time one more time consider as all his little gray people <laughs> They're holding the guns down like this. Uh, yes. I love no it. No consideration. <laughs> I'm kneeling. Oh, wow, that sitting, might even be better than two great boys. Being oh, no. in any sort of different position. But the reality is, these are fluid. Maggie is running to her baby. She's moving. And when she gets hit, most likely when she hits her leg against that Polaris, there's biological uh, evidence on that Polaris. And she comes forward and collapses as Alec is moving around her, firing. They had that expert come in yesterday, and I've kind of mentioned this, but I'll mention it again, who came in yesterday, the day before. Even I've lost track of time at this point. But try to get out over his skis again and testify to you that it He's making a had big to be two shooters for his because there were two guns. And why would you not just use the blackout? Is that opinion helpful or makes sense? Knowing what you know about this case? And knowing what you know about the firearms of this particular house, and knowing what you know about Alec Murdoch as you look at the rest of this evidence and what he's trying to manufacture to confuse these issues. Kenny Kenzie told you that it's just as likely that it could be one shooter, and, and although this is not to scale, you have the feed room right here, 
Polaris is right here and the cases, while they can't be relied upon as specific location, they still are, can be illustri illustrating general area and they're all in that area moving from here to here. DSR on the defendant's hands and seatbelt, Maggie's DNA on that Super Black Eagle, DNA on the Suburban steering wheel, no DNA or blood identified on the floorboards. It's very dark out there. We can see how well lit it can be when the lights are on. We'll talk finally a little bit more about The defendant's story to you that he told on Thursday. We've already talked about it, just a couple more things. I asked him when he went down there, those dogs are clearly out in the kennel video. I asked him if the dogs were alerting on anybody nearby or in the woods, as dogs do. And he said no. He said that their dogs were not doing that. You heard about the fact that he changed clothes, and you also heard testimony that his clothes smelled fresh and like laundry. See again, manufacturing the scene. You heard from his law partners that he was not and also from Marion, that he was not overly concerned with figuring out what happened or any threats to Buster. And in fact, you heard in the telephone interview after the side of the road, they specifically asked him, are there any threats to Buster? And he said no. Why is there no threat to Buster? Because he was the threat to Maggie. Well Hall. done, Creighton. That was good timing. He knows there's no vigilante out there. That's why he was never concerned about it. That was good. That's why he called Rogan first the night of. He knows the only threat is him. Yeah, powerful. I asked him if he could remember a line to all of those close to him, people that he trusted, that he stole from. He couldn't detail one single conversation. He couldn't remember his last conversation at the kennels. To use his own words, and when you hear what he has to say, when he was asked, you know, after the kennel video and his new story. That's an important thing. That I, I, I wonder if this is what kind of Creighton's point is here that I maybe didn't really think of, at least in terms of like actually saying it, like articulating this point until now, which is that maybe he's trying to draw a comparison that the way, the same way that, you know, Creighton kept asking him to recall a conversation when he was looking people in the eyes that he, he specifically said he, people he loved, people he cared about, people who trusted him and he looked them in the eyes and he lied to them. And the way Alex can't remember any one of those, even though there's like what thousands or hundreds of thousands of them, maybe he's trying to just say that there's a thing of like, um, like the same way that he can't even remember the conversation that they had at dinner, for example, that the similarity there is like, he's unable to talk, he's unable to, if it's a situation where he's lying to somebody that he loves or that somebody who trusts him, right? That that's a similarity there, that he handles that by saying, I don't remember. I don't know. Am I making any sense with that? Because he's trying, it definitely seems like he's trying to draw a comparison there between how he handled all those, um, you know, clients with the financial crimes and how he handled um, his family that night. What he did, he said, I got out of there. He's got that photographic memory, but can't do, remember what he was doing when he was his most active yeah. on that day. He didn't say, if only I had been there. If only I had gone to the kennels. If only I could have stopped it. If only I had been there a little longer. 
He says, I got out of there. What father would hold anything back if he were innocent? What father would care what happens yeah. to him after that? Yeah. He claims he told you that he had cooperated with SLED. But he hadn't. There's nothing more important if someone's innocent to telling law enforcement when the last time the victims were alive. I just saw them. I well, saw them there. at 8.50. I saw them. I mean, is, well, I guess, yeah. You know, if you want the thing solved, right? So I guess if you're not innocent, you wouldn't want it solved. But I mean, yeah, if you, the most important thing would be you want it solved. Let me rewind it a second since I was, since I paused it. Last time the victims were alive. I just saw them. I saw them at 8.50. I saw them at 8.49. Yeah. They're still out there. Go get them. Yeah. I mean, this is what, this, this is exactly the thing, right? When they're, when he's talking about common sense to the jury, this is common sense, you know, for everybody. These are, this is a common sense thing where it's like, you know, and honestly, the jury, you know, they're allowed, you know, of course, this isn't evidence, it's argument, but still, you know, we know that jurors are going to vote with their gut sometimes, right? Um, and it's a circumstantial case. And um, I don't know, I would, I feel like you'd be hard pressed to find a situation where if you were to, if you were actually able to talk to every juror, because we know that they have the option, right? They don't have to. It'd be really interesting to know, like, how many juries, right, when they have a unanimous verdict, is there ever a time where whatever their verdict is, right, which guilty, not guilty, whatever it is, would there ever be a time where you interview them or if they, you know, again, this is just theoretical, but just I'd be curious where they say they voted against their common sense because of what the evidence showed. I would really be curious because. You know, usually what you have in, in trials, including this one, is you have both sides saying, use your common sense. But of course, they're both wanting different verdicts. So there's that. But also, um, but we know that's part of the jury instructions, right? So the common sense is a big deal. So I wonder, like, what happens if, like, if the common sense goes against the evidence, like, if, they, if they're able to look at the evidence without using common sense? I don't know. Um, I would just be curious if they're like, yeah, common sense was like, yeah, this didn't ma this didn't make sense and this didn't feel right blah blah but like the evidence showed otherwise so we went with this verdict whatever you know again just, I, I would just be curious if they ever if that ever happened or if you, you would find that they never go against their common sense so i don't know just a thought he mentioned paranoia and try to convince you that there was paranoia about some case 10 years ago, and he confused David Owen oh, think David, David Owen. Williams. He got on the stand, ladies and gentlemen, and as he got confronted with things, as he was allowed to keep talking, he kept adding a new factor and a new factor and a new factor to justify why he's lying to you, why he had lied to law enforcement and to justify why he's telling you what he's telling you now. He kept adding them. He can remember those, ladies and gentlemen. He can remember a new one. He can remember this. And the problem with that is, is that there's no mistaking David Owen for David Williams. We showed you that picture of David Williams. This is a man who rides around with a badge in his windshield, who had blue lights installed on his private vehicle. And if you need any proof that he makes up lies, and, try, and is very convincing with them and makes them up on the fly. He got a guy caught flat footed with the badge uh -huh. hanging out of his pocket. He tried to assert to you that sometime maybe it was an accident that this badge is hanging out of his pocket. How was that an accident? See how quickly he was able to lie? But more importantly, the blue lights. He sat there and told you three times, I think he said his name three times, that Sheriff Smalls, the former sheriff of Hampton County, gave him permission to put blue lights in a private vehicle for a part-time assistant solicitor. And blue lights in a private vehicle. He told you three times, effortlessly got up there 
pivoted and lied to you. Because Sheriff Smalls came in here and said, uh-uh, of course not. That never happened. I've never heard of such a thing. This is a man who made his trade on lying. He lied about the most important fact in the case, and he sat there and effortlessly and easily pivoted to a new lie when confronted with something he wasn't prepared for. And the sheriff came in here and said, no, that never happened. Of course not. But he looked you all in the eyes and told you that. Mm -hmm. Looked you all in the eyes and told you that. As if, what's your problem, Mr. Waters? Sheriff Small said it was okay. He tries to tell you that he was paranoid about having a bag of pills in his pocket. The man who had blue lights in his car and had a badge, rides around with a badge in his windshield. That's what he thinks of his power and prestige, and that's what he thinks of appropriate use of authority, is to put it up there. It only serves him. It's only there to serve him. Yeah. He tried to also tell you that he gets paranoid, and so he's tried to lie about the most important fact that he could offer law enforcement when his wife and son were brutally murdered because he had a bag of pills in his pocket, but yet at the same breath says, Eh, I wasn't concerned about the law firm and that fair stuff. Eh, I'm not concerned about the boat case. Boat case. Why would he lie about that time unless he's manufacturing an alibi? And that's just why it took him only 19 seconds to call 911 because he knew what he was going to find out there. This has all been constructed by him to try to confuse the situation. That lie that he told you, he tried to make it seem like he'd been trying to tell this, but he also admitted on the stand that, and as did his brother, that his own brothers heard it for the first time last week. <clears throat> that his own attorney was repeating the story that he was napping the whole time and never went to the kennels on HBO in November, just a couple months ago. A lot of people lie, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people lie. When it's really important, something like this, this brutal murder, most people are going to come clean about a bag of pills. I think a lot of people cool. lie. I think that's people a great lie point. because they knew. I think that's a great point because. You know, even if you say, even, let's say you're on the jury and let's say you're believing anything Alex says, and you're believing the drugs, blah, blah, that's a really good point to say that put the bag of pills, pit that up against the murders, right? When you put it that way, it's like, dude, even if you're trying to really give him every fucking benefit of the doubt, even if you aren't thinking he's lying about anything, you know, even it's like, that's such a great point because he's still saying he was more worried about the fucking a bag of pills in his pocket than the murders when everyone knows that they're not going to arrest you for drugs when in a situation like that like that's just not gonna like we've seen this happen all the time where it's like yeah we're not here for that like da 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 like not to mention the fact that he had all this leeway and all this privilege and the badge and shit on purpose so he could get out of like anyway it's just but even without all the privilege and stuff i think that's such a powerful argument of like a bag of pills why are you going to be more worried about that than like compared to the murders, you know? So good job, Creighton. They did something wrong. That's why he lied, ladies and gentlemen. And just like always, when confronted with new evidence that he no longer can de deny, he backtracks, he pivots, and he tells a new story from that stand and looks you all in the eye. And then when new evidence comes up on cross, he backtracks and he pivots and he tells another new lie. And I'm sure if he could get up there again, he'd be telling, well, let me rephrase that. He's told, he said so many witnesses are lying on him. They're all lying on him. But the one thing we know is a constant is that he lied to them. Mark Tinsley's lying. Jeannie Seconder's lying. Shelly Smith is lying. Blanca's lying. Everybody's lying on the master liar. Yeah. You heard him answer the questions about whether or not he killed 
his wife and son. You heard me ask him if he was a family annihilator. When he answers those questions, did you see him do this? Did you see him do that on those videos too when asked questions where well, now we know he was lying? Is that the most classic tell ever? I'll leave that to you to decide. One thing I will agree with him. And he's allowed he to do this there, argument. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to the sea. How appropriate coming from that man. This man is trying to sell you on an idea that he was at the kennels, that he jetted back, that he went inside so quickly and quickly dozed off from the shortest nap in the history of the South. <laughs> I love that. That's my favorite. And then he got in his car seconds after the supposed vigilantes. These vigilantes that apparently are 5'2", that knew somehow that Paul and Matt... This is where he's saying, here's how much common sense you would have to ignore to go with this. Like, in, you, you would have to... Like, he's saying, he's showing how nonsensical this is, as we all know, right? It's why it was so funny. But again, they're always told to use their common sense. And it's like, this is not rational. This is not common sense. Maggie would be both at Moselle on the evening of June 7th, between 844 and 902, that also knew that they would be alone at this time. That they knew that Alec would not be at these kennels. And they also knew the property well enough to get to the kennels. They also assumed that they would find ammunition and guns there, so they didn't bring those. And they traveled the same route as Alec after his short 20-second nap <laughs> and knew that he would be visiting his mother at Almeida during that time. Those are the circumstances that you have to accept. Mm -hmm. The 5-2 vigilantes that arrived somehow in that tiny time period between 849 and 902, and that's given him every benefit of the, of the doubt as to the story he told you, sprinkled with a bunch of new lies as well. That somehow they arrived during that time, the dogs never heard them or ran to them. Somebody put the dogs up put the dogs up in the wrong kennels, somebody rolled up the hose. And these vigilantes were just lucky enough to find these family weapons there. Which he's clear on the other side of it that he says we're never there. He's so clear, oh, we never had the blackout. We never rode around with the blackout. No one knew who he was. No one knew who this man was. He'd avoided accountability his whole life. He had relied on his family name. He had a powerful family. He carried a badge and used that authority. He lived a wealthy life. But now finally, he was facing complete ruin. His father, who he idolized, who I worked with on occasion, was dying. His son, was facing charges for the boat case. He was facing a civil action that not only could potentially ruin him, but expose the reality of what he'd been done, doing for years. He had an opiate addiction. The entire illusion of his life was about to be altered. He couldn't live for that. He's the kind of person for which shame is an extraordinary provocation. Shame is an extraordinary provocation. His ego couldn't stand that, and he became a family annihilator. And I was thinking, that people who get the last word in this courtroom are y'all. 
And a lot of witnesses have testified over the last six weeks, but there's a couple that never get to testify but are important, and that's common sense and human nature. And there's two more that don't get to testify. We couldn't bring you any eyewitnesses because they were murdered. But common sense and human nature can speak on behalf of Maggie and Paul. When you look at this in its totality, common sense and human nature can speak for them. And they deserve a voice. Everything he did was to meant to try to frustrate the forensics as a lawyer and a prosecutor with the two guns and the manufactured alibi yep. and not taking his phone down to the scene, deleting call logs, making short phone calls, bringing up the boat case, moving Maggie's phone, changing clothes, looking at Paul's phone, calling Rogan, or trying to call Rogan. One man controlled this crime scene initially. And that was out. But there were some things he couldn't control. And we brought those to you. A couple things that the defendant said that I agree with. He said... So, okay, I, I'm i not surprised that just happened. I was like, what is that sound? I was like, what the heck? Literally out of the blue, out of nowhere, it's just started like hailing and like wind. Like, I was like, what is that sound? Um, I don't even know if you guys could, could maybe even hear it on here, but it's like, um, it's like hailing. So it's like storming. So anyway, that's probably why the internet and also if anything happens, but pretty loud. I wonder if you guys can hear that. Although I have the the thing on here that says reduce background noise. But it's pretty pretty loud. Anyway, but we're almost to the end of the video. So hopefully it'll hold out for long enough where we can finish it. But just so you know, we are having some sort of a crazy storm. <laughs> Whoever did this planned it for a long time. That he hurt the ones who were closest to him. It may be hard to fathom, ladies and gentlemen, but when you put all these circumstances together and really understand who he was in the entirety of his life, and the pressures that he was facing from what he had been doing for so long, you can understand it. There was one mistake, though, he didn't expect. And this is why he was worried about Paul's phone. This is why he's trying to get in touch with Rogan. And it was that kennel video that came up late in the investigation. And one of the things I asked him, and we've talked about this, the last question I had to him, and the first question I had to him was, what is the most important part of your testimony here today? And he wouldn't even concede that. But he at least conceded that the most important thing was to look you in the eye and try to explain to you why after his entire history you should believe him when he says, okay, I was down in the kennels for one brief minute, but I had nothing to do with this. And we went through that long cross in which he identified all these factors from his partner saying having an attorney, you need to have an attorney present, to his distrust of SLED, to Dave Owen asking him about his relationship, and I asked him, at what point did you decide to lie? And he finally agreed, okay, it was in this interview, it was that moment in the June 8th interview. It was during that interview. But in his 911 call, ladies and gentlemen, at 10.06, when he was asked when he last saw them, 
he said an hour and a half and then changed it to approximately two hours. It's consistent with what he would later say. Before any of those factors that he sat there and ran through with y'all is the reason for his decision even ever existed. And if that's not enough, ladies and gentlemen, you saw, and I played it for him, Daniel Green's body cam, where he was asked the same question. And he said that it was one and a half hours plus 45 minutes. And all those factors that he identified to you as to why he supposedly lied, he was lying to you, ladies and gentlemen, when he made those up. Yeah. He was lying Powerful. to you when Powerful. he made those up. Powerful. Just like he's lied to everyone close to him. Powerful. And he's good at it. He's good at it. It was earlier tonight. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact time, but okay. I left. I was probably gone an hour and a half from my mom's, and I saw them about 45 minutes before that. Okay. I rode around with Paul. Motive. The means. The opportunity. And ample evidence of guilty conduct and guilty conscience. All four factors are present. Maggie and Paul deserve a voice. They need a voice because they can no longer speak. And this has been a tough job. But the system depends on people who take that oath as jurors and are willing to honor that oath and make that tough decision to vindicate these victims to vindicate Maggie and Paul who were cut down in the prime of their lives. This is a sealed exhibit. This is what he did. Oh boy. This is what he did right here. This defendant on the other hand, has fooled everyone, everyone, everyone who thought they were close to him, everyone who thought they knew he was who he was. He's fooled them all. And he fooled Maggie and Paul too. And they paid for it with their lives. Don't let him fool you too. Powerful. On behalf of the state of South Carolina, I ask you to return a verdict of guilty against the defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch, for the murder of his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul, and for his possession of firearms during the commission of those malicious offenses. Thank you all for your attention during this long trial. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that will be it for this day. We'll resume at uh, 9.30 tomorrow morning. All right, and that will be it for our day. What did you guys think about Creighton's closing? Let me know um, in the comments and everything. Um, you know, we, we had a couple of different thoughts coming up about some different things, but, you know, we... We've, I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts also on like um, the what the truck, 
part three and um, this, this different scenarios like we talked about um, with the timeline and in, in the feed room. Um, and then uh, also if you had any thoughts on uh, the car being moving in and out of park, like we talked about there towards the end around uh, 10 o'clock. Um, I'm sure there were some other things, but those are just some things that I'm recalling at the moment. Um, so yeah, um, perfect timing for the video because we are having like some sort of a storm now all out of the blue, um, was not in the forecast, but anyway, so we will have up next time. I believe it will be the last episode for the trial series. Of course, Murdoch is the gift that keeps on giving. So it's, it's never over and we've still got plenty, even without anything else happening, we've got more to cover plenty of that anyway. Um, as much of which we've already talked about, but, um, but I do believe the next episode will be the last for the trial series. So we will hear from Jim Griffin and John, John Metters, Mr. Metters. Um, and then we will also have the jury instructions and um, we'll also have the verdict. And I think we should be able to probably get, do that in one episode. Um, I think I might also do a little segment on, Alex and his, um, what's the right word, like misappropriating identities of other things um, in another, from another angle that we haven't talked about yet. I'll have to kind of see what I put together for that. But um, anyway, as always, the timestamps will be in the description here probably shortly. Um, and with any luck, eventually they will appear on the scrolly bar. Um, and I did check. You know, I've talked, I've complained about this a number of times, but I have checked on other channels. Um, and it's not just my channel that is not having timestamps appear on the scrolly bar. There's other channels that have them in the description, but not on the scrolly bar where they used to be there and are now gone. So who knows? Um, but anyway, um, thanks everybody for watching and for um, replay, rewatch crew. Um, it's been a long trial, <laughs> but we are, we are, we are wrapping it up. And I think we've, we've definitely made a lot of strides in terms of the insight that you guys have brought um, and all the interest that you've brought and, you know, um, working through all this stuff with me and with each other, trying to understand it and make sense of it. And um, it'll be, it'll be, uh, it'll be probably bittersweet getting to the end. Um, but like I said, you know, it, it won't be the end, but it'll be the end of, of the trial. Um, and, uh, and we have other stuff to cover as well. So anyway, I think that sums it up. And again, thank you guys so much for watching. And I will go ahead and let me pull on my ticker actually first. There we go. And I'll go ahead and roll the outro.